The Custom of the Country by Edith Wharton. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Chapter One Undine Sprague, how can you? her mother wailed, raising a prematurely wrinkled hand heavy with rings to defend the note which a languid bell-boy had just brought in. But her defence was as feeble as her protest, and she continued to smile on her visitor, while Miss Sprague, with a turn of her quick young fingers, possessed herself of the missive, and withdrew to the window to read it. "'I guess it's meant for me,' she merely threw over her shoulder at her mother. "'Did you ever, Mrs. Heeny?' Mrs. Sprague murmured, with deprecating pride. Mrs. Heeny, a stout, professional-looking person in a waterproof, her rusty veil thrown back, and a shabby alligator bag at her feet, followed the mother's glance with good-humoured approval. "'I never met with a lovelier form,' she agreed, answering the spirit rather than the letter of her hostess's enquiry. Mrs. Bragg and her visitor were enthroned in two heavy gilt armchairs in one of the private drawing-rooms of the Hotel Stentorian. The Sprague rooms were known as one of the Louis suites, and the drawing-room walls, above their wainscoting of highly varnished mahogany, were hung with salmon-pink damask, and adorned with oval portraits of Marie Antoinette and the Princess de Lamballe. In the centre of the florid carpet, a gilt table with a top of Mexican onyx sustained a palm in a gilt basket tied with a pink bow. But for this ornament, and a copy of The Hound of the Baskervilles which lay beside it, the room showed no traces of human use, and Mrs. Spragg herself wore as complete an air of detachment as if she had been a wax figure in a show-window. Her attire was fashionable enough to justify such a post, and her pale soft-cheeked face, with puffy eyelids and drooping mouth, suggested a partially melted wax figure which had run to double chin. Mrs. Heeny, in comparison, had a reassuring look of solidity and reality. The planting of her firm black bulk in its chair, and the grasp of her broad red hands on the gilt arms, bespoke an organized and self-reliant activity, accounted for by the fact that Mrs. Heeny was a society manicure and masseuse. Toward Mrs. Sprague and her daughter she filled the double role of manipulator and friend, and it was in the latter capacity that, her day's task ended, she had dropped in for a moment to cheer up the lonely ladies of the stentorian. The young girl whose form had won Mrs. Heeny's professional commendation suddenly shifted its lovely lines as she turned back from the window. "'Here, you can have it after all,' she said, crumpling the note and tossing it with a contemptuous gesture into her mother's lap. "'Why, isn't it from Mr. Popple?' Mrs. Sprague exclaimed unguardedly. "'No, it isn't. What made you think I thought it was?' snapped her daughter. But the next instant she added, with an outbreak of childish disappointment, "'It's only from Mr. Marvell's sister. At least, she says she's his sister.' Mrs. Sprague, with a puzzled frown, groped for her eyeglass among the jet fringes of her tightly girded front. Mrs. Heeny's small blue eyes shot out sparks of curiosity. "'Marvell? What Marvell is that?' The girl explained languidly. "'A little fellow. I think Mr. Popple said his name was Ralph.' While her mother continued, "'Undine met them both last night at that party downstairs, and from something Mr. Popple said to her about going to one of the new plays, she thought—how on earth do you know what I thought?' Undine flashed back, her grey eyes darting warnings at her mother under their straight black brows. "'Why, you said you thought—' Mrs. Sprague began reproachfully, but Mrs. Heeny, heedless of their bickerings, was pursuing her own train of thought. "'What, Popple? Claude Walsingham Popple, the portrait painter?' "'Yes, I suppose so. He said he'd like to paint me. Mabel Lipscomb introduced him. "'I don't care if I never see him again,' the girl said, bathed in angry pink. "'Do you know him, Mrs. Heeny?' Mrs. Sprague inquired. "'I should say I did. I manicured him for his first society portrait, a full length of Mrs. Harmon B. Driscoll.' 
Mrs. Heeney smiled indulgently on her hearers. "'I know everybody. If they don't know me, they ain't in, and Claude Walsingham Popple's in it. But he ain't nearly as in it,' she continued judicially, "'as Ralph Marvell, the little fellow, as you call him. Undine Sprague, at the word, swept round on the speaker with one of the quick turns that revealed her youthful flexibility. She was always doubling and twisting on herself, and every movement she made seemed to start at the nape of her neck, just below the lifted roll of reddish-gold hair, and flow without a break through her whole slim length to the tips of her fingers and the points of her slender, restless feet. "'Why, do you know the Marvells? Are they stylish?' she asked. Mrs. Heeney gave the discouraged gesture of a pedagogue who has vainly striven to implant the rudiments of knowledge in a rebellious mind. "'Why, Undine Sprague, I've told you all about them time and again. His mother was a Dagonet. They live with old Urban Dagonet down in Washington Square.' To Mrs. Sprague this conveyed even less than to her daughter. "'Way down there? Why do they live with somebody else? Haven't they got the means to have a home of their own?' Undine's perceptions were more rapid, and she fixed her eyes searchingly on Mrs. Heeney. "'Do you mean to say Mr. Marvell's as swell as Mr. Popple?' "'As swell? Why, Claude Walsingham Popple ain't in the same class with him.' The girl was upon her mother with a spring, snatching and smoothing out the crumpled note. "'Laura Fairford, is that the sister's name?' "'Mrs. Henley Fairford, yes. What does she write about?' Undine's face lit up, as if a shaft of sunset had struck it through the triple-curtained windows of the stentorian. "'She says she wants me to dine with her next Wednesday. Isn't it queer? Why does she want me? She's never seen me!' Her tone implied that she had long been accustomed to being wanted by those who had. Mrs. Heeney laughed. <laughs> "'He saw you, didn't he?' "'Who? Ralph Marvell?' "'Why, of course he did. Mr. Popple brought him to the party here last night.' "'Well, there you are. When a young man in society wants to meet a girl again, he gets his sister to ask her.' Undine stared at her incredulously. "'How queer! But they haven't all got sisters, have they? It must be fearfully pokey for the ones that haven't.' "'They get their mothers. Or their married friends.' said Mrs. Heeney, omnisciently. "'Married gentlemen?' inquired Mrs. Sprague, slightly shocked, but genuinely desirous of mastering her lesson. "'Mercy, no! Married ladies!' "'But are there never any gentlemen present?' pursued Mrs. Sprague, feeling that if this were the case, Undine would certainly be disappointed. "'Present where? At their dinners? Of course! Mrs. Fairford gives the smartest little dinners in town. There was an account of one she gave last week in the morning's town talk. I guess it's right here among my clippings. Mrs. Heeney, swooping down on her bag, drew from it a handful of newspaper cuttings, which she spread on her ample lap, and proceeded to sort with a moistened finger. Here, she said, holding one of the slips at arm's length, and throwing back her head, she read in a slow, unpunctuated chant, Mrs. Henley Fairford gave another of her natty little dinners last Wednesday as usual. It was smart, small, and exclusive, and there was much gnashing of teeth among the left-outs, as Madame Olga Lukowska gave some of her new step-dances after dinner. That's the French for new dance-steps, Mrs. Heeney concluded, thrusting the documents back into her bag. Do you know Mrs. Fairford, too? Undine asked eagerly, while Mrs. Sprague, impressed but anxious for facts, pursued, "'Does she reside on Fifth Avenue?' "'No, she has a little house in Thirty-Eighth Street, down beyond Park Avenue.' The ladies' faces drooped again, and the masseuse went on promptly. "'But they're glad enough to have her in the big houses. Why, yes, I know her,' she added, addressing herself to Undine. "'I masked her for a sprained ankle a couple of years ago.' She's got a lovely manner, but no conversation. Some of my patients converse exquisitely, Mrs. Heeney added with discrimination. Undine was brooding over the note. 
"'It is written to Mother, Mrs. Abner E. Sprague. I never saw anything so funny. Will you allow your daughter to dine with me?' "'Allow? Is Mrs. Fairford peculiar?' "'No, you are,' said Mrs. Heeney bluntly. "'Don't you know it's the thing in the best society to pretend that girls can't do anything without their mother's permission? You just remember that, Undine. You mustn't accept invitations from gentlemen without you say you've got to ask your mother first. "'Mercy! But how will mother know what to say?' "'Why, she'll say what you tell her to, of course. You'd better tell her you want to dine with Mrs. Fairford,' Mrs. Heeney added humorously, as she gathered her waterproof together and stooped for her bag. "'Have I got to write the note, then?' Mrs. Spragg asked with rising agitation. Mrs. Heeney reflected. "'Why, no. I guess Undine can write it as if it was from you. Mrs. Fairford don't know your writing.' This was an evident relief to Mrs. Spragg, and as Undine swept to her room with the note, her mother sank back, murmuring plaintively, "'Oh, don't go yet, Mrs. Heeney. I haven't seen a human being all day, and I can't seem to find anything to say to that French maid.' Mrs. Heeney looked at her hostess with friendly compassion. She was well aware that she was the only bright spot on Mrs. Spragg's horizon. Since the Spraggs, some two years previously, had moved from Apex City to New York, they had made little progress in establishing relations with their new environment. And when, about four months earlier, Mrs. Spragg's doctor had called in Mrs. Heeney to minister professionally to his patient, he had done more for her spirit than for her body. Mrs. Heeney had had such cases before. She knew the rich, helpless family, stranded in lonely splendor in a sumptuous West Side hotel, with a father compelled to seek a semblance of social life at the hotel bar, and a mother deprived of even this contact with her kind, and reduced to illness by boredom and inactivity. Poor Mrs. Spragg had done her own washing in her youth, but since her rising fortunes had made this occupation unsuitable, she had sunk into the relative inertia, which the ladies of Apex City regarded as one of the prerogatives of affluence. At Apex, however, she had belonged to a social club, and, until they moved to the Mealy House, had been kept busy by the incessant struggle with domestic cares. Whereas New York seemed to offer no field for any form of ladylike activity. She therefore took her exercise vicariously, with Mrs. Heeney's help, and Mrs. Heeney knew how to manipulate her imagination as well as her muscles. It was Mrs. Heeney who peopled the solitude of the long, ghostly days with lively anecdotes of the Van Degens, the Driscolls, the Chauncey Ellings, and the other social potentates whose least doings Mrs. Spragg and Undine had followed from afar in the Apex papers, and who had come to seem so much more remote since only the width of the Central Park divided mother and daughter from their Olympian portals. Mrs. Spragg had no ambition for herself. She seemed to have transferred her whole personality to her child. But she was passionately resolved that Undine should have whatever she wanted, and she sometimes fancied that Mrs. Heeney, who crossed those sacred thresholds so familiarly, might some day gain admission for Undine. "'Well, I'll stay a mite longer if you want. And supposing I was to rub up your nails while we're talking? It'll be more sociable,' the masseuse suggested lifting her bag to the table, and covering its shiny onyx surface with bottles and polishers. Mrs. Bragg consentingly slipped the rings from her small mottled hands. It was soothing to feel herself in Mrs. Heeney's grasp, and though she knew the attention would cost her three dollars, she was secure in the sense that Abner wouldn't mind. It had been clear to Mrs. Bragg, ever since their rather precipitate departure from Apex City, that Abner was resolved not to mind resolved at any cost to see through the New York adventure. It seemed likely now that the cost would be considerable. They had lived in New York for two years without any social benefit to their daughter, and it was, of course, for that purpose that they had come. If, at the time, there had been other and more pressing reasons, they were such as Mrs. Spragg and her husband never touched on, even in the gilded privacy of their bedroom at the Stentorian, and so completely had silence closed in on the subject, that to Mrs. Spragg it had become non-existent. She really believed that, as Abner put it, they had left Apex because Undine was too big for the place. She seemed as yet, poor child, too small for New York, 
actually imperceptible to its heedless multitudes, and her mother trembled for the day when her invisibility should be borne in on her. Mrs. Spragg did not mind the long delay for herself. She had stores of lymphatic patience. But she had noticed lately that Undine was beginning to be nervous, and there was nothing that Undine's parents dreaded so much as her being nervous. Mrs. Spragg's maternal apprehensions unconsciously escaped in her next words. "'I do hope she'll quiet down now,' she murmured, feeling quieter herself as her hand sank into Mrs. Heeney's roomy palm. "'Who's that? Undine?' "'Yes. She seemed so set on that Mr. Popple's coming round. From the way he acted last night she thought he'd be sure to come round this morning. She's so lonesome, poor child. I can't say as I blame her.' "'Oh, he'll come round. Things don't happen as quick as that in New York,' said Mrs. Heeney, driving her nail-polisher cheeringly. Mrs. Spragg sighed again. Oh, "'They don't appear to. They say New Yorkers are always in a hurry, but I can't say as they've hurried much to make our acquaintance.' Mrs. Heeney drew back to study the effect of her work. "'You wait, Mrs. Spragg, you wait. If you go too fast you sometimes have to rip out the whole seam.' "'Oh, that's so, that's so!' Mrs. Spragg exclaimed, with a tragic emphasis that made the masseuse glance up at her. "'Of course it's so, and it's more so in New York than anywhere. The wrong sets like flypaper. Once you're in it you can pull and pull, but you'll never get out of it again.' Undine's mother heaved another and more helpless sigh. "'I wish you'd tell Undine that, Mrs. Heeney.' Oh, I guess Undine's all right. A girl like her can afford to wait. And if young Marvell's really taken with her, she'll have the run of the place in no time. This solacing thought enabled Mrs. Spragg to yield herself unreservedly to Mrs. Heeney's ministrations, which were prolonged for a happy confidential hour, and she had just bidden the masseuse good-bye, and was restoring the rings to her fingers, when the door opened to admit her husband. Mr. Spragg came in silently, setting his high hat down on the centre table, and laying his overcoat across one of the gilt chairs. He was tallish, grey-bearded, and somewhat stooping, with the slack figure of the sedentary man who would be stout if he were not dyspeptic, and his cautious grey eyes with pouch-like underlids had straight black brows like his daughter's. His thin hair was worn a little too long over his coat-collar, and a Masonic emblem dangled from the heavy gold chain which crossed his crumpled black waistcoat. He stood still in the middle of the room, casting a slow, pioneering glance about its gilded void, and then he said gently, "'Well, mother?' Mrs. Spragg remained seated, but her eyes dwelt on him affectionately. "'Undine's been asked out to a dinner-party, and Mrs. Heeney says it's to one of the first families. It's the sister of one of the gentlemen that Mabel Lipscomb introduced her to last night. There was a mild triumph in her tone, for it was owing to her insistence and Undine's that Mr. Spragg had been induced to give up the house they had bought in West End Avenue and move with his family to the Stentorian. Undine had early decided that they could not hope to get on while they kept house. All the fashionable people she knew either boarded or lived in hotels. Mrs. Spragg was easily induced to take the same view but Mr. Spragg had resisted, being at the moment unable either to sell his house or to let it as advantageously as he had hoped. After the move was made, it seemed for a time as though he had been right, and the first social steps would be as difficult to make in a hotel as in one's own house, and Mrs. Spragg was therefore eager to have him know that Undine really owed her first invitation to a meeting under the roof of the Stentorian. "'You see, we were right to come here, Abner.' she added, and he absently rejoined, "'I guess you two always manage to be right.' But his face remained unsmiling, and instead of seating himself and lighting his cigar, as he usually did before dinner, he took two or three aimless turns about the room, and then paused in front of his wife. "'What's the matter? Anything wrong downtown?' she asked, her eyes reflecting his anxiety. Mrs. Spragg's knowledge of what went on downtown was of the most elementary kind, but her husband's face was the barometer on which she had long been accustomed to read the leave to go on unrestrictedly, or the warning to pause and abstain till the coming storm should be weathered. 
He shook his head. No, nothing worse than what I can see to. If you and Undine will go steady for a while. He paused and looked across the room at his daughter's door. Where is she? Out? I guess she's in her room, going over her dresses with that French maid. I don't know as she's got anything fit to wear to that dinner, Mrs. Spragg added, in a tentative murmur. Mr. Spragg smiled at last. Well, I guess she will have, he said prophetically. He glanced again at his daughter's door, as if to make sure of its being shut. Then, standing close before his wife, he lowered his voice to say, I saw Elmer Moffat downtown today. Oh, Abner! A wave of almost physical apprehension passed over Mrs. Spragg. Her jeweled hands trembled in her black brocade lap, and the pulpy curves of her face collapsed as if it were a pricked balloon. Oh, Abner! she moaned again, her eyes also on her daughter's door. Mr. Spragg's black eyebrows gathered in an angry frown, but it was evident that his anger was not against his wife. "'What's the good of O. Abnering? Elmer Moffat's nothing to us, no more'n if we never laid eyes on him.' "'No, I know it, but what's he doing here? Did you speak to him?' she faltered. He slipped his thumbs into his waistcoat pockets. "'No, I guess Elmer and I are pretty well talked out.' Mrs. Spragg took up her moan. "'Don't tell her you saw him, Abner.' "'I'll do as you say, but she may meet him herself.' "'Oh, I guess not. Not with this new set she's going with. Don't tell her anyhow.' He turned away, feeling for one of the cigars which he always carried loose in his pocket, and his wife, rising, stole after him, and laid her hand on his arm. "'He can't do anything to her, can he?' do anything to her he swung about furiously i'd like to see him touch her that's all end of chapter 1 chapter 2 undine's white and gold bedroom with sea green panels and old rose carpet looked along 72nd street toward the leafless treetops of the central park she went to the window and drawing back its many layers of lace, gazed eastward down the long brownstone perspective. Beyond the park lay Fifth Avenue, and Fifth Avenue was where she wanted to be. She turned back into the room, and going to her writing-table, laid Mrs. Fairford's note before her, and began to study it minutely. She had read in the boudoir chat of one of the Sunday papers, that the smartest women were using the new pigeon-blood note-paper with white ink, and rather against her mother's advice, she had ordered a large supply, with her monogram in silver. It was a disappointment, therefore, to find that Mrs. Fairford wrote on the old-fashioned white sheet, without even a monogram, simply her address and telephone number. It gave Undine rather a poor opinion of Mrs. Fairford's social standing, and for a moment she thought with considerable satisfaction of answering the note on her pigeon-blood paper. Then she remembered Mrs. Heeney's emphatic commendation of Mrs. Fairford, and her pen wavered. What if white paper were really newer than pigeon-blood? It might be more stylish, anyhow. Well, she didn't care if Mrs. Fairford didn't like red paper. She did and she wasn't going to truckle to any woman who lived in a small house down beyond Park Avenue. Undine was fiercely independent, and yet passionately imitative. She wanted to surprise everyone by her dash and originality, but she could not help modelling herself on the last person she met, and the confusion of ideals thus produced caused her much perturbation when she had to choose between two courses. She hesitated a moment longer and then took from the drawer a plain sheet with the hotel address. It was amusing to write the note in her mother's name. She giggled as she formed the phrase, "'I shall be happy to permit my daughter to take dinner with you.' Take dinner seemed more elegant than Mrs. Fairford's dine. But when she came to the signature she was met by a new difficulty. Mrs. Fairford had signed herself Laura Fairford, just as one schoolgirl would write to another. But could this be a proper model for Mrs. Spragg? 
Undine could not tolerate the thought of her mother's abasing herself to a denizen of regions beyond Park Avenue, and she resolutely formed the signature, Sincerely, Mrs. Abner E. Sprague. Then uncertainty overcame her, and she rewrote her note and copied Mrs. Fairford's formula. Yours sincerely, Leota B. Sprague. But this struck her as an odd juxtaposition of formality and freedom, and she made a third attempt. Yours with love, Leota B. Sprague. This, however, seemed excessive, as the ladies had never met, and after several other experiments she finally decided on a compromise, and ended the note. Yours sincerely, Mrs. Leota B. Sprague. That might be conventional, Undine reflected, but it was certainly correct. This point settled, she flung open her door, calling imperiously down the passage, Celeste! and adding, as the French maid appeared, I want to look over all my dinner dresses. Considering the extent of Miss Sprague's wardrobe, her dinner dresses were not many. She had ordered a number the year before, but vexed at her lack of use for them, had tossed them over impatiently to the maid. Since then, indeed, she and Mrs. Sprague had succumbed to the abstract pleasure of buying two or three more, simply because they were too exquisite and Undine looked too lovely in them. But she had grown tired of these also, tired of seeing them hang unworn in her wardrobe, like so many derisive points of interrogation. And now, as Celeste spread them out on the bed, they seemed disgustingly commonplace, and as familiar as if she had danced them to shreds. Nevertheless, she yielded to the maid's persuasions and tried them on. The first and second did not gain by prolonged inspection. They looked old-fashioned already. "'It's something about the sleeves,' Undine grumbled as she threw them aside. The third was certainly the prettiest, but then it was the one she had worn at the hotel dance the night before, and the impossibility of wearing it again within the week was too obvious for discussion. Yet she enjoyed looking at herself in it, for it reminded her of her sparkling passages with Claude Walsingham Popple, and her quieter but more fruitful talk with his little friend, the young man whom she had hardly noticed. "'You can go, Celeste. I'll take off the dress myself,' she said. And when Celeste had passed out, laden with discarded finery, Undine bolted her door, dragged the tall pier-glass forward, and rummaging in a drawer for fan and gloves, swept to a seat before the mirror, with the air of a lady arriving at an evening party. Celeste, before leaving, had drawn down the blinds and turned on the electric light, and the white and gold room, with its blazing wall brackets, formed a sufficiently brilliant background to carry out the illusion. So untempered a glare would have been destructive to all half-tones and subtleties of moulding, but Undine's beauty was as vivid, and almost as crude, as the brightness suffusing it. Her black brows, her reddish tawny hair, and the pure red and white of her complexion defied the searching decomposing radiance. She might have been some fabled creature whose home was in a beam of light. Undine, as a child, had taken but a lukewarm interest in the diversions of her playmates. Even in the early days when she had lived with her parents in a ragged outskirt of Apex, and hung on the fence with Indiana Frusk, the freckled daughter of the plumber across the way, she had cared little for dolls or skipping ropes, and still less for the riotous games in which the loud Indiana played Atalanta to all the boyhood of the quarter. Already Undine's chief delight was to dress up in her mother's Sunday skirt and play lady before the wardrobe mirror. The taste had outlasted childhood, and she still practised the same secret pantomime, gliding in, settling her skirts, swaying her fan, moving her lips in soundless talk and laughter. But lately she had shrunk from everything that reminded her of her baffled social yearnings. Now, however, she could yield without afterthought to the joy of dramatizing her beauty. Within a few days she would be enacting the scene she was now mimicking, and it amused her to see in advance just what impression she would produce on Mrs. Fairford's guests. For a while she carried on her chat with an imaginary circle of admirers, twisting this way and that, fanning, fidgeting, twitching at her draperies, as she did in real life when people were noticing her. Her incessant movements were not the result of shyness. She thought it the correct thing to be animated in society, 
and noise and restlessness were her only notion of vivacity. She therefore watched herself approvingly, admiring the light on her hair, the flash of teeth between her smiling lips, the pure shadows of her throat and shoulders as she passed from one attitude to another. Only one fact disturbed her. There was a hint of too much fullness in the curves of her neck and in the spring of her hips. She was tall enough to carry off a little extra weight, but excessive slimness was the fashion, and she shuddered at the thought that she might some day deviate from the perpendicular. Presently she ceased to twist and sparkle at her image, and sinking into her chair, gave herself up to retrospection. She was vexed in looking back to think how little notice she had taken of young Marvell, who turned out to be so much less negligible than his brilliant friend. She remembered thinking him rather shy, less accustomed to society, and though in his quiet deprecating way he had said one or two droll things, he lacked Mr. Popple's masterly manner, his domineering yet caressing address. When Mr. Popple had fixed his black eyes on Undine, and murmured something artistic about the colour of her hair, she had thrilled to the depths of her being. Even now it seemed incredible that he should not turn out to be more distinguished than young Marvell. He seemed so much more in the key of the world she read about in the Sunday papers, the dazzling auriferous world of the Van Degens, the Driscolls, and their peers. She was roused by the sound in the hall of her mother's last words to Mrs. Heeney. Undine waited until their adieus were over, then, opening her door, she seized the astonished masseuse and dragged her into the room. Mrs. Heeney gazed in admiration at the luminous apparition in whose hold she found herself. "'Mercy, Undine, you do look stunning. Are you trying on your dress for Mrs. Fairford's?' "'Yes. No, this is only an old thing.' The girl's eyes glittered under their black brows. "'Mrs. Heeney, you've got to tell me the truth. Are they as swell as you said?' Who? The Fairfords and Marvells? <laughs> if they ain't swell enough for you, Undine Sprague, you'd better go right over to the Court of England. Undine straightened herself. I want the best. Are they as swell as the Driscolls and Van Degens? Mrs. Heeney sounded a scornful laugh. Look at here now, you unbelieving girl. As sure as I'm standing here before you, I've seen Mrs. Harmon B. Driscoll of Fifth Avenue laying in her pink velvet bed with Honiton lace sheets on it, and crying her eyes out because she couldn't get asked to one of Mrs. Paul Marvell's musicals. She'd never a dreamt of being asked to a dinner there. Not all of her money couldn't have bought her that, and she knows it. Undine stood for a moment with bright cheeks and parted lips. Then she flung her soft arms about the masseuse. Oh, Mrs. Heeney! "'You're lovely to me,' she breathed, her lips on Mrs. Heeney's rusty veil, while the latter, freeing herself with a good-natured laugh, said as she turned away, "'Go steady, Undine, and you'll get anywheres.' "'Go steady, Undine.' Yes, that was the advice she needed. Sometimes, in her dark moods, she blamed her parents for not having given it to her. She was so young, and they had told her so little. As she looked back she shuddered at some of her escapes. Even since they had come to New York she had been on the verge of one or two perilous adventures, and there had been a moment during their first winter when she had actually engaged herself to the handsome Austrian riding-master who accompanied her in the park. He had carelessly shown her a card-case with a coronet, and had confided in her that he had been forced to resign from a crack cavalry regiment for fighting a duel about a countess, and as a result of these confidences she had pledged herself to him, and bestowed on him her pink pearl ring in exchange for one of twisted silver, which he said the countess had given him on her deathbed with the request that he should never take it off till he met a woman more beautiful than herself. Soon afterward, luckily, Undine had run across Mabel Lipscomb, whom she had known at a Middle Western boarding school as Mabel Blitch. Miss Blitch occupied a position of distinction as the only New York girl at the school and for a time there had been a sharp rivalry for her favour between Undine and Indiana Frusk, whose parents had somehow contrived, for one term, to obtain her admission to the same establishment. In spite of Indiana's unscrupulous methods, and of a certain violent way she had of capturing attention, the victory remained with Undine, whom Mabel pronounced more refined, and the discomfited Indiana, denouncing her schoolmates as a bunch of mushes, had disappeared forever from the scene of her defeat. 
Since then Mabel had returned to New York and married a stockbroker, and Undine's first steps in social enlightenment dated from the day when she had met Mrs. Harry Lipscomb and been again taken under her wing. Harry Lipscomb had insisted on investigating the riding-master's record, and had found that his real name was Aronson, and that he had left Krakow under a charge of swindling servant-girls out of their savings. In the light of which discoveries, Undine noticed for the first time that his lips were too red, and that his hair was pomaded. That was one of the episodes that sickened her as she looked back, and made her resolve once more to trust less to her impulses, especially in the matter of giving away rings. In the interval, however, she felt that she had learned a great deal, especially since, by Mabel Lipscomb's advice, the Spraggs had moved to the Stentorian, where that lady was herself established. There was nothing of the monopolist about Mabel, and she lost no time in making Undine free of the Stentorian group and its affiliated branches, a society addicted to days and linked together by membership in countless clubs, mundane, cultural, or earnest. Mabel took Undine to the days, and introduced her as a guest to the club meetings, where she was supported by the presence of many other guests. My friend Miss Stager of Phalanx, Georgia. Or, if the lady were literary, simply, My friend Ora Prance Chettle of Nebraska. You know what Mrs. Chettle stands for. Some of these reunions took place in the lofty hotels moored like a sonorously named fleet of battleships along the upper reaches of the west side the Olympian, the Incandescent, the Ormilu, while others, perhaps the more exclusive, were held in the equally lofty, but more romantically styled apartment-houses, the Parthenon, the Tintern Abbey, or the Lido. Undine's preference was for the worldly parties, at which games were played, and she returned home laden with prizes in Dutch silver, but she was duly impressed by the debating clubs, where ladies of local distinction addressed the company from an improvised platform, or the members argued on subjects of such imperishable interest as, What is charm? or The Problem Novel, after which pink lemonade and rainbow sandwiches were consumed amid heated discussion of the ethical aspect of the question. It was all very novel and interesting, and at first Undine envied Mabel Lipscomb for having made herself a place in such circles but in time she began to despise her for being content to remain there. For it did not take Undine long to learn that introduction to Mabel's set had brought her no nearer to Fifth Avenue. Even in Apex, Undine's tender imagination had been nurtured on the feats and gestures of Fifth Avenue. She knew all of New York's golden aristocracy by name, and the lineaments of its most distinguished scions had been made familiar by passionate poring over the daily press. In Mabel's world she sought in vain for the originals, and only now and then caught a tantalizing glimpse of one of their familiars, as when Claude Walsingham Popple engaged on the portrait of a lady whom the Lipscombs described as the wife of a steel magnet, felt it his duty to attend to one of his client's teas, where it became Mabel's privilege to make his acquaintance and to name to him her friend Miss Spragg. Unsuspected social gradations were thus revealed to the attentive Undine but she was beginning to think that her sad proficiency had been acquired in vain when her hopes were revived by the appearance of Mr. Popple and his friend at the Stentorian dance. She thought she had learned enough to be safe from any risk of repeating the hideous Aronson mistake. Yet she now saw she had blundered again in distinguishing Claude Walsingham Popple while she almost snubbed his more retiring companion. It was all very puzzling and her perplexity had been farther increased by Mrs. Heaney's tale of the great Mrs. Harmon B. Driscoll's despair. Hitherto Undine had imagined that the Driscoll and Van Degen clans and their allies held undisputed suzerainty over New York society. Mabel Lipscomb thought so, too, and was given to bragging of her acquaintance with a Mrs. Spoff, who was merely a second cousin of Mrs. Harmon B. Driscoll's. Yet here was she, Undine Sprague of Apex, about to be introduced into an inner circle to which Driscolls and Van Degens had laid siege in vain. It was enough to make her feel a little dizzy with her triumph, to work her up into that state of perilous self-confidence in which all her worst follies had been committed. She stood up, and going close to the glass, examined the reflection of her bright eyes and glowing cheeks. This time her fears were superfluous. There were to be no more mistakes and no more follies now. 
She was going to know the right people at last. She was going to get what she wanted. As she stood there, smiling at her happy image, she heard her father's voice in the room beyond, and instantly began to tear off her dress, strip the long gloves from her arms, and unpin the rose in her hair. Tossing the fallen finery aside, she slipped on a dressing-gown, and opened the door into the drawing-room. Mr. Spragg was standing near her mother, who sat in a drooping attitude, her head sunk on her breast, as she did when she had had one of her turns. He looked up abruptly as Undine entered. "'Father, has Mother told you? Mrs. Fairford has asked me to dine. She's Mrs. Paul Marvell's daughter. Mrs. Marvell was a Dagonet, and they're sweller than anybody. They won't know the Driscolls and Van Degens.' Mr. Spragg surveyed her with humorous fondness. "'That's so. What do they want to know you for, I wonder?' he jeered. "'Can't imagine, unless they think I'll introduce you,' she jeered back in the same key, her arms around his stooping shoulders, her shining hair against his cheek. "'Well, and are you going to? Have you accepted?' He took up her joke as she held him pinioned, while Mrs. Spragg, behind them, stirred in her seat with a little moan. Undine threw back her head, plunging her eyes in his, and pressing so close that to his tired elderly sight her face was a mere bright blur. "'I want to awfully,' she declared. "'But I haven't got a single thing to wear.' Mrs. Spragg at this moaned more audibly. "'Undine, I wouldn't ask father to buy any more clothes right on top of those last bills.' "'I ain't on top of those last bills yet. I'm way down under them,' Mr. Spragg interrupted, raising his hands to imprison his daughter's slender wrists. "'Oh, well, if you want me to look like a scarecrow and not get asked again, I've got a dress that'll do perfectly,' Undine threatened, in a tone between banter and vexation. Mr. Spragg held her away at arm's length, a smile drawing up the loose wrinkles about his eyes. "'Well, that kind of dress might come in mighty handy on some occasions. So I guess you'd better hold on to it for future use. And go and select another for this Fairford dinner,' he said. And before he could finish, he was in her arms again, and she was smothering his last word in little cries and kisses. End of chapter 2 Chapter Three. Though she would not for the world have owned it to her parents, Undine was disappointed in the Fairford dinner. The house to begin with was small and rather shabby. There was no gilding, no lavish diffusion of light. The room they sat in after dinner, with its green shaded lamps making faint pools of brightness, and its rows of books from floor to ceiling, reminded Undine of the old circulating library at Apex before the new marble building was put up. Then, instead of a gas-log or a polished grate with electric bulbs behind ruby glass, there was an old-fashioned wood fire, like pictures of Back to the Farm for Christmas, and when the logs fell forward, Mrs. Fairford or her brother had to jump up to push them in place, and the ashes scattered over the hearth untidily. The dinner, too, was disappointing. Undine was too young to take note of culinary details, but she had expected to view the company through a bower of orchids and eat pretty-coloured entrees in ruffled papers. Instead, there was only a low centre dish of ferns, and plain roasted and broiled meat that one could recognise, as if they'd been dyspeptics on a diet. With all the hints in the Sunday papers, she thought it dull of Mrs. Fairford not to have picked up something newer and as the evening progressed she began to suspect it wasn't a real dinner-party, and that they had just asked her in to share what they had when they were alone. But a glance about the table convinced her that Mrs. Fairford could not have meant to treat her other guests so lightly. They were only eight in number, but one was no less a person than young Mrs. Peter Van Degen, the one who had been a Dagonet, and the consideration which this young lady— herself one of the choicest ornaments of the society column, displayed toward the rest of the company, convinced Undine that they must be more important than they looked. She liked Mrs. Fairford, a small, incisive woman, with a big nose and good teeth revealed by frequent smiles. 
In her dowdy black and antiquated ornaments, she was not what Undine would have called stylish, but she had a droll kind way which reminded the girl of her father's manner when he was not tired or worried about money. One of the other ladies, having white hair, did not long arrest Undine's attention, and the fourth, a girl like herself, who was introduced as Miss Harriet Ray, she dismissed at a glance as plain and wearing last year's model. The men, too, were less striking than she had hoped. She had not expected much of Mr. Fairford, since married men were intrinsically uninteresting, and his baldness and grey moustache seemed naturally to relegate him to the background. But she had looked for some brilliant youths of her own age. In her inmost heart she had looked for Mr. Popple. He was not there, however, and of the other men, one whom they called Mr. Bowen was hopelessly elderly. She supposed he was the husband of the white-haired lady, and the other two, who seemed to be friends of young Marvell's, were both lacking in Claude Walsingham's dash. Undine sat between Mr. Bowen and young Marvell, who struck her as very sweet. It was her word for friendliness, but even shyer than at the hotel dance. Yet she was not sure if he were shy, or if his quietness were only a new kind of self-possession which expressed itself negatively instead of aggressively. Small, well-knit, fair, he sat stroking his slight blond moustache and looking at her with kindly, almost tender eyes, but he left it to his sister and the others to draw her out and fit her into the pattern. Mrs. Fairford talked so well that the girl wondered why Mrs. Heeney had found her lacking in conversation. But though Undine thought silent people awkward, she was not easily impressed by verbal fluency. All the ladies in Apex City were more voluble than Mrs. Fairford, and had a larger vocabulary. The difference was that with Mrs. Fairford, conversation seemed to be a concert, and not a solo. She kept drawing in the others, giving each a turn, beating time for them with her smile, and somehow harmonizing and linking together what they said. She took particular pains to give Undine her due part in the performance, but the girl's expansive impulses were always balanced by odd reactions of mistrust, and to-night the latter prevailed. She meant to watch and listen without letting herself go, and she sat very straight and pink, answering promptly but briefly, with the nervous laugh that punctuated all her phrases, saying, "'I don't care if I do,' when her host asked her to try some grapes, and— I wouldn't wonder, when she thought any one was trying to astonish her. This state of lucidity enabled her to take note of all that was being said. The talk ran on more general questions and less on people than she was used to. But though the allusions to pictures and books escaped her, she caught and stored up every personal reference, and the pink in her cheeks deepened at a random mention of Mr. Popple. Yes, he's doing me. Mrs. Peter Van Degen was saying in her slightly drawling voice. "'He's doing everybody this year, you know.' "'As if that were a reason.' Undine heard Mrs. Fairford breathe to Mr. Bowen, who replied at the same pitch, "'It's a Van Degen reason, isn't it?' To which Mrs. Fairford shrugged assentingly. "'That delightful popple! He paints so exactly as he talks!' The white-haired lady took it up. All his portraits seem to proclaim what a gentleman he is, and how he fascinates women. They're not pictures of Mrs. or Miss So-and-so, but simply of the impression Popple thinks he's made on them." Mrs. Fairford smiled. "'I've sometimes thought,' she mused, "'that Mr. Popple must be the only gentleman I know. At least he's the only man who has ever told me he was a gentleman, and Mr. Popple never fails to mention it.' Undine's ear was too well attuned to the national note of irony for her not to perceive that her companions were making sport of the painter. She winced at their banter, as if it had been at her own expense, yet it gave her a dizzy sense of being at last in the very stronghold of fashion. Her attention was diverted by hearing Mrs. Van Degen, under cover of a general laugh, say in a low tone to young Marvell, "'I thought you liked his things, or I wouldn't have had him paint me.' Something in her tone made all Undine's perceptions bristle, and she strained her ears for the answer. "'I think he'll do you capitally. You must let me come and see you some day soon.' Marvell's tone was always so light, so unemphasized, that she could not be sure of its being as indifferent as it sounded. 
she looked down at the fruit on her plate, and shot a side glance through her lashes at Mrs. Peter Van Degen. Mrs. Van Degen was neither beautiful nor imposing, just a dark, girlish-looking creature with plaintive eyes and a fidgety, frequent laugh. But she was more elaborately dressed and jewelled than the other ladies, and her elegance and her restlessness made her seem less alien to Undine. She had turned on Marvell a gaze at once pleading and possessive, but whether betokening merely an inherited intimacy—Undine had noticed that they were all more or less cousins—or a more personal feeling, her observer was unable to decide, just as the tone of the young man's reply might have expressed the open avowal of good fellowship or the disguise of a different sentiment. All was blurred and puzzling to the girl, in this world of half-lights, half-tones, eliminations and abbreviations, and she felt a violent longing to brush away the cobwebs and assert herself as the dominant figure of the scene. Yet in the drawing-room, with the ladies, where Mrs. Fairford came and sat by her, the spirit of caution once more prevailed. She wanted to be noticed, but she dreaded to be patronized, and here again her hostess's gradations of tone were confusing. Mrs. Fairford made no tactless allusions to her being a newcomer in New York. There was nothing as bitter to the girl as that, but her questions as to what pictures had interested Undine at the various exhibitions of the moment, and which of the new books she had read, were almost as open to suspicion, since they had to be answered in the negative. Undine did not even know that there were any pictures to be seen, much less that people went to see them, and she had read no new book but When the Kissing Had to Stop of which Mrs. Fairford seemed not to have heard. On the theatre they were equally at odds, for while Undine had seen Oolaloo fourteen times, and was wild about Ned Norris and the soda-water fountain, she had not heard of the famous Berlin comedians who were performing Shakespeare at the German theatre, and knew only by name the clever American actress who was trying to give repertory plays with a good stock company. The conversation was revived for a moment by her recalling that she had seen Sarah Bernhardt in a play she called Leg Long, and another which she pronounced Fade, but even this did not carry them far, as she had forgotten what both plays were about, and had found the actress a good deal older than she expected. Matters were not improved by the return of the men from the smoking-room. Henley Fairford replaced his wife at Undine's side and since it was unheard of at Apex for a married man to force his society on a young girl, she inferred that the others didn't care to talk to her, or that her host and hostess were in league to take her off their hands. This discovery resulted in her holding her vivid head very high, and answering, "'I couldn't really say,' or, "'Is that so?' to all Mr. Fairford's ventures, and as these were neither numerous nor striking, it was a relief to both when the rising of the elderly lady gave the signal for departure. In the hall, where young Marvell had managed to precede her, Undine found Mrs. Van Degen putting on her cloak. As she gathered it about her, she laid her hand on Marvell's arm. "'Ralphie, dear, you'll come to the opera with me on Friday. We'll dine together first. Peter's got a club dinner.' They exchanged what seemed a smile of intelligence, and Undine heard the young man accept. Then Mrs. Van Degen turned to her. "'Good-bye, Miss Sprague. I hope you'll come.' "'To dine with me, too?' That must be what she was going to say, and Undine's heart gave a bound. "'To see me some afternoon,' Mrs. Van Degen ended, going down the steps to her motor, at the door of which a much-furred footman waited with more furs on his arm. Undine's face burned as she turned to receive her cloak, when she had drawn it on with haughty deliberation, she found Marvell at her side, in hat and overcoat, and her heart gave a higher bound. He was going to escort her home, of course. This brilliant youth—she felt now that he was brilliant—who dined alone with married women, whom the Van Degen set called Ralphie dear, had really no eyes for any one but herself, and at the thought her lost self-complacency flowed back warm through her veins. The street was coated with ice, and she had a delicious moment descending the steps on Marvell's arm, and holding it fast while they waited for her cab to come up, but when he had helped her in, he closed the door, and held his hand out over the lowered window. "'Good-bye,' he said, smiling, and she could not help the break of pride in her voice, as she faltered out stupidly from the depths of her disillusionment. "'Oh, 
Goodbye. End of chapter 3「Four. Father, you've got to take a box for me at the opera next Friday. » From the tone of her voice, Undine's parents knew at once that she was nervous. They had counted a great deal on the Fairford dinner as a means of tranquillization, and it was a blow to detect signs of the opposite result, when, late the next morning, their daughter came dawdling into the sodden splendor of the stentorian breakfast-room. The symptoms of Undine's nervousness were unmistakable to Mr. and Mrs. Spragg. They could read the approaching storm in the darkening of her eyes, from limpid grey to slate colour, and in the way her straight black brows met above them, and the red curve of her lips narrowed to a parallel line below. Mr. Spragg, having finished the last course of his heterogeneous meal, was adjusting his gold eyeglasses for a glance at the paper, when Undine trailed down the sumptuous stuffy room, where coffee fumes hung perpetually under the emblazoned ceiling, and the spongy carpet might have absorbed a year's crumbs without a sweeping. About them sat other pallid families, richly dressed and silently eating their way through a bill of fare which seemed to have ransacked the globe for gastronomic incompatibilities, and in the middle of the room a knot of equally pallid waiters, engaged in languid conversation, turned their backs by common consent on the persons they were supposed to serve. Undine, who rose too late to share the family breakfast, usually had her chocolate brought to her in bed by Celeste, after the manner described in the articles on A Society Woman's Day, which were appearing in boudoir chat. Her mere appearance in the restaurant, therefore, prepared her parents for those symptoms of excessive tension which a nearer inspection confirmed, and Mr. Spragg folded his paper and hooked his glasses to his waistcoat, with the air of a man who prefers to know the worst and have it over. "'An opera box?' faltered Mrs. Spragg, pushing aside the bananas and cream, with which she had been trying to tempt an appetite too languid for fried liver or crab mayonnaise. "'A parterre box,' Undine corrected, ignoring the exclamation, and continuing to address herself to her father. "'Friday's the stylish night, and that new tenor's going to sing again in Cavalleria,' she condescended to explain. "'That's so?' Mr. Spragg thrust his hands into his waistcoat pockets, and began to tilt his chair, till he remembered there was no wall to meet it. He regained his balance and said, "'Wouldn't a couple of good orchestra seats do you?' "'No, they wouldn't,' Undine answered with a darkening brow. He looked at her humorously. "'You've invited the whole dinner-party, I suppose?' "'No, no one.' "'Going all alone in a box?' She was disdainfully silent. "'I don't suppose that you're thinking of taking mother and me?' This was so obviously comic that they all laughed, even Mrs. Spragg, and Undine went on more mildly. "'I want to do something for Mabel Lipscomb. Make some return.' She's always taking me round, and I've never done a thing for her, not a single thing. This appeal to the national belief in the duty of reciprocal treating could not fail of its effect, and Mrs. Spragg murmured, She never has, Abner. But Mr. Spragg's brow remained unrelenting. Do you know what a box costs? No, but I suppose you do. Undine returned with unconscious flippancy. I do. That's the trouble. Why won't seats do you? Mabel could buy seats for herself. That's so, interpolated Mrs. Spragg, always the first to succumb to her daughter's arguments. Well, I guess I can't buy a box for her. Undine's face gloomed more deeply. She sat silent, her chocolate thickening in the cup, while one hand, almost as much be ringed as her mother's, drummed on the crumpled tablecloth. "'We might as well go straight back to Apex,' she breathed at last between her teeth. Mrs. Spragg cast a frightened glance at her husband. These struggles between two resolute wills always brought on her palpitations, and she wished she had her phial of digitalis with her. "'A parterre box costs a hundred and twenty-five dollars a night,' said Mr. Spragg, transferring a toothpick to his waistcoat pocket. "'I only want it once.' 
he looked at her with a quizzical puckering of his crow's feet. "'You only want most things once, Undine.' It was an observation they had made in her earliest youth. Undine never wanted anything long, but she wanted it right off. And until she got it, the house was uninhabitable. "'I'd a good deal rather have a box for the season,' she rejoined, and he saw the opening he had given her. She had two ways of getting things out of him against his principles, the tender wheedling way, and the harsh lipped and cold, and he did not know which he dreaded most. As a child they had admired her assertiveness, had made Apex ring with their boasts of it. But it had long since cowed Mrs. Spragg, and it was beginning to frighten her husband. "'Fact is, Undie,' he said, weakening, "'I'm a little mite strapped just this month.' Her eyes grew absent-minded, as they always did when he alluded to business. That was man's province, and what did men go downtown for but to bring back the spoils to their women? She rose abruptly, leaving her parents seated, and said more to herself than the others, "'Think I'll go for a ride.' "'Oh, Undine!' fluttered Mrs. Spragg. She always had palpitations when Undine rode and since the Aronson episode her fears were not confined to what the horse might do. "'Why don't you take your mother out shopping a little?' Mr. Spragg suggested, conscious of the limitations of his resources. Undine made no answer, but swept down the room and out of the door ahead of her mother, with scorn and anger in every line of her arrogant young back. Mrs. Spragg tottered meekly after her, and Mr. Spragg lounged out into the marble hall to buy a cigar before taking the subway to his office. Undine went for a ride, not because she felt particularly disposed for the exercise, but because she wished to discipline her mother. She was almost sure she would get her opera box, but she did not see why she should have to struggle for her rights, and she was especially annoyed with Mrs. Spragg for seconding her so half-heartedly. If she and her mother did not hold together in such crises, she would have twice the work to do. Undine hated scenes. She was essentially peace-loving, and would have preferred to live on terms of unbroken harmony with her parents. But she could not help it if they were unreasonable. Ever since she could remember there had been fusses about money, yet she and her mother had always got what they wanted, apparently without lasting detriment to the family fortunes. It was therefore natural to conclude that there were ample funds to draw upon, and that Mr. Spragg's occasional resistances were merely due to an imperfect understanding of what constituted the necessities of life. When she returned from her ride, Mrs. Spragg received her as if she had come back from the dead. It was absurd, of course, but Undine was inured to the absurdity of parents. "'Has father telephoned?' was her first brief question. No, he hasn't yet. Undine's lips tightened, but she proceeded deliberately with the removal of her habit. You'd think I'd asked him to buy me the opera house, the way he's acting over a single box, she muttered, flinging aside her smartly fitting coat. Mrs. Spragg received the flying garment and smoothed it out on the bed. Neither of the ladies could bear to have their maid about when they were at their toilet, and Mrs. Spragg had always performed these ancillary services for Undine. "'You know, Undie, father hasn't always got the money in his pocket, and the bills have been pretty heavy lately. Father was a rich man for Apex, but that's different from being rich in New York.' She stood before her daughter, looking down on her appealingly. Undine, who had seated herself while she detached her stock and waistcoat, raised her head with an impatient jerk. "'Why on earth did we ever leave Apex, then?' she exclaimed. Mrs. Spragg's eyes usually dropped before her daughter's inclement gaze, but on this occasion they held their own with a kind of awestruck courage, till Undine's lids sank above her flushing cheeks. She sprang up, tugging at the waistband of her habit, while Mrs. Spragg, relapsing from temerity to meekness, hovered about her with obstructive zeal. If you'd only just let go of my skirt, mother, I can unhook it twice as quick myself. Mrs. Spragg drew back, understanding that her presence was no longer wanted. But on the threshold she paused, as if overruled by a stronger influence, 
and said with a last look at her daughter, "'You didn't meet anybody when you were out, did you, Undie?' Undine's brows drew together. She was struggling with her long patent leather boot. "'Meet anybody? Do you mean anybody I know? I don't know anybody. I never shall if father can't afford to let me go round with people.' The boot was off with a wrench, and she flung it violently across the old rose carpet, while Mrs. Spragg, turning away to hide a look of inexpressible relief, slipped discreetly from the room. The day wore on. Undine had meant to go down and tell Mabel Lipscomb about the Fairford dinner, but its aftertaste was flat on her lips. What would it lead to? Nothing as far as she could see. Ralph Marvell had not even asked when he might call, and she was ashamed to confess to Mabel that he had not driven home with her. Suddenly she decided that she would go out and see the pictures of which Mrs. Fairford had spoken. Perhaps she might meet some of the people she had seen at dinner. From their talk one might have imagined that they spent their lives in picture galleries. The thought reanimated her, and she put on her handsomest furs, and a hat for which she had not yet dared present the bill to her father. It was the fashionable hour in Fifth Avenue, but Undine knew none of the ladies who were bowing to each other from the interlocked motors. She had to content herself with the gaze of admiration which she left in her wake along the pavement. But she was used to the homage of the streets and her vanity craved a choicer fare. When she reached the art gallery which Mrs. Fairford had named, she found it even more crowded than Fifth Avenue, and some of the ladies and gentlemen wedged before the pictures had the look which signified social consecration. As Undine made her way among them, she was aware of attracting almost as much notice as in the street, and she flung herself into rapt attitudes before the canvases, scribbling notes in the catalogue, in imitation of a tall girl in sables, while ripples of self-consciousness played up and down her watchful back. Presently her attention was drawn to a lady in black who was examining the pictures through a tortoise-shell eyeglass adorned with diamonds and hanging from a long pearl chain. Undine was instantly struck by the opportunities which this toy presented for graceful wrist movements and supercilious turns of the head. It seemed suddenly plebeian and promiscuous to look at the world with a naked eye, and all her floating desires were merged in the wish for a jewelled eyeglass and chain. So violent was this wish, that drawn on the wake of the owner of the eyeglass, she found herself inadvertently bumping against a stout, tight-coated young man, whose impact knocked her catalogue from her hand. As the young man picked the catalogue up and held it out to her, she noticed that his bulging eyes and queer retreating face were suffused with a glow of admiration. He was so unpleasant-looking that she would have resented his homage, had not his odd physiognomy called up some vaguely agreeable association of ideas. Where had she seen before this grotesque saurian head, with eyelids as thick as lips, and lips as thick as ear-lobes? It fled before her down a perspective of innumerable newspaper portraits, all like the original before her tightly coated, with a huge pearl transfixing a silken tie. "'Oh, thank you,' she murmured, all gleams and graces, while he stood, hat in hand, saying sociably, "'The crowd's simply awful, isn't it?' At the same moment the lady of the eyeglass drifted closer, and with a tap of her wand, and a careless, "'Peter, look at this!' swept him to the other side of the gallery. Undine's heart was beating excitedly, for as he turned away she had identified him. Peter Van Degen. Who could he be but young Peter Van Degen, the son of the great banker Thurber Van Degen, the husband of Ralph Marbell's cousin, the hero of Sunday supplements, the captor of blue ribbons at horse-shows, of gold cups at motor-races, the owner of winning race-horses and crack sloops, the supreme exponent, in short, of those crowning arts that made all life seem stale and unprofitable outside the magic ring of the society column. Undine smiled as she recalled the look with which his pale protruding eyes had rested on her. It almost consoled her for his wife's indifference. When she reached home she found that she could not remember anything about the pictures she had seen. There was no message from her father, and a reaction of disgust set in. Of what good were such encounters if they were to have no sequel? She would probably never meet Peter Van Degen again, or if she did run across him in the same accidental way, she knew they could not continue their conversation without being introduced. 
What was the use of being beautiful and attracting attention if one were perpetually doomed to relapse again into the obscure mass of the uninvited? Her gloom was not lightened by finding Ralph Marvell's card on the drawing-room table. She thought it unflattering and almost impolite of him to call without making an appointment. It seemed to show that he did not wish to continue their acquaintance. But as she tossed the card aside, her mother said, "'He was real sorry not to see you. Undine, he sat here nearly an hour.' Undine's attention was roused. "'Sat here? All alone? Didn't you tell him I was out?' "'Yes, but he came up all the same. He asked for me.' "'Asked for you?' The social order seemed to be falling in ruins at Undine's feet. A visitor who asked for a girl's mother. She stared at Mrs. Spragg with cold incredulity. "'What makes you think he did?' "'Why, they told me so. I telephoned that you were out, and they said he'd asked for me.' Mrs. Spragg let the fact speak for itself. It was too much out of the range of her experience to admit of even a hypothetical explanation. Undine shrugged her shoulders. It was a mistake, of course. Why on earth did you let him come up? I thought maybe he had a message for you, Undie. This plea struck her daughter as not without weight. Well, did he? she asked, drawing out her hat-pins and tossing down her hat on the onyx table. "'Why, no. He just conversed. He was lovely to me, but I couldn't make out what he was after,' Mrs. Spragg was obliged to own. Her daughter looked at her with a kind of chill commiseration. "'You never can,' she murmured, turning away. She stretched herself out moodily on one of the pink and gold sofas, and lay there brooding, an unread novel on her knee. Mrs. Spragg timidly slipped a cushion under her daughter's head, and then dissembled herself behind the lace window-curtains, and sat watching the lights spring out down the long street, and spread their glittering net across the park. It was one of Mrs. Spragg's chief occupations to watch the nightly lighting of New York. Undine lay silent, her hands clasped behind her head. She was plunged in one of the moods of bitter retrospection, when all her past seemed like a long struggle for something she could not have, from a trip to Europe to an opera-box, and when she felt sure that, as the past had been, so the future would be. And yet, as she had often told her parents, all she sought for was improvement. She honestly wanted the best. Her first struggle, after she had ceased to scream for candy or sulk for a new toy, had been to get away from Apex in summer. Her summers, as she looked back on them, seemed to typify all that was dreariest and most exasperating in her life. The earliest had been spent in the yellow frame cottage where she had hung on the fence, kicking her toes against the broken palings, and exchanging moist chewing-gum and half-eaten apples with Indiana Frusk. Later on, she had returned from her boarding-school to the comparative gentility of summer vacations at the Mealy House, whither her parents, forsaking their squalid suburb, had moved in the first flush of their rising fortunes. The tessellated floors, the plush parlours, and organ-like radiators of the Mealy House, had, aside from their intrinsic elegance, the immense advantage of lifting the sprags high above the frusks, and making it possible for Undine, when she met Indiana in the street or at school, to chill her advances by a careless allusion to the splendours of hotel life. But even in such a setting, and in spite of the social superiority it implied, the long months of the Middle Western summer, fly-blown, torrid, exhaling stale odours, soon became as insufferable as they had been in the little yellow house. At school Undine met other girls whose parents took them to the Great Lakes for August. Some even went to California. Others, oh bliss ineffable, went east." Pale and listless under the stifling boredom of the mealy house routine, Undine secretly sucked lemons, nibbled slate pencils, and drank pints of bitter coffee to aggravate her look of ill health. And when she learned that even Indiana Frusk was to go on a month's visit to Buffalo, it needed no artificial aids to emphasize the ravages of envy. Her parents, alarmed by her appearance, were at last convinced of the necessity of change, and timidly, tentatively, they transferred themselves for a month to a staring hotel on a glaring lake. 
There, Undine enjoyed the satisfaction of sending ironic postcards to Indiana, and discovering that she could more than hold her own against the youth and beauty of the other visitors. Then she made the acquaintance of a pretty woman from Richmond, whose husband, a mining engineer, had brought her west with him while he inspected the newly developed U-Ball mines, and the southern visitor's dismay, her repugnances, her recoil from the faces, the food, the amusements, the general bareness and stridency of the scene, were a terrible initiation to Undine. There was something still better beyond, then. More luxurious, more exciting, more worthy of her. She once said to herself afterward that it was always her fate to find out just too late about the something beyond. But in this case it was not too late. And obstinately, inflexibly, she set herself to the task of forcing her parents to take her east the next summer. Yielding to the inevitable, they suffered themselves to be impelled to a Virginia resort, where Undine had her first glimpse of more romantic possibilities. Leafy moonlight rides and drives, picnics in the mountain glades, and an atmosphere of Christmas chromo sentimentality that tempered her hard edges a little, and gave her glimpses of a more delicate kind of pleasure. But here again everything was spoiled by a peep through another door. Undine, after a first mustering of the other girls in the hotel, had as usual found herself easily first, till the arrival from Washington of Mr. and Mrs. Wincher and their daughter. Undine was much handsomer than Miss Wincher, but she saw at a glance that she did not know how to use her beauty as the other used her plainness. She was exasperated, too, by the discovery that Miss Wincher seemed not only unconscious of any possible rivalry between them, but actually unaware of her existence. Listless, long-faced, supercilious, the young lady from Washington sat apart reading novels or playing solitaire with her parents, as though the huge hotel's loud life of gossip and flirtation were invisible and inaudible to her. Undine never even succeeded in catching her eye. She always lowered it to her book when the apex beauty trailed or rattled past her secluded corner. But one day an acquaintance of the Winchers turned up, a lady from Boston, who had come to Virginia on a botanizing tour, and from scraps of Miss Wincher's conversation with the newcomer, Undine, straining her ears behind a column of the long veranda, obtained a new glimpse into the unimagined. The Winchers, it appeared, found themselves at Potash Springs, merely because a severe illness of Mrs. Wincher's had made it impossible, at the last moment, to move her farther from Washington. They had let their house on the North Shore, and as soon as they could leave this dreadful hole were going to Europe for the autumn. Miss Wincher simply didn't know how she got through the days, though no doubt it was as good as a rest-cure after the rush of the winter. Of course they would have preferred to hire a house, but the hole, if one could believe it, didn't offer one. So they had simply shut themselves off as best as they could from the hotel crew. Had her friend, Miss Wincher parenthetically asked, happened to notice the Sunday young men. They were queerer even than the bells they came for, and had escaped the promiscuity of the dinner hour by turning one of their rooms into a dining-room and picnicking there. With the persimmon house standards one couldn't describe it in any other way. But luckily the awful place was doing Mamma good, and now they had nearly served their term. Undine turned sick as she listened. Only the evening before she had gone on a buggy ride with a young gentleman from Deposit, a dentist's assistant, and had let him kiss her, and given him the flower from her hair. She loathed the thought of him now. She loathed all the people about her, and most of all the disdainful Miss Wincher. It enraged her to think that the Winchers classed her with the hotel crew, with the bells who awaited their Sunday young men. The place was forever blighted for her, and the next week she dragged her amazed but thankful parents back to Apex. But Miss Wincher's depreciatory talk had opened ampler vistas, and the pioneer blood in Undine would not let her rest. She had heard the call of the Atlantic seaboard, and the next summer found the Spraggs at Scog Harbor, Maine. Even now Undine felt a shiver of boredom as she recalled it. That summer had been the worst of all. The bare wind beaten in, all shingles without and blueberry pie within, was exclusive, parochial, Bostonian, and the Spraggs wore through the interminable weeks in blank, unmitigated isolation. 
the incomprehensible part of it was that every other woman in the hotel was plain dowdy or elderly and most of them all three if there had been any competition on ordinary lines undine would have won as van degen said hands down but there wasn't the other guests simply formed a cold impenetrable group who walked boated played golf and discussed christian science and the subliminal unaware of the tremulous organism drifting helplessly against their rock-bound circle. It was on the day the Spraggs left Skog Harbour that Undine vowed to herself with set lips, "'I'll never try anything again till I try New York.' Now she had gained her point and tried New York, and so far it seemed with no better success. From small things to great, everything went against her. In such hours of self-searching she was ready enough to acknowledge her own mistakes, but they exasperated her less than the blunders of her parents. She was sure, for instance, that she was on what Mrs. Heeney called the right tack at last, yet just at the moment when her luck seemed about to turn she was to be thwarted by her father's stupid obstinacy about that opera-box. She lay brooding over these things till long after Mrs. Spragg had gone away to dress for dinner and it was nearly eight o'clock when she heard her father's dragging tread in the hall. She kept her eyes fixed on her book when he entered the room, and moved about behind her, laying aside his hat and overcoat. Then his steps came close, and a small parcel dropped on the pages of her book. "'Oh, father!' She sprang up, all alight, the novel on the floor, her fingers twitching for the tickets. But a substantial packet emerged, like nothing she had ever seen. She looked at it, hoping, fearing. She beamed blissful interrogation on her father while his sallow smile continued to tantalize her. But then she closed on him with a rush, smothering his words against her hair. "'It's for more than one night! Why, it's for every other Friday! Oh, you darling! You darling!' she exulted. Mr. Spragg, through the glittering meshes, feigned dismay. "'That's so. They must have given me the wrong—' Then, convicted by her radiant eyes as she swung round on him, "'I knew you only wanted it once for yourself, Undine, but I thought maybe off nights you'd like to send it to your friends.' Mrs. Spragg, who from her doorway had assisted with moist eyes at this closing pleasantry, came forward as Undine hurried away to dress. "'Abner, can you really manage it all right?' He answered her with one of his awkward, brief caresses. "'Don't you fret about that, Leota. I'm bound to have her go round with these people she knows. I want her to be with them all she can.' A pause fell between them, while Mrs. Spragg looked anxiously into his fagged eyes. "'You seen Elmer again?' "'No. Once was enough,' he returned with a scowl like Undine's. "'Why, you said he couldn't come after her, Abner.' no more he can. But what if she was to get nervous and lonesome and want to go after him? Mrs. Spragg shuddered away from the suggestion. "'How'd he look? Just the same?' she whispered. "'No. Spruced up. That's what scared me.' It scared her, too, to the point of blanching her habitually lifeless cheek. She continued to scrutinize her husband broodingly. "'You look fairly sick, Abner. You better let me get you some of those stomach drops right off," she proposed. But he parried this with his unfailing humor. I guess I'm too sick to risk that. He passed his hand through her arm with the conjugal gesture familiar to Apex City. Come along down to dinner, mother. I guess Undine won't mind if I don't rig up tonight. End of chapter four. Chapter Five. She had looked down at them enviously from the balcony. She had looked up at them reverentially from the stalls. But now at last she was on a line with them, among them. She was part of the sacred semicircle, whose privilege it is between the acts to make the mere public forget that the curtain has fallen. As she swept to the left-hand seat of their crimson niche, waving Mabel Lipscomb to the opposite corner with a gesture learned during her apprenticeship in the stalls, Undine felt that quickening of the faculties that comes in the high moments of life. 
Her consciousness seemed to take in at once the whole bright curve of the auditorium, from the unbroken lines of spectators below her to the culminating blaze of the central chandelier, and she herself was the core of that vast illumination, the sentient throbbing surface which gathered all the shafts of light into a centre. It was almost a relief when a moment later the light sank, the curtain rose, and the focus of illumination was shifted. The music, the scenery, and the movement on the stage were like a rich mist tempering the radiance that shot on her from every side, and giving her time to subside, draw breath, adjust herself to this new clear medium which made her feel so oddly brittle and transparent. When the curtain fell on the first act, she began to be aware of a subtle change in the house. In all the boxes cross-currents of movement had set in. Groups were coalescing and breaking up, fans waving and heads twinkling, black coats emerging among white shoulders, latecomers dropping their furs and laces in the red penumbra of the background. Undine, for the moment unconscious of herself, swept the house with her opera-glasses, searching for familiar faces. Some she knew without being able to name them, fixed figureheads of the social prow, others she recognized from their portraits in the papers, but of the few from whom she could herself claim recognition not one was visible, and as she pursued her investigations the whole scene grew blank and featureless. Almost all the boxes were full now, but one just opposite tantalized her by its continued emptiness. How queer to have an opera-box and not use it! What on earth could the people be doing? What rarer delight could they be tasting? Undine remembered that the numbers of the boxes and the names of their owners were given on the back of the programme, and after a rapid computation she turned to consult the list. Mondays and Fridays, Mrs. Peter Van Degen. That was it. The box was empty because Mrs. Van Degen was dining alone with Ralph Marvell. Peter will be at one of his dinners. Undine had a sharp vision of the Van Degen dining-room. She pictured it as oak-carved and sumptuous with gilding, with a small table in the centre, and rosy lights and flowers, and Ralph Marvell, across the hothouse grapes and champagne, leaning in to take a light from his hostess's cigarette. Undine had seen such scenes on the stage. She had come upon them in the glowing pages of fiction, and it seemed to her that every detail was before her now, from the glitter of jewels on Mrs. Van Degen's bare shoulders, to the way young Marvell stroked his slight blond moustache while he smiled and listened. Undine blushed with anger at her own simplicity in fancying that he had been taken by her, that she could ever really count among these happy, self-absorbed people. They all had their friends, their ties, their delightful crowding obligations. Why should they make room for an intruder in a circle so packed with the initiated? As her imagination developed the details of the scene in the Van Degen dining-room, it became clear to her that fashionable society was horribly immoral, and that she could never really be happy in such a poisoned atmosphere. She remembered that an eminent divine was preaching a series of sermons against social corruption, and she determined to go and hear him on the following Sunday. This train of thought was interrupted by the feeling that she was being intently observed from the neighbouring box. She turned around with a feint of speaking to Mrs. Lipscomb, and met the bulging stare of Peter Van Degen. He was standing behind the lady of the eyeglass, who had replaced her tortoiseshell implement by one of closely set brilliance, which at word from her companion she critically bent on Undine. "'No, I don't remember,' she said, and the girl reddened, divining herself unidentified after this protracted scrutiny. But there was no doubt as to young Van Degen's remembering her. She was even conscious that he was trying to provoke in her some reciprocal sign of recognition, and the attempt drove her to the haughty study of her programme. "'Why, there's Mr. Popple over there!' exclaimed Mabel Lipscomb, making large signs across the house with fan and playbill. Undine had already become aware that Mabel— planted, blonde, and brimming too near the edge of the box, was somehow out of scale and out of drawing, and the freedom of her demonstrations increased the effect of disproportion. No one else was wagging and waving in that way. A gestureless mute telegraphy seemed to pass between the other boxes. Still Undine could not help following Mrs. Lipscomb's glance, and there, in fact, was Claude Popple, 
taller and more dominant than ever, and bending easily over what she felt must be the back of a brilliant woman. He replied by a discreet salute to Mrs. Lipscomb's intemperate motions, and Undine saw the brilliant woman's opera-glass turn in their direction, and said to herself that in a moment Mr. Popple would be round. But the entr'acte wore on, and no one turned the handle of their door, or disturbed the peaceful somnolence of Harry Lipscomb, who, not being, as he put it, on to grand opera, had abandoned the struggle and withdrawn to the seclusion of the inner box. Undine jealously watched Mr. Popple's progress from box to box, from brilliant woman to brilliant woman, but just as it seemed about to carry him to their door, he reappeared at his original post across the house. "'Undy, do look! There's Mr. Marvell. Mabel began again, with another conspicuous outbreak of signalling, and this time Undine flushed to the nape as Mrs. Peter Van Degen appeared in the opposite box, with Ralph Marvell behind her. The two seemed to be alone in the box, as they had doubtless been alone all the evening, and Undine furtively turned to see if Mr. Van Degen shared her disapproval. But Mr. Van Degen had disappeared, and Undine, leaning forward, nervously touched Mabel's arm. "'What's the matter, Undine? Don't you see Mr. Marvell over there? Is that his sister he's with?' "'No. I wouldn't beckon like that,' Undine whispered between her teeth. "'Why not? Don't you want him to know you're here?' "'Yes, but the other people are not beckoning.' Mabel looked about unabashed. "'Perhaps they've all found each other. Shall I send Harry over to tell him?' she shouted above the blare of the wind instruments. "'No!' gasped Undine as the curtain rose. She was no longer capable of following the action on the stage. Two presences possessed her imagination, that of Ralph Marvell, small, unattainable, remote, and that of Mabel Lipscomb, nearby, immense, and irrepressible. It had become clear to Undine that Mabel Lipscomb was ridiculous. That was the reason why Popple did not come to the box. No one would care to be seen talking to her while Mabel was at her side. Mabel, monumental and moulded, while the fashionable were flexible and diaphanous, Mabel strident and explicit, while they were subdued and elusive. At the stentorian she was the centre of her group, here she revealed herself as unknown and unknowing. Why, she didn't even know that Mrs. Peter Van Degen was not Ralph Marvell's sister, and she had a way of trumpeting out her ignorances that jarred on Undine's subtler methods. It was precisely at this point that there dawned on Undine what was to be one of the guiding principles of her career? It's better to watch than to ask questions. The curtain fell again, and Undine's eyes flew back to the Van Degen box. Several men were entering it together, and a moment later she saw Ralph Marvell rise from his seat and pass out. Half unconsciously she placed herself in such a way as to have an eye on the door of the box, but its handle remained unturned, and Harry Lipscomb, leaning back on the sofa, his head against the opera cloaks, continued to breathe stentorously through his open mouth, and stretched his legs a little farther across the threshold. The entr'acte was nearly over when the door opened, and two gentlemen stumbled over Mr. Lipscomb's legs. The foremost was Claude Walsingham Popple, and above his shoulders shone the Betrachian countenance of Peter Van Degen. A brief murmur from Mr. Popple made his companion known to the two ladies, and Mr. Van Degen promptly seated himself behind Undine, relegating the painter to Mrs. Lipscomb's elbow. "'Queer go. I happened to see your friend there waving to old Pop across the house. So I bolted over and collared him, told him he'd got to introduce me before he was a minute older. I tried to find out who you were the other day at the motor show. No, where was it? Oh, those pictures at Goldmark's. What do you think of him, by the way? You ought to be painted yourself. No, I mean it, you know. You ought to get old Pop to do you. He'd do your hair rippingly. You must let me come and talk to you about it. About the picture or your hair? <laughs> well, your hair, if you don't mind. Where'd you say you were staying? Oh, you live here, do you? I say, that's first rate. Undine sat well forward, curving toward him a little, as she had seen the other women do, but holding back sufficiently to let it be visible to the house that she was conversing with no less a person than Mr. Peter Van Degen. Mr. Popple's talk was certainly more brilliant and purposeful, and she saw him cast longing glances at her from behind Mrs. Lipscomb's shoulder, 
but she remembered how lightly he had been treated at the Fairford dinner, and she wanted, oh, how she wanted, to have Ralph Marvell see her talking to Van Degen. She poured out her heart to him, improvising an opinion on the pictures and an opinion on the music, falling in gaily with his suggestion of a jolly little dinner some night soon at the Café Martin, and strengthening her position, as she thought, by an easy allusion to her acquaintance with Mrs. Van Degen. But at the word her companion's eye clouded, and a shade of constraint dimmed his enterprising smile. "'My wife? Oh, she doesn't go to restaurants. She moves on too high a plane. But we'll get old Pop and Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, what'd you say your fat friend's name was? Just a select little crowd of four, and some kind of a cheerful show afterward. Jove, there's the curtain, and I must skip. As the door closed on him, Undine's cheeks burned with resentment. If Mrs. Van Degen didn't go to restaurants, why had he supposed that she would? And to have to drag Mabel in her wake. The leaden sense of failure overcame her again. Here was the evening nearly over, and what had it led to? Looking up from the stalls, she had fancied that to sit in a box was to be in society. Now she saw it might but emphasize one's exclusion. And she was burdened with the box for the rest of the season. It was really stupid of her father to have exceeded his instructions. Why had he not done as she told him? Undine felt helpless and tired. Hateful memories of Apex crowded back on her. Was it going to be as dreary here as there? She felt Lipscomb's loud whisper in her back. "'Say, you girls, I guess I'll cut this and come back for you when the show busts up.' They heard him shuffle out of the box, and Mabel settled back to undisturbed enjoyment of the stage. When the last entr'acte began, Undine stood up, resolved to stay no longer. Mabel, lost in the study of the audience, had not noticed her movement, and as she passed alone into the back of the box, the door opened, and Ralph Marvell came in. Undine stood with one arm listlessly raised to detach her cloak from the wall. Her attitude showed the long slimness of her figure, and the fresh curve of the throat below her bent-back head. Her face was paler and softer than usual, and the eyes she rested on Marvell's face looked deep and starry under their fixed brows. "'Oh, you're not going?' he exclaimed. "'I thought you weren't coming,' she answered simply. I waited till now on purpose to dodge your other visitors. She laughed with pleasure. Oh, we hadn't so many. Some intuition had already told her that frankness was the tone to take with him. They sat down together on the red damask sofa, against the hanging cloaks. As Undine leaned back, her hair caught in the spangles of the wrap behind her, and she had to sit motionless while the young man freed the captive mesh. Then they settled themselves again, laughing a little at the incident. A glance had made the situation clear to Mrs. Lipscomb, and they saw her return to her rapt inspection of the boxes. In their mirror-hung recess the light was subdued to a rosy dimness, and the hum of the audience came to them through half-drawn silken curtains. Undine noticed the delicacy and finish of her companion's features as his head detached itself against the red silk walls. The hand with which he stroked his small moustache was finely finished, too, but sinewy and not effeminate. She had always associated finish and refinement entirely with her own sex, but she began to think they might be even more agreeable in a man. Marvell's eyes were grey, like her own, with chestnut eyebrows and darker lashes, and his skin was as clear as a woman's, but pleasantly reddish, like his hands. As he sat talking in a low tone, questioning her about the music, asking her what she had been doing since he had last seen her, she was aware that he looked at her less than usual, and she also glanced away. But when she turned her eyes suddenly, they always met his gaze. His talk remained impersonal. She was a little disappointed that he did not compliment her on her dress or her hair. Undine was accustomed to hearing a great deal about her hair, and the episode of the spangles had opened the way to a graceful illusion but the instinct of sex told her that, under his quiet words, he was throbbing with the sense of her proximity. And his self-restraint sobered her, made her refrain from the flashing and fidgeting 
which were the only way she knew of taking part in the immemorial love-dance. She talked simply and frankly of herself, of her parents, of how few people they knew in New York, and of how at times she was almost sorry she had persuaded them to give up Apex. "'You see, they did it entirely on my account. They're awfully lonesome here, and I don't believe I shall ever learn New York ways either.' she confessed, turning on him the eyes of youth and truthfulness. "'Of course I know a few people, but they're not—not not the way I expected New York people to be.' She risked what seemed an involuntary glance at Mabel. "'I've seen girls here tonight that I just long to know. They look so lovely and refined. But I don't suppose I ever shall. New York's not very friendly to strange girls, is it? I suppose you've got so many of your own already— and they're all so fascinating you don't care." As she spoke she let her eyes rest on his, half laughing, half wistful, and then dropped her lashes while the pink stole slowly up to them. When he left her, he asked if he might hope to find her at home the next day. The night was fine, and Marvell, having put his cousin into her motor, started to walk home to Washington Square. At the corner he was joined by Mr. Popple. Hello, Ralph, old man. Did you run across our auburn beauty of the Stentorian? Who'd have thought old Harry Lipscomb had put us onto anything as good as that? Peter Van Degen was fairly taken off his feet, pulled me out of Mrs. Monty Thurber's box, and dragged me round by the collar to introduce him, planning a dinner at Martin's already. Gad, young Peter must have what he wants when he wants it. I put in a word for you, told him you and I ought to be let in on the ground floor funny the luck some girls have about getting started. I believe this one'll take if she can manage to shake the Lipscombs. I think I'll be asked to paint her. Might be a good thing for the spring show. She'd show up splendidly as a pendant to my Mrs. Van Degen, blonde and brunette, night and morning. Of course I prefer Mrs. Van Degen's type. Personally, I must have breeding. But as a mere bit of flesh and blood— Hello, ain't you coming into the club? Marvell was not coming into the club, and he drew a long breath of relief as his companion left him. Was it possible that he had ever thought leniently of the egregious Popple? The tone of social omniscience which he had found once so comic was now as offensive to him as a coarse physical touch. And the worst of it was that Popple, with the slight exaggeration of a caricature, really expressed the ideals of the world he frequented. As he spoke of Miss Spragg, so others at any rate would think of her. Almost every one in Ralph's set would agree that it was luck for a girl from Apex to be started by Peter Van Degen at a Café Martin dinner. Ralph Marvell, mounting his grandfather's doorstep, looked up at the symmetrical old red house-front, with its frugal marble ornament, as he might have looked into a familiar human face. "'They're right. After all, in some ways, they're right,' he murmured, slipping his key into the door. They were his mother, and old Mr. Urban Dagonet, both, from Ralph's earliest memories, so closely identified with the old house in Washington Square, that they might have passed for its inner consciousness, as it might have stood for their outward form. And the question as to which the house now seemed to affirm their intrinsic rightness was that of the social disintegration expressed by widely different architectural physiognomies at the other end of Fifth Avenue. As Ralph pushed the bolts behind him, and passed into the hall, with its dark mahogany doors, and the quiet Dutch interior effect of its black and white marble paving, he said to himself that what Popple called society was really just like the houses it lived in, a muddle of misapplied ornament over a thin steel shell of utility. The steel shell was built up in Wall Street, the social trimmings were hastily added in Fifth Avenue, and the union between them was as monstrous and fictitious, as unlike the gradual homogeneous growth which flowers into what other countries know as society, as that between the Blois gargoyles on Peter Van Degen's roof and the skeleton walls supporting them. That was what they had always said. What, at least, the Dagonet attitude, the Dagonet view of life, the very lines of the furniture in the old Dagonet house expressed. Ralph sometimes called his mother and grandfather the Aborigines, and likened them to those vanishing denizens of the American continent doomed to rapid extinction with the advance of the invading race. He was fond of describing Washington Square as the reservation, 
and of prophesying that before long its inhabitants would be exhibited at ethnological shows, pathetically engaged in the exercise of their primitive industries. Small, cautious, middle-class, had been the ideals of Aboriginal New York, but it suddenly struck the young man that they were singularly coherent and respectable, as contrasted with the chaos of indiscriminate appetites which made up its modern tendencies. He too had wanted to be modern, had revolted, half-humorously, against the restrictions and exclusions of the old code, and it must have been by one of the ironic reversions of heredity that at this precise point he began to see what there was to be said on the other side, his side, as he now felt it to be. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 Upstairs in his brown firelit room he threw himself into an armchair and remembered. Harvard first, then Oxford, then a year of wandering and rich initiation. Returning to New York he had read law, and now had his desk in the office of the respectable firm in whose charge the Dagonet estate had mouldered for several generations. But his profession was the least real thing in his life. The realities lay about him now, the books jamming his old college bookcases and overflowing on chairs and tables. Sketches, too. He could do charming things, if only he had known how to finish them. And on the writing-table at his elbow, scattered sheets of prose and verse. Charming things also, but like the sketches, unfinished. Nothing in the Dagonet and Marvell tradition was opposed to this desultory dabbling with life. For four or five generations it had been the rule of both houses that a young fellow should go to Columbia or Harvard, read law, and then lapse into more or less cultivated inaction. The only essential was that he should live like a gentleman, that is, with a tranquil disdain for mere money-getting, a passive openness to the finer sensations, one or two fixed principles as to the quality of wine, and an archaic probity that had not yet learned to distinguish between private and business honour. No equipment could more thoroughly have unfitted the modern youth for getting on. It hardly needed the scribbled pages on the desk to complete the hopelessness of Ralph Marvell's case. He had accepted the fact with a humorous fatalism. Material resources were limited on both sides of the house, but there would always be enough for his frugal wants, enough to buy books, not editions, and pay now and then for a holiday dash to the great centres of art and ideas. And meanwhile there was the world of wonders within him. As a boy at the seaside, Ralph, between tides, had once come on a cave, a secret, inaccessible place with glaucous lights, mysterious murmurs, and a single shaft of communication with the sky. He had kept his find from the other boys, not churlishly, for he was always an outspoken lad, but because he felt there were things about the cave that the others, good fellows as they all were, couldn't be expected to understand, and that anyhow it would never be quite his cave again after he had let his thick-set freckled cousins play smuggler and pirate in it. And so with his inner world— Though so coloured by outer impressions, it wove a secret curtain about him, and he came and went in it with the same joy of furtive possession. One day, of course, someone would discover it and reign there with him. No, reign over it, and him. Once or twice already a light foot had reached the threshold. His cousin, Claire Dagonet, for instance. There had been a summer when her voice had sounded far down the windings, but he had run over to Spain for the autumn, and when he came back she was engaged to Peter Van Degen, and for a while it looked black in the cave. That was long ago, as time is reckoned under thirty, and for three years now he had felt for her only a half-contemptuous pity. To have stood at the mouth of his cave, and have turned from it to the Van Degen lair. Poor Clare repented, indeed. She wanted it clearly, but she repented in the Van Degen diamonds, and the Van Degen motor bore her broken heart from opera to ball. She had been subdued to what she worked in, and she could never again find her way to the enchanted cave. Ralph, since then, had reached the point of deciding that he would never marry. Reached it not suddenly or dramatically, 
but with such sober advisedness as is urged on those about to take the opposite step. What he most wanted, now that the first flutter of being was over, was to learn and to do, to know what the great people had thought, think about their thinking, and then launch his own boat, write some good verse if possible, if not, then critical prose. A dramatic poem lay among the stuff at his elbow, but the prose critic was at his elbow too, and not to be satisfied about the poem, and poet and critic passed the nights in hot, if unproductive, debate. On the whole it seemed likely that the critic would win the day, and the essay on The Rhythmical Structures of Walt Whitman take shape before The Banished God. Yet if the light in the cave was less supernaturally blue, the chant of its tides less laden with unimaginable music, it was still a thronged and echoing place when Undine Sprague appeared on its threshold. His mother and sister, of course, wanted him to marry. They had the usual theory that he was made for conjugal bliss. Women always thought that of a fellow who didn't get drunk and have low tastes. Ralph smiled at the idea as he sat crouched among his secret treasures. Marry. But whom, in the name of light and freedom? The daughters of his own race sold themselves to the invaders. The daughters of the invaders bought their husbands as they bought an opera box. It ought all to have been transacted on the stock exchange. His mother, he knew, had no such ambitions for him. She would have liked him to fancy a nice girl, like Harriet Ray. Harriet Ray was neither vulgar nor ambitious. She regarded Washington Square as the birthplace of society, knew by heart all the cousinships of early New York, hated motor-cars, could not make herself understood on the telephone, and was determined, if she married, never to receive a divorced woman. As Mrs. Marvell often said, such girls as Harriet were growing rare. Ralph was not sure about this. He was inclined to think that, certain modifications allowed for, there would always be plenty of Harriet Rays for unworldly mothers to commend to their sons, and he had no desire to diminish their number by removing one from the ranks of the marriageable. He had no desire to marry at all, that had been the whole truth of it, till he met Undine Sprague. And now— He lit a cigar, and began to recall his hour's conversation with Mrs. Sprague. Ralph had never taken his mother's social faiths very seriously. Surveying the march of civilization from a loftier angle, he had early mingled with the invaders, and curiously observed their rites and customs. But most of those he had met already had been modified by contact with the indigenous. They spoke the same language as his, though on their lips it had so often a different meaning. Ralph had never actually seen them in the making, before they had acquired the speech of the conquered race. But Mrs. Sprague still used the dialect of her people, and before the end of the visit Ralph had ceased to regret that her daughter was out. He felt obscurely that in the girl's presence, frank and simple as he thought her, he should have learned less of life in early apex. Mrs. Sprague, once reconciled, or at least resigned, to the mysterious necessity of having to entertain a friend of Undine's, had yielded to the first touch on the weak springs of her garrulity. She had not seen Mrs. Heeney for two days, and this friendly young man with the gentle manner was almost as easy to talk to as the masseuse. And then she could tell him things that Mrs. Heeney already knew, and Mrs. Sprague liked to repeat her stories. To do so gave her almost her sole sense of permanence among the shifting scenes of life. So that, after she had lengthily deplored the untoward accident of Undine's absence, and her visitor, with a smile, and echoes of divers et ondoyant in his brain, had repeated her daughter's name after her, saying, "'It's a wonderful find. How could you tell it would be such a fit?' It came to her quite easily to answer, "'Why, we called her after a hair-waver father put on the market the week she was born!' And then to explain, as he remained struck and silent, "'It's from Undule, you know, the French for crimping. Father always thought the name made it take. He was quite a scholar, and had the greatest knack for finding names. I remember the time he invented his Goliath glue. He sat up all night over the Bible to get the name.' "'No, father didn't start in as a druggist,' she went on, expanding with the signs of Marvell's interest. "'He was educated for an undertaker, and built up a first-class business. But he was always a beautiful speaker. 
and after a while he sort o' drifted into the ministry. Of course it didn't pay him anything like as well, so he finally opened a drug store, and he did first rate at that too, though his heart was always in the pulpit. But after he made such a success with his hair waver, he got speculating in land out at Apex, and somehow everything went, though Mr. Sprague did all he could. Mrs. Sprague, when she found herself embarked on a long sentence, always ballasted it by italicizing the last word. Her husband, she continued, could not at the time do much for his father-in-law. Mr. Sprague had come to Apex as a poor boy, and their early married life had been a protracted struggle, darkened by domestic affliction. Two of their three children had died of typhoid in the epidemic which devastated Apex before the new waterworks were built, and this calamity, by causing Mr. Sprague to resolve that thereafter Apex should drink pure water, had led directly to the founding of his fortunes. He had taken over some of poor father's land for a bad debt, and when he got up the pure water move the company voted to buy the land and build the new reservoir up there, and after that we began to be better off, and it did seem as if it had come out so to comfort us some about the children. Mr. Sprague thereafter had begun to be a power in Apex, and fat years had followed on the lean. Ralph Marvell was too little versed in affairs to read between the lines of Mrs. Sprague's untutored narrative, and he understood no more than she the occult connection between Mr. Sprague's domestic misfortunes and his business triumph. Mr. Sprague had helped out his ruined father-in-law, and had vowed on his children's graves that no apex child should ever again drink poisoned water, and out of those two disinterested impulses, by some impressive law of compensation, material prosperity had come. What Ralph understood and appreciated was Mrs. Sprague's unaffected frankness in talking of her early life. Here was no retrospective pretense of an opulent past, such as the other invaders were given to parading before the bland but undeceived subject race. The Spraggs had been plain people, and had not yet learned to be ashamed of it. The fact drew them much closer to the Dagonet ideals than any sham elegance in the past tense. Ralph felt that his mother, who shuddered away from Mrs. Harmon B. Driscoll, would understand and esteem Mrs. Spragg. But how long would their virgin innocence last? People's vulgar hands were on it already. Popples and the unspeakable Van Degens. Once they and theirs had begun the process of initiating Undine, there was no knowing, or rather there was too easy knowing, how it would end. It was incredible that she too should be destined to swell the ranks of the cheaply fashionable. Yet were not her very freshness, her malleability, the mark of her fate? She was still at the age when the flexible soul offers itself to the first grasp. That the grasp should chance to be Van Degen's, that was what made Ralph's temples buzz, and swept away all his plans for his own future, like a beaver's dam in a spring flood. To save her from Van Degen, and Van Degenism. Was that really to be his mission, the call for which his life had obscurely waited? It was not at the least what he had meant to do with the fugitive flash of consciousness he called self, but all that he had purposed for that transitory being sank into insignificance under the pressure of Undine's claims. Ralph Marvell's notion of women had been formed on the experiences common to good-looking young men of his kind. Women were drawn to him as much by his winning, appealing quality, by the sense of a youthful warmth behind his light, ironic exterior, as by his charms of face and mind. Except during Claire Dagonet's brief reign, the depths in him had not been stirred, but in taking what each sentimental episode had to give, he had preserved, through all his minor adventures, his faith in the great adventure to come. It was this faith that made him so easy a victim, when love had at last appeared in the attributes of romance, the imaginative man's indestructible dream of a rounded passion. The clearness with which he judged the girl and himself seemed the surest proof that his feeling was more than a surface thrill. He was not blind to her crudity and her limitations, but they were a part of her grace and her persuasion. Diverse et endoyante. So he had seen her from the first. But was not that merely the sign of a quicker response to the world's manifold appeal? There was Harriet Ray, sealed up tight in the vacuum of inherited opinion, where not a breath of fresh sensation could get at her. 
There could be no call to rescue young ladies so secured from the perils of reality. Undine had no such traditional safeguards. Ralph guessed Mrs. Spragg's opinions to be as fluid as her daughter's. And the girl's very sensitiveness to new impressions, combined with her obvious lack of any sense of relative values, would make her an easy prey to the powers of folly. He seemed to see her, as he sat there, pressing his fists into his temples, he seemed to see her like a lovely rock-bound Andromeda, with the devouring monster society careering up to make a mouthful of her, and himself whirling down on his winged horse, just Pegasus turned Rosinante for the nonce, to cut her bonds, snatch her up, and whirl her back into the blue. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 some two months later than the date of young Marvell's midnight vigil, Mrs. Heeney, seated on a low chair at Undine's knee, gave the girl's left hand an approving pat as she laid aside her lapful of polishers. "'There! I guess you can put your ring on again,' she said with a laugh of jovial significance, and Undine, echoing the laugh in a murmur of complacency, slipped on the fourth finger of her recovered hand a band of sapphires in an intricate setting. Mrs. Heeney took up the hand again. "'Them's old stones, Undine. They've got a different look,' she said, examining the ring while she rubbed her cushioned palm over the girl's brilliant fingertips. "'And the setting's quaint. I wouldn't wonder, but it was one of old Grandma Dagonet's.' Mrs. Spragg, hovering near in fond beatitude, looked up quickly. "'Why, don't you suppose he bought it for her, Mrs. Heeney? It came in a Tiffany box.' The manicure laughed again. "'Of course he's had Tiffany's rub it up. Ain't you ever heard of ancestral jewels, Mrs. Spragg? In the European aristocracy they never go out and buy engagement rings. And Undine's marrying into our aristocracy.' Mrs. Spragg looked relieved. "'Oh! I thought maybe they were trying to scrimp on the ring.' Mrs. Heeney, shrugging away this explanation, rose from her seat and rolled back her shiny black sleeves. "'Look here, Undine. If you really want me to do your hair, it's time we got to work.' The girl swung about in her seat, so that she faced the mirror on the dressing-table. Her shoulders shone through transparencies of lace and muslin, which slipped back as she lifted her arms to draw the tortoise-shell pins from her hair. "'Of course you've got to do it. I want to look perfectly lovely.' "'Well, I don't know as my hand's in nowadays," said Mrs. Heeney, in a tone that belied the doubt she cast on her own ability. "'Oh, you're an artist, Mrs. Heeney, and I just couldn't have had that French maid round to-night,' sighed Mrs. Spragg, sinking into a chair near the dressing-table. Undine, with a backward toss of her head, scattered her loose locks about her. As they spread and sparkled under Mrs. Heeney's touch, Mrs. Spragg leaned back, drinking in through half-closed lids her daughter's loveliness. Some new quality seemed added to Undine's beauty. It had a milder bloom, a kind of melting grace, which might have been lent to it by the moisture in her mother's eyes. "'So, you're to see the old gentleman for the first time at this dinner?' Mrs. Heeney pursued, sweeping the live strands up into a loosely woven crown. "'Yes, I'm frightened to death!' Undine, laughing confidently, took up a hand-glass and scrutinized the small brown mole above the curve of her upper lip. "'I guess she'll know how to talk to him,' Mrs. Spragg averred, with a kind of quavering triumph. "'She'll know how to look at him, anyhow,' said Mrs. Heeney, and Undine smiled at her own image. "'I hope he won't think I'm too awful.' Mrs. Heeney laughed. "'Did you read the description of yourself in the radiator this morning?' I wished I'd had a time to cut it out. I guess I'll have to start a separate bag for your clipping soon. Undine stretched her arms luxuriously above her head and gazed through lowered lids at the foreshortened reflection of her face. Mercy! Don't jerk about like that. Am I to put in this rose? There. You are lovely, Mrs. Heeney sighed, as the pink petals sank into the hair above the girl's forehead. Undine pushed her chair back, and sat supporting her chin on her clasped hands while she studied the result of Mrs. Heeney's manipulations. "'Yes, that's the way Mrs. Peter Van Degen's flower was put in the other night. 
only hers was a camellia. Do you think I'd look better with a camellia? I guess if Mrs. Van Degen looked like a rose, she'd a worn a rose, Mrs. Heeney rejoined poetically. Sit still a minute longer, she added. Your hair's so heavy I'd feel easier if I was to put in another pin. Undine remained motionless, and the manicure, suddenly laying both hands on the girl's shoulders and bending over to peer at her reflection, said playfully, "'Ever been engaged before, Undine?' A blush rose to the face in the mirror, spreading from chin to brow, and running rosily over the white shoulders from which their covering had slipped down. "'My! If he could see you now!' Mrs. Heeney jested. Mrs. Spragg, rising noiselessly, glided across the room and became lost in a minute examination of the dress laid out on the bed. With a supple twist, Undine slipped from Mrs. Heeney's hold. "'Engaged? Mercy, yes. Didn't you know? To the Prince of Wales. I broke it off because I wouldn't live in the tower.' Mrs. Spragg, lifting the dress cautiously over her arm, advanced with a reassured smile. "'I suppose Undie'll go to Europe now,' she said to Mrs. Heeney. "'I guess Undie will,' the young lady herself declared. "'We're going to sail right afterward. "'Here, mother, do be careful of my hair.' She ducked gracefully to slip into the lacy fabric which her mother held above her head. As she rose Venus-like above its folds, there was a tap on the door, immediately followed by its tentative opening. "'Mabel!' Undine muttered, her brows lowering like her father's, and Mrs. Spragg, wheeling about to screen her daughter, addressed herself protestingly to the half-open door. "'Who's there? Oh, is that you, Mrs. Lipscomb? Well, I don't know as you can. Undie isn't half-dressed yet.' "'Just like her, always pushing in,' Undine murmured, as she slipped her arms into their transparent sleeves. "'Oh, that don't matter. I'll help dress her.' Mrs. Lipscomb's large, blonde person surged across the threshold. "'Seems to me I ought to lend a hand tonight, considering I was the one that introduced them.' Undine forced a smile, but Mrs. Spragg, her soft wrinkles deepening with resentment, muttered to Mrs. Heeney as she bent down to shake out the girl's train, "'I guess my daughter's only got to show herself.' The first meeting with old Mr. Dagonet was less formidable than Undine had expected. She had been once before to the house in Washington Square, when with her mother she had returned Mrs. Marvell's ceremonial visit, but on that occasion Ralph's grandfather had not been present. All the rites connected with her engagement were new and mysterious to Undine, and none more so than the unaccountable necessity of dragging, as she phrased it, Mrs. Spragg into the affair. It was an accepted article of the Apex Creed that parental detachment should be completest at the moment when the filial fate was decided, and to find that New York reversed this rule was as puzzling to Undine as to her mother. Mrs. Spragg was so unprepared for the part she was to play that on the occasion of her visit to Mrs. Marvell her helplessness had infected Undine, and their half-hour in the sober faded drawing-room remained among the girl's most unsatisfactory memories. She re-entered it alone with more assurance. Her confidence in her beauty had hitherto carried her through every ordeal, and it was fortified now by the feeling of power that came with the sense of being loved. If they would only leave her mother out, she was sure in her own phrase of being able to run the thing, and Mrs. Spragg had providentially been left out of the Dagonet dinner. It was to consist, it appeared, only of the small family group Undine had already met, and seated at old Mr. Dagonet's right, in the high dark dining-room with mahogany doors and dim portraits of signers and their females, she felt a conscious joy in her ascendancy. Old Mr. Dagonet, small, frail, and softly sardonic, appeared to fall at once under her spell. If she felt beneath his amenity a kind of delicate dangerousness, like that of some fine surgical instrument, she ignored it as unimportant for she had as yet no clear perception of forces that did not directly affect her. Mrs. Marvell, low-voiced, faded, yet impressive, was less responsive to her arts, and Undine divined in her the head of the opposition to Ralph's marriage. Mrs. Heeney had reported that Mrs. Marvell had other views for her son, and this was confirmed by such echoes of the short, sharp struggle as reached the throbbing listeners at the stentorian. 
but the conflict over, the air had immediately cleared, showing the enemy in the act of unconditional surrender. It surprised Undine that there had been no reprisals, no return on the points conceded. That was not her idea of warfare, and she could ascribe the completeness of the victory only to the effect of her charms. Mrs. Marvell's manner did not express entire subjugation, yet she seemed anxious to dispel any doubts of her good faith, and if she left the burden of the talk to her lively daughter, it might have been because she felt more capable of showing indulgence by her silence than in her speech. As for Mrs. Fairford, she had never seemed more brilliantly bent on fusing the various elements under her hand. Undine had already discovered that she adored her brother, and had guessed that this would make her either a strong ally or a determined enemy. The latter alternative, however, did not alarm the girl. She thought Mrs. Fairford bright, and wanted to be liked by her, and she was in the state of dizzy self-assurance when it seemed easy to win any sympathy she chose to seek. For the only other guests, Mrs. Fairford's husband, and the elderly Charles Bowen, who seemed to be her special friend, Undine had no attention to spare. They remained on a plane with the dim pictures hanging at her back. She had expected a larger party, but she was relieved on the whole that it was small enough to permit of her dominating it. Not that she wished to do so by any loudness of assertion. Her quickness in noting external differences had already taught her to modulate and lower her voice, and to replace, "'The idea!' and "'I wouldn't wonder!' by more polished locutions, and she had not been ten minutes at table before she found that to seem very much in love, and a little confused and subdued by the newness and intensity of the sentiment, was to the Dagonet mind the becoming attitude for a young lady in her situation. The part was not hard to play, for she was in love, of course. It was pleasant, when she looked across the table, to meet Ralph's grey eyes, with that new look in them, and to feel that she had kindled it. But it was only part of her larger pleasure in the general homage to her beauty, in the sensations of interest and curiosity excited by everything about her, from the family portraits overhead to the old Dagonet silver on the table, which were to be hers, too, after all. The talk, as at Mrs. Fairford's, confused her by its lack of the personal illusion, its tendency to turn to books, pictures, and politics. Politics, to Undine, had always been a kind of back-kitchen to business, the place where the refuse was thrown, and the doubtful messes were brewed. As a drawing-room topic, and one to provoke disinterested sentiments, it had the hollowness of Fourth of July orations, and her mind wandered in spite of the desire to appear informed and competent. Old Mr. Dagonet, with his reedy staccato voice that gave polish and relief to every syllable, tried to come to her aid by questioning her affably about her family and the friends she had made in New York. But the caryatid parent, who exists simply as a filial prop, is not a fruitful theme, and Undine, called on for the first time to view her own progenitors as a subject of conversation, was struck by their lack of points. She had never paused to consider what her father and mother were interested in, and, challenged to specify, could have named, with sincerity, only herself. On the subject of her New York friends, it was not much easier to enlarge, for so far her circle had grown less rapidly than she expected. She had fancied Ralph's wooing would at once admit her to all his social privileges, but he had shown a puzzling reluctance to introduce her to the Van Degen set, where he came and went with such familiarity, and the persons he seemed anxious to have her know, a few frumpy, clever women of his sister's age, and one or two brisk old ladies in shabby houses with mahogany furniture and Stuart portraits, did not offer the opportunities she sought. "'Oh, I don't know many people yet. I tell Ralph he's got to hurry up and take me round,' she said to Mr. Dagonet, with a side-sparkle for Ralph, whose gaze between the flowers and lights she was aware of perpetually drawing. "'My daughter will take you. You must know his mother's friends,' the old gentleman rejoined, while Mrs. Marvell smiled noncommittally. "'But you have a great friend of your own, the lady who takes you into society,' Mr. Dagonet pursued, and Undine had the sense that the irrepressible Mabel was again pushing in. "'Oh, yes, Mabel Lipscomb. We were schoolmates,' she said indifferently. "'Lipscomb. Lipscomb. What is Mr. Lipscomb's occupation?' "'He's a broker.' 
said Undine, glad to be able to place her friend's husband in so handsome a light. The subtleties of a professional classification unknown to Apex had already taught her that in New York it is more distinguished to be a broker than a dentist, and she was surprised at Mr. Dagonet's lack of enthusiasm. Ah, a broker! He said it almost as Popple might have said, a dentist, and Undine found herself astray in a new labyrinth of social distinctions. She felt a sudden contempt for Harry Lipscomb, who had already struck her as too loud and irrelevantly comic. "'I guess Mabel will get a divorce pretty soon,' she added, desiring for personal reasons to present Mrs. Lipscomb as favorably as possible. Mr. Dagonet's handsome eyebrows drew together. "'A divorce? Hmm, that's bad. Has he been misbehaving himself?' Undine looked innocently surprised. "'Oh, I guess not. They like each other well enough. But he's been a disappointment to her. He isn't in the right set, and I think Mabel realizes she'll never really get anywhere till she gets rid of him.' These words, uttered in the high, fluting tone that she rose to when sure of her subject, fell on a pause which prolonged and deepened itself to receive them, while every face at the table, Ralph Marvell's accepted, reflected in varying degree Mr. Dagonet's pained astonishment. "'But, my dear young lady, what would your friend's situation be if, as you put it, she got rid of her husband on so trivial a pretext?' Undine, surprised at his dullness, tried to explain. "'Oh, that wouldn't be the reason given, of course. Any lawyer could fix it up for them. Don't they generally call it desertion?' There was another, more palpitating silence, broken by a laugh from Ralph. Ralph! his mother breathed. Then, turning to Undine, she said with a constrained smile, I believe in certain parts of the country such unfortunate arrangements are beginning to be tolerated. But in New York, in spite of our growing indifference, a divorced woman is still, thank heaven, at a decided disadvantage. Undine's eyes opened wide. Here at last was a topic that really interested her, and one that gave another amazing glimpse into the camera obscura of New York society. Do you mean to say Mabel would be worse off, then? Couldn't she even go round as much as she does now? Mrs. Marvell met this gravely. It would depend, I should say, on the kind of people she wished to see. Oh, the very best, of course. That would be her only object. Ralph interposed with another laugh. <laughs> you see, Undine, you'd better think twice before you divorce me. Ralph! His mother again breathed. But the girl, flushed and sparkling, flung back. Oh, it all depends on you. Out in Apex, if a girl marries a man who don't come up to what she expected, people consider it's to her credit to want to change. You'd better think twice of that. If I were only sure of knowing what you expect, he caught up her joke, tossing it back at her across the fascinated silence of their listeners. Why, everything, she announced. And Mr. Dagonet, turning, laid an intricately veined old hand on hers, and said, with a change of tone that relaxed the tension of the listeners, My child, if you look like that, you'll get it. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 It was doubtless owing to Mrs. Fairford's foresight that such possibilities of tension were curtailed after dinner by her carrying off Ralph and his betrothed to the theatre. Mr. Dagonet, it was understood, always went to bed after an hour's whist with his daughter, and the silent Mr. Fairford gave his evenings to bridge at his club. The party, therefore, consisted only of Undine and Ralph, with Mrs. Fairford and her attendant friend. Undine vaguely wondered why the grave and grey-haired Mr. Bowen formed so invariable a part of that lady's train, but she concluded that it was the York custom for married ladies to have gentlemen round, as girls had in Apex, and that Mr. Bowen was the sole survivor of Laura Fairford's earlier triumphs. She had, however, little time to give to such conjectures, for the performance they were attending, the debut of a fashionable London actress, had attracted a large audience, in which Undine immediately recognized a number of familiar faces. 
Her engagement had been announced only the day before, and she had the delicious sense of being in all the papers, and of focusing countless glances of interest and curiosity as she swept through the theatre in Mrs. Fairford's wake. Their stalls were near the stage, and progress thither was slow enough to permit a prolonged enjoyment of this sensation. Before passing to her place, she paused for Ralph to remove her cloak, and as he lifted it from her shoulders, she heard a lady say behind her, "'There she is, the one in white with the lovely back,' and a man answer, "'Gad, where did he find anything as good as that?' Anonymous approval was sweet enough, but she was to taste a moment more exquisite, when, in the proscenium box across the house, she saw Claire Van Degen seated beside the prim figure of Miss Harriet Ray. "'They're here to see me with him. They hate it, but they couldn't keep away.' She turned and lifted a smile of possessorship to Ralph. Mrs. Fairford seemed also struck by the presence of the two ladies, and Undine heard her whisper to Mr. Bowen, "'Do you see Claire over there? And Harriet with her? Harriet would come. I call it Spartan. And so like Claire to ask her.' Her companion laughed. "'It's one of the deepest instincts in human nature. The murdered are as much given as the murderer to haunting the scene of the crime.' Doubtless guessing Ralph's desire to have Undine to himself, Mrs. Fairford had sent the girl in first, and Undine, as she seated herself, was aware that the occupant of the next stall half turned to her, as with a vague gesture of recognition. But just then the curtain rose, and she became absorbed in the development of the drama, especially as it tended to display the remarkable toilets which succeeded each other on the person of its leading lady. Undine, seated at Ralph Marvell's side, and feeling the thrill of his proximity as a subtler element in the genial interest she was exciting, was at last repaid for the disappointment of her evening at the opera. It was characteristic of her that she remembered her failures as keenly as her triumphs, and that the passionate desire to obliterate, to get even with them, was always among the latent incentives of her conduct. Now at last she was having what she wanted. She was in conscious possession of the real thing, and through her other diffused sensations Ralph's adoration gave her such a last refinement of pleasure as might have come to some warrior queen born in triumph by captive princes, and reading in the eyes of one the passion he dared not speak. When the curtain fell, this vague enjoyment was heightened by various acts of recognition. All the people she wanted to go with, as they said in Apex, seemed to be about her in the stalls and boxes, and her eyes continued to revert with special satisfaction to the incongruous group formed by Mrs. Peter Van Degen and Miss Ray. The sight made it irresistible to whisper to Ralph, "'You ought to go round and talk to your cousin. Have you told her we're engaged?' "'Claire, of course. She's going to call on you tomorrow.' "'Oh, she needn't put herself out. She's never been yet,' said Undine loftily. He made no rejoinder but presently asked, "'Who's that you're waving to?' "'Mr. Popple. He's coming round to see us. You know he wants to paint me.' Undine fluttered and beamed, as the brilliant Popple made his way across the stalls to the seat which her neighbour had momentarily left. First-rate chap next to you, whoever he is, to give me this chance,' the artist declared. "'Ha! <laughs> Ralph, my boy, how did you pull it off? That's what we're all of us wondering.' He leaned over to give Marvell's hand the ironic grasp of celibacy. "'Well, you've left us lamenting. He has, you know, Miss Sprague. But I've got one pull over the others. I can paint you. He can't forbid that, can he? Not before marriage, anyhow.' Undine divided her shining glances between the two. "'I guess he isn't going to treat me any different afterward,' she proclaimed with joyous defiance. "'Ah, oh, well, there's no telling, you know.' hadn't we better begin at once? Seriously, I want awfully to get you into the spring show. Oh, really? That would be too lovely. You would be, certainly, the way I mean to do you. But I see Ralph getting glum. Jeer up, my dear fellow. I dare say you'll be invited to some of the sittings. That's for Miss Sprague to say. Ah, here comes your neighbour back, confound him. You'll let me know when we can begin. As Popple moved away, Undine turned eagerly to Marvell. "'Do you suppose there's time? I'd love to have him to do me.' Ralph smiled. 
my poor child, he would do you with a vengeance. Infernal cheek is asking you to sit. She stared. But why? He's painted your cousin, and all the smart women. Oh, if a smart portrait's all you want. I want what the others want, she answered, frowning and pouting a little. She was already beginning to resent in Ralph the slightest sign of resistance to her pleasure, and her resentment took the form, a familiar one in Apex courtships, of turning on him, in the next entr'acte, a deliberately averted shoulder. The result of this was to bring her, for the first time, in more direct relation to her other neighbour. As she turned, he turned too, showing her, above a shining shirt-front, fastened with a large imitation pearl, a ruddy, plump, snub face without an angle in it, which yet looked sharper than a razor. Undine's eyes met his with a startled look, and for a long moment they remained suspended on each other's stare. Undine at length shrank back with an unrecognizing face, but her movement made her opera-glass slip to the floor, and her neighbor bent down and picked it up. "'Well, don't you know me yet?' he said with a slight smile, as he restored the glass to her. She had grown white to the lips, and when she tried to speak, the effort produced only a faint click in her throat. She felt that the change in her appearance must be visible, and the dread of letting Marvell see it made her continue to turn her ravaged face to her other neighbour. The round black eyes set prominently in the latter's round glossy countenance had expressed at first only an impersonal and slightly ironic interest, but a look of surprise grew in them as Undine's silence continued. "'What's the matter? Don't you want me to speak to you?' She became aware that Marvell, as if unconscious of her slight show of displeasure, had left his seat, and was making his way toward the aisle, and this assertion of independence, which a moment before she would so deeply have resented, now gave her a feeling of intense relief. "'No. Don't speak to me, please. I'll tell you another time. I'll write.' Her neighbor continued to gaze at her, forming his lips into a noiseless whistle under his small dark moustache. "'Well, I—that's about the stiffest,' he murmured, and as she made no answer he added, "'Afraid I'll ask to be introduced to your friend?' She made a faint movement of entreaty. "'I can't explain. I promise to see you, but I ask you not to talk to me now.' He unfolded his program, and went on speaking in a low tone, while he affected to study it. "'Anything to oblige, of course. That's always been my motto. But is it a fair bargain? Fair and square? You'll see me.' She receded farther from him. "'I promise. I—I I want to,' she faltered. "'All right, then. Call me up in the morning at the Driscoll Building. 709. Got it?' She nodded, and he added in a still lower tone, I suppose I can congratulate you, anyhow." And then, without waiting for her reply, turned to study Mrs. Van Degen's box through his opera-glass. Clare, as if aware of the scrutiny fixed on her from below, leaned back and threw a question over her shoulder to Ralph Marvell, who had just seated himself behind her. "'Who's the funny man with the red face talking to Miss Spragg?' Ralph bent forward. "'The man next to her? Never saw him before. But I think you're mistaken. She's not speaking to him. She was. Wasn't she, Harriet? Miss Ray pinched her lips together without speaking, and Mrs. Van Degen paused for a fraction of a second. Perhaps he's an Apex friend, she then suggested. Very likely. Only I think she'd have introduced him if he had been. His cousin faintly shrugged. Shall you encourage that? Peter Van Degen, who had strayed into his wife's box for a moment, caught the colloquy and lifted his opera-glass. "'The fellow next to Miss Spragg? By George, Ralph, she's ripping to-night. Wait a minute, I know his face. Saw him in old Harmon Driscoll's office the day of the U-Ball mine meeting. This chap's his secretary or something. Driscoll called him in to give some facts to the directors, and he seemed a mighty wide-awake customer.' Clare Van Degen turned gaily to her cousin. If he has anything to do with the Driscolls, you'd better cultivate him. That's the kind of acquaintance the Dagonets have always needed. I married to set them an example." Ralph rose with a laugh. 
You're right. I'll hurry back and make his acquaintance. He held out his hand to his cousin, avoiding her disappointed eyes. Undine, on entering her bedroom late that evening, was startled by the presence of a muffled figure which revealed itself, through the dimness, as the ungirded midnight outline of Mrs. Spragg. "'Mother! What on earth!' the girl exclaimed, as Mrs. Spragg pressed the electric button and flooded the room with light. The idea of a mother sitting up for her daughter was so foreign to Apex custom that it roused only mistrust and irritation in the object of the demonstration. Mrs. Spragg came forward deprecatingly to lift the cloak from her daughter's shoulders. "'I just had to, Undie. I told father I had to. I wanted to hear all about it.' Undine shrugged away from her. "'Mercy! At this hour? You'll be as white as a sheet tomorrow, sitting up all night like this.' She moved toward the toilet-table, and began to demolish with feverish hands the structure which Mrs. Heeney, a few hours earlier, had so lovingly raised. But the rose caught in a mesh of hair, and Mrs. Spragg, venturing timidly to release it, had a full view of her daughter's face in the glass. "'Why, Undie, you're as white as a sheet now. You look fairly sick. What's the matter, daughter?' The girl broke away from her. "'Oh, can't you leave me alone, mother? There, do I look white now?' she cried, the blood flaming into her pale cheeks, and as Mrs. Spragg shrank back, she added more mildly, in the tone of a parent rebuking a persistent child, "'It's enough to make anybody sick to be stared at that way.' Mrs. Spragg overflowed with compunction. "'I'm so sorry, Undie. I guess it was just seeing you in this glare of light.' "'Yes, the light's awful. Do turn some off,' ordered Undine, for whom ordinarily no radiance was too strong, and Mrs. Spragg, grateful to have commands laid upon her, hastened to obey. Undine, after this, submitted in brooding silence to having her dress unlaced and her slippers and dressing-gown brought to her. Mrs. Spragg visibly yearned to say more, but she restrained the impulse, lest it should provoke her dismissal. "'Won't you take just a sup of milk before you go to bed?' she suggested at length, as Undine sank into an armchair. "'I've got some for you right here in the parlor. Without looking up, the girl answered, "'No, I don't want anything. Do go to bed.' Her mother seemed to be struggling between the lifelong instinct of obedience and a swift, unformulated fear. "'I'm going, Undie.' She wavered. "'Didn't they receive you right, daughter?' she asked with sudden resolution. "'What nonsense! How should they receive me? Everybody was lovely to me.' Undine rose to her feet and went on with her undressing, tossing her clothes on the floor and shaking her hair over her bare shoulders. Mrs. Spragg stooped to gather up the scattered garments as they fell, folding them with a wistful caressing touch, and laying them on the lounge, without daring to raise her eyes to her daughter. It was not till she heard Undine throw herself on the bed that she went toward her and drew the coverlet up with deprecating hands. "'Oh, do put the light out! I'm dead tired!' the girl grumbled, pressing her face into the pillow. Mrs. Spragg turned away obediently. Then, gathering all her scattered impulses into a passionate act of courage, she moved back to the bedside. "'Undie, you didn't see anybody—I mean, at the theatre. Anybody you didn't want to see?' Undine, at the question, raised her head and stared right against the tossed pillows her white exasperated face close to her mother's twitching features. The two women examined each other a moment, fear and anger in their crossed glances. Then Undine answered, "'No. Nobody. Good night.'" End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 Undine, late the next day, waited alone under the leafless trellising of a wisteria arbor on the west side of the central park. She had put on her plainest dress, and wound a closely patterned veil over her least vivid hat. But even thus toned down to the situation, she was conscious of blazing out from it inconveniently. The habit of meeting young men in sequestered spots was not unknown to her, 
the novelty was in feeling any embarrassment about it. Even now she was disturbed not so much by the unlikely chance of an accidental encounter with Ralph Marvell, as by the remembrance of similar meetings, far from accidental, with the romantic Aronson. Could it be that the hand now adorned with Ralph's engagement ring had once, in this very spot, surrendered itself to the riding-master's pressure? At the thought, a wave of physical disgust passed over her, blotting out another memory as distasteful but more remote. It was revived by the appearance of a ruddy middle-sized young man, his stoutish figure tightly buttoned into a square-shouldered overcoat, who presently approached along the path that led to the arbor. Silhouetted against the slope of the asphalt, the newcomer revealed an outline thick yet compact, with a round head set on a neck in which, at the first chance, prosperity would be likely to develop a red crease. His face, with its rounded surfaces, and the sanguine innocence of a complexion belied by prematurely astute black eyes, had a look of jovial cunning, which Undine had formerly thought smart, but which now struck her as merely vulgar. She felt that in the Marvell set Elmer Moffat would have been stamped as not a gentleman. Nevertheless, something in his look seemed to promise the capacity to develop into any character he might care to assume, though it did not seem probable that, for the present, that of a gentleman would be among them. He had always had a brisk, swaggering step, and the faintly impudent tilt of the head that she had once thought dashing. But whereas this look had formerly denoted a somewhat desperate defiance of the world and its judgments, it now suggested an almost assured relation to these powers, and Undine's heart sank at the thought of what the change implied. As he drew nearer, the young man's air of assurance was replaced by an expression of mildly humorous surprise. "'Well, this is white of you, Undine,' he said, taking her lifeless fingers into his dapperly gloved hand. Through her veil she formed the words, "'I said I'd come.' He laughed. "'That's so. And you see, I believed you. Though I might not have. I don't see the use of beginning like this.' she interrupted nervously. "'That's so, too. Suppose we walk along a little ways. It's rather chilly standing round.' He turned down the path that descended toward the ramble, and the girl moved on beside him with her long, flowing steps. When they had reached the comparative shelter of the interlacing trees, Moffat paused again to say, "'If we're going to talk, I'd like to see you, Undine.' And after a first moment of reluctance, she submissively threw back her veil. He let his eyes rest on her in silence, then said judicially, "'You've filled out some, but you're paler.' After another appreciative scrutiny he added, "'There's mighty few women as well worth looking at, and I'm obliged to you for letting me have the chance again.' Undine's brows drew together, but she softened her frown to a quivering smile. "'I'm glad to see you, too, Elmer. I am really. He returned her smile while his glance continued to study her humorously. You didn't betray the fact last night, Miss Sprague. I was so taken aback. I thought you were out in Alaska somewhere. The young man shaped his lips into the mute whistle by which he habitually vented his surprise. You did? Didn't Abner E. Sprague tell you he'd seen me downtown? Undine gave him a startled glance. Father? Why? Have you seen him? He never said a word about it. Her companion's whistle became audible. He's running yet, he said gaily. I wish I could scare some people as easy as I can your father. The girl hesitated. I never felt toward you the way father did, she hazarded at length, and he gave her another long look in return. "'Well, if they'd let you alone, I don't believe you'd ever have acted mean to me,' was the conclusion he drew from it. "'I didn't mean to, Elmer. I give you my word. But I was so young, I didn't know anything.' His eyes had a twinkle of reminiscent pleasantry. "'No, I don't suppose it would teach a girl much to be engaged two years to a stiff like Millard Binch. And that was about all that had happened to you before I came along.' 
Undine flushed to the forehead. Oh, Elmer, I was only a child when I was engaged to Millard. That's a fact, and you went on being one a good while afterward. The Apex Eagle always headlined you, The Child Bride. I can't see what's the use, now. That ruled out of court, too. See here, Undine, what can we talk about? I understood that was what we were here for. Of course. She made an effort at recovery. I only meant to say, what's the use of raking up things that are over? Rake up? That's the idea, is it? Was that why you tried to cut me last night? I— Oh, Elmer, I didn't mean to. Only, you see, I'm engaged. Oh, I saw that fast enough. I'd have seen it even if I didn't read the papers. He gave a short laugh. <laughs> he was feeling pretty good sitting there alongside of you, wasn't he? I don't wonder he was. I remember. But I don't see that that was a reason for cold-shouldering me. I'm a respectable member of society now. I'm one of Harmon B. Driscoll's private secretaries. He brought out the fact with mock solemnity. But to Undine, though undoubtedly impressive, the statement did not immediately present itself as a subject for pleasantry. "'Elmer Moffat! You are?' He laughed again. "'Guess you'd have remembered me last night if you'd known it.' She was following her own train of thought with a look of pale intensity. "'You're living in New York, then? You're going to live here right along?' "'Well, it looks that way as long as I can hang on to this job. Great men always gravitate to the metropolis. And I gravitated here just as Uncle Harmon B. was looking round for somebody who could give him the inside tip on the U-Baw mine deal. You know the Driscolls are pretty deep in u -Baw. I happened to go out there after our little unpleasantness at Apex, and it was just the time the deal went through. So in one way your folks did me a good turn when they made Apex too hot for me. Funny to think of, ain't it? Undine, recovering herself, held out her hand impulsively. "'I'm real glad of it. I mean, I'm real glad you've had such a stroke of luck.' "'Much obliged,' he returned. "'By the way, you might mention the fact to Abner E. Sprague next time you run across him.' "'Father'll be real glad, too, Elmer.' She hesitated, then went on. "'You must see now that it was natural father and mother should have felt the way they did.' Oh, the only thing that struck me as unnatural was their making you feel so, too. But I'm free to admit I wasn't a promising case in those days. His glance played over her for a moment. Say, Undine, it was good while it lasted, though, wasn't it? She shrank back with a burning face and eyes of misery. Why, what's the matter? That ruled out, too? Oh, all right. Look at here, Undine, suppose you let me know what you are here to talk about anyhow. She cast a helpless glance down the windings of the wooded glen in which they had halted. "'Just to ask you, to beg you, not to say anything of this kind, again, ever.' "'Anything about you and me?' She nodded mutely. "'Why, what's wrong? Anybody been saying anything against me?' "'Oh, no, it's not that.' "'What on earth is it, then, except that you're ashamed of me one way or another?' She made no answer, and he stood digging the tip of his walking-stick into a fissure of the asphalt. At length he went on, in a tone that showed a first faint trace of irritation. "'I don't want to break into your guilt-edged crowd if it's that you're scared of.' His tone seemed to increase her distress. "'No, no, you don't understand. All I want is that nothing shall be known.' "'Yes, but why? It was all straight enough, if you come to that. It doesn't matter whether it was straight or not. He interpolated a whistle which made her add, What I mean is that out here in the East they don't even like it if a girl's been engaged before. This last strain on his credulity wrung a laugh from Moffat. Oh, gee, how'd they expect her fair young life to pass, playing Holy City on the Melodeon and knitting tidies for church fairs? Girls are looked after here. It's all different. Their mothers go round with them. This increased her companion's hilarity, and he glanced about him with a pretension of compunction. Excuse me. I ought to have remembered. Where's your chaperone, Miss Sprague? 
he crooked his arm with mock ceremony. "'Allow me to escort you to the buffet. You see I'm on to the New York style myself.' A sigh of discouragement escaped her. "'Elmer, if you really believe I never wanted to act mean to you, don't you act mean to me now.' "'Act mean?' He grew serious again and moved nearer to her. "'What is it you want, Undine? Why can't you say it right out?' "'What I told you! I don't want Ralph Marvell, or any of them, to know anything. If any of his folks found out, they'd never let him marry me, never. And he wouldn't want to, he'd be so horrified. And it would kill me, Elmer. It would just kill me!' She pressed close to him forgetful of her new reserves and repugnances, and impelled by the passionate absorbing desire to wring from him some definite pledge of safety. "'Oh, Elmer, if you ever liked me, help me now, and I'll help you if I get the chance.' He had recovered his coolness as hers forsook her, and stood his ground steadily, though her entreating hands, her glowing face, were near enough to have shaken less sturdy nerves. "'That's so, puss. You just ask me to pass the sponge over Elmer Moffat of Apex City? Cut the gentleman when we meet? That the size of it?' "'Oh, Elmer, it's my first chance. I can't lose it!' she broke out, sobbing. "'Nonsense, child, of course you shan't. Here, look up, Undine. Why, I never saw you cry before. Don't you be afraid of me.' I ain't going to interrupt the wedding march. He began to whistle a bar of Lohengrin. I only just want one little promise in return. She threw a startled look at him, and he added reassuringly, Oh, don't mistake me. I don't want to butt into your set. Not for social purposes, anyhow. But if ever it should come handy to know of any of em, in a business way, would you fix it up for me? After you're married? Their eyes met, and she remained silent for a tremulous moment or two. Then she held out her hand. Afterward, yes, I promise. And you promise, Elmer. Oh, to have and to hold, he sang out, swinging about to follow her as she hurriedly began to retrace her steps. The March twilight had fallen, and the stentorian façade was all aglow, when Undine regained its monumental threshold. She slipped through the marble vestibule and soared skyward in the mirror-lined lift, hardly conscious of the direction she was taking. What she wanted was solitude, and the time to put some order into her thoughts, and she hoped to steal into her room without meeting her mother. Through her thick veil the clusters of lights in the Sprague drawing-room dilated and flowed together in a yellow blur, from which, as she entered, a figure detached itself and with a start of annoyance she saw Ralph Marvell rise from the perusal of the fiction number of a magazine which had replaced the Hound of the Baskervilles on the onyx table. "'Yes. You told me not to come. And here I am.' He lifted her hand to his lips, as his eyes tried to find hers through the veil. She drew back with a nervous gesture. "'I told you I'd be awfully late.' "'I know. Trying on.' and you're horribly tired and wishing with all your might I wasn't here. "'I'm not so sure I'm not,' she rejoined, trying to hide her vexation in a smile. "'What a tragic little voice! You really are done up. I couldn't help dropping in for a minute. But of course if you say so I'll be off.' She was removing her long gloves, and he took her hands and drew her close. "'Only take off your veil and let me see you.' A quiver of resistance ran through her. He felt it and dropped her hands. "'Please don't tease. I never could bear it,' she stammered, drawing away. "'Till tomorrow, then. That is, if the dressmakers permit.' She forced a laugh. "'If I showed myself now, you might not come back tomorrow. I look perfectly hideous. It was so hot, and they kept me so long.' all to make yourself more beautiful for a man who's blind with your beauty already. The words made her smile, and moving nearer, she bent her head and stood still while he undid her veil. As he put it back, their lips met, 
and his look of passionate tenderness was incense to her. But the next moment his expression passed from worship to concern. Dear, why, what's the matter? You've been crying. She put both hands to her hat in the instinctive effort to hide her face. His persistence was as irritating as her mother's. I told you it was frightfully hot, and all my things were horrid, and it made me so cross and nervous. She turned to the looking-glass with a feint of smoothing her hair. Marvell laid his hand on her arm. I can't bear to see you so done up. Why can't we be married to-morrow and escape all these ridiculous preparations? I shall hate your fine clothes if they're going to make you so miserable. She dropped her hands and swept about on him, her face lit up by a new idea. He was extraordinarily handsome and appealing, and her heart began to beat faster. I hate it all, too. I wish we could be married right away. Marvell caught her to him joyously. Dearest, dearest, don't, if you don't mean it. The thought's too glorious. Undine lingered in his arms, not with any intent of tenderness, but as if too deeply lost in a new train of thought to be conscious of his hold. I suppose most of the things could be got ready sooner, if I said they must, she brooded with a fixed gaze that travelled past him. And the rest? Why shouldn't the rest be sent over to Europe after us? I want to go straight off with you, away from everything, ever so far away, where there'll be nobody but you and me alone. She had a flash of illumination which made her turn her lips to his. Oh, my darling, my darling, Marvell whispered. End of chapter 9 Chapter Ten. Mr. and Mrs. Spragg were both given to such long periods of ruminating apathy that the student of inheritance might have wondered whence Undine derived her overflowing activity. The answer would have been obtained by observing her father's business life. From the moment he set foot in Wall Street, Mr. Spragg became another man. Physically, the change revealed itself only by the subtlest signs. As he steered his way to his office through the jostling crowds of William Street, his relaxed muscles did not grow more taut or his lounging gait less desultory. His shoulders were hollowed by the usual droop, and his rusty black waistcoat showed the same creased concavity at the waist, the same flabby prominence below. It was only in his face that the difference was perceptible, though even here it rather lurked behind the features than openly modified them showing itself now and then in the cautious glint of half-closed eyes, the forward thrust of black brows, or a tightening of the lax lines of the mouth, as the gleam of a night watchman's light might flash across the darkness of a shuttered house-front. The shutters were more tightly barred than usual, when, on a morning some two weeks later than the date of the incidents last recorded, Mr. Spragg approached the steel and concrete tower in which his office occupied a lofty pigeonhole. Events had moved rapidly, and somewhat surprisingly in the interval, and Mr. Spragg had already accustomed himself to the fact that his daughter was to be married within the week, instead of awaiting the traditional post-Lenten date. Conventionally the change meant little to him, but on the practical side it presented unforeseen difficulties. Mr. Spragg had learned within the last weeks that a New York marriage involved material obligations unknown to Apex. Marvell, indeed, had been loftily careless of such questions, but his grandfather, on the announcement of the engagement, had called on Mr. Spragg, and put before him, with polished precision, the young man's financial situation. Mr. Spragg, at the moment, had been inclined to deal with his visitor in a spirit of indulgent irony. As he leaned back in his revolving chair, with feet adroitly balanced against a tilted scrap-basket, his air of relaxed power made Mr. Dagonet's venerable elegance seem as harmless as that of an ivory jackstraw, and his first replies to his visitor were made with the mildness of a kindly giant. Mm, "'Ralph, don't make a living out of the law, you say? No, it didn't strike me he'd be likely to, from the talks I've had with him. Fact is, the law's a business that wants—' Mr. Spragg broke off, checked by a protest from Mr. Dagonet. "'Oh!' A profession, you call it. It ain't a business? 
his smile grew more indulgent as this novel distinction dawned on him. "'Why, I guess that's the whole trouble with Ralph. Nobody expects to make money in a profession, and if you taught him to regard the law that way, he'd better go right into cooking-stoves and be done with it.' Mr. Dagonet, within a narrower range, had his own play of humour, and it met Mr. Spragg's with a leap. "'It's because I knew he would manage to make cooking-stoves as unremunerative as a profession that I saved him from so glaring a failure by putting him into the law.' The retort drew a grunt of amusement from Mr. Spragg, and the eyes of the two men met in unexpected understanding. "'That so? What can he do, then?' the future father-in-law inquired. "'He can write poetry. At least he tells me he can.' Mr. Dagonet hesitated, as if aware of the inadequacy of the alternative, and then added, "'And he can count on three thousand a year from me.' Mr. Spragg tilted himself farther back, without disturbing his subtly calculated relation to the scrap-basket. "'Does it cost anything like that to print his poetry?' Mr. Dagonet smiled again. He was clearly enjoying his visit. "'Dear, no. He doesn't go in for Lux editions. And now and then he gets ten dollars from a magazine.' Mr. Spragg mused. "'Wasn't he ever taught to work?' "'No, I really couldn't have afforded that.' "'I see. Then they've got to live on two hundred and fifty dollars a month.' Mr. Dagonet remained pleasantly unmoved. "'Does it cost anything like that to buy your daughter's dresses?' A subterranean chuckle agitated the lower folds of Mr. Spragg's waistcoat. "'I might put him in the way of something. I guess he's smart enough.' Mr. Dagonet made a gesture of friendly warning. "'It will pay us both in the end to keep him out of business,' he said rising as if to show that his mission was accomplished. The results of this friendly conference had been more serious than Mr. Spragg could have foreseen, and the victory remained with his antagonist. It had not entered into Mr. Spragg's calculations that he would have to give his daughter any fixed income on her marriage. He meant that she should have the handsomest wedding the New York press had ever celebrated, and her mother's fancy was already afloat on a sea of luxuries—a motor, a Fifth Avenue house, and a tiara that should outblaze Mrs. Van Degen's, but these were movable benefits, to be conferred whenever Mr. Spragg happened to be on the right side of the market. It was a different matter to be called on at such short notice to bridge the gap between young Marvell's allowance and Undine's requirements, and her father's immediate conclusion was that the engagement had better be broken off. Such decisions were almost painless in Apex and he had fancied it would be easy, by an appeal to the girl's pride, to make her see that she owed it to herself to do better. "'You'd better wait a while and look round again,' was the way he had put it to her, at the opening of the talk, of which even now he could not recall the close without a tremor. Undine, when she took his meaning, had been terrible. Everything had gone down before her, as towns and villages went down before one of the tornadoes of her native state. Wait a while? Look round? Did he suppose she was marrying for money? Didn't he see it was all a question, now and here, of the kind of people she wanted to go with? Did he want to throw her straight back into the Lipscomb set, to have her marry a dentist, and live in a West Side flat? Why hadn't they stayed in Apex, if that was all he thought she was fit for? She might as well have married Millard Binch, instead of handing him over to Indiana Frusk. Couldn't her father understand that nice girls in New York didn't regard getting married like going on a buggy ride? It was enough to ruin a girl's chances if she broke her engagement to a man in Ralph Marvell's set. All kinds of spiteful things would be said about her, and she would never be able to go with one of the right people again. They had better go back to Apex right off. It was they and not she who had wanted to leave Apex anyhow. She could call her mother to witness it. She had always, when it came to that, done what her father and mother wanted, but she'd given up trying to make out what they were after, unless it was to make her miserable. And if that was it, hadn't they had enough of it by this time? She had, anyhow. But after this she meant to lead her own life, and they needn't ask her where she was going or what she meant to do, 
because this time she'd die before she told them, and they'd made life so hateful to her that she only wished she was dead already. Mr. Spragg heard her out in silence, pulling at his beard with one sallow, wrinkled hand, while the other dragged down the armhole of his waistcoat. Suddenly he looked up and said, "'Ain't you in love with the fellow, Undy?' The girl glared back at him, her splendid brows beetling like an Amazon's. "'Do you think I'd care a cent for all the rest of it if I wasn't?' "'Well, if you are, you and he won't mind beginning in a small way.' Her look poured contempt on his ignorance. "'Do you suppose I'd drag him down?' With a magnificent gesture, she tore Marvell's ring from her finger. "'I'll send this back this minute. I'll tell him I thought he was a rich man, and now I see I'm mistaken.' She burst into shattering sobs, rocking her beautiful body back and forth in all the abandonment of young grief, and her father stood over her, stroking her shoulder and saying helplessly, "'I'll see what I can do, Undine.' All his life, and at ever-diminishing intervals, Mr. Spragg had been called on by his womenkind to see what he could do, and the seeing had almost always resulted as they wished. Undine did not have to send back her ring, and in her state of trance-like happiness she hardly asked by what means her path had been smoothed, but merely accepted her mother's assurance that father had fixed everything all right. Mr. Spragg accepted the situation also. A son-in-law who expected to be pensioned like a Grand Army veteran was a phenomenon new to his experience, but if that was what Undine wanted she should have it. Only two days later, however, he was met by a new demand. The young people had decided to be married right off, instead of waiting till June. This change of plan was made known to Mr. Spragg at a moment when he was peculiarly unprepared for the financial readjustment it necessitated. He had always declared himself able to cope with any crisis if Undine and her mother would go steady, but he now warned them of his inability to keep up with the new pace they had set. Undine, not deigning to return to the charge, had commissioned her mother to speak for her, and Mr. Spragg was surprised to meet in his wife a firmness as inflexible as his daughter's. "'I can't do it, Lute. I can't put my hand on the cash,' he had protested. But Mrs. Spragg fought him inch by inch, her back to the wall, flinging out at last as he pressed her closer. "'Well, if you want to know, she's seen Elmer.' The bolt reached its mark, and her husband turned an agitated face on her. "'Elmer? What on earth? He didn't come here.' "'No, but he sat next to her the other night at the theatre, and she's wild with us for not having warned her.' Mr. Spragg's scowl drew his projecting brows together. "'Warned her of what? What's Elmer to her? Why's she afraid of Elmer Moffat?' "'She's afraid of his talking.' "'Talking? What on earth can he say that'll hurt her?' "'Oh, I don't know,' Mrs. Spragg wailed. "'She's so nervous I can hardly get a word out of her.' Mr. Spragg's whitening face showed the touch of a new fear. Is she afraid he'll get round her again, make up to her? Is that what she means by talking? I don't know. I don't know. I only know she's afraid. She's afraid as death of him. For a long interval they sat silently looking at each other, while their heavy eyes exchanged conjectures. Then Mr. Spragg rose from his chair, saying as he took up his hat, Don't you fret, Leota. I'll see what I can do. He had been seeing now for an arduous fortnight, and the strain on his vision had resulted in a state of tension such as he had not undergone since the epic days of the pure water move at Apex. It was not his habit to impart his fears to Mrs. Spragg and Undine, and they continued the bridal preparations, secure in their invariable experience that once father had been convinced of the impossibility of evading their demands, he might be trusted to satisfy them by means with which his womenkind need not concern themselves. Mr. Spragg, as he approached his office on the morning in question, felt reasonably sure of fulfilling these expectations, but he reflected that a few more such victories would mean disaster. He entered the vast marble vestibule of the Ararat Trust Building and walked toward the express elevator that was to carry him to his office. 
At the door of the elevator a man turned to him, and he recognized Elmer Moffatt, who put out his hand with an easy gesture. Mr. Spragg did not ignore the gesture, he did not even withhold his hand. In his code the cut, as a conscious sign of disapproval, did not exist. In the South, if you had a grudge against a man, you tried to shoot him. In the West, you tried to do him in a mean turn in business. But in neither region was the cut among the social weapons of offence. Mr. Spragg, therefore, seeing Moffat in his path, extended a lifeless hand while he faced the young man scowlingly. Moffat met the hand and the scowl with equal coolness. "'Going up to your office? I was on my way there.' The elevator door rolled back, and Mr. Spragg, entering it, found his companion at his side. They remained silent during the ascent to Mr. Spragg's threshold, but there the latter turned to inquire ironically of Moffat, "'Anything left to say?' Moffat smiled. "'Nothing left. No. I'm carrying a whole new line of goods.' Mr. Spragg pondered the reply. Then he opened the door and suffered Moffat to follow him in. Behind an inner glazed enclosure, with its one window dimmed by a sooty perspective barred with chimneys, he seated himself at a dusty littered desk, and groped instinctively for the support of the scrap-basket. Moffat, uninvited, dropped into the nearest chair, and Mr. Spragg said after another silence, "'I'm pretty busy this morning.' "'I know you are. That's why I'm here,' Moffat serenely answered. He leaned back, crossing his legs, and twisting his small stiff moustache with a plump hand adorned by a cameo. "'Fact is,' he went on, "'this is a coals of fire call. You think I owe you a grudge, and I'm going to show you I'm not that kind. I'm going to put you on to a good thing. Oh, not because I'm so fond of you, just because it happens to hit my sense of a joke.' While Moffat talked, Mr. Spragg took up the pile of letters on his desk, and sat shuffling them like a pack of cards. He dealt them deliberately to two imaginary players, then he pushed them aside, and drew out his watch. "'All right. I carry one, too,' said the young man easily. "'But you'll find it's time gained to hear what I've got to say.' Mr. Spragg considered the vista of chimneys without speaking, and Moffat continued. I don't suppose you care to hear the story of my life, so I won't refer you to the back numbers. You used to say out in Apex that I spent too much time loafing around the bar of the Mealy House. That was one of the things you had against me. Well, maybe I did, but it taught me to talk and to listen to the other fellows, too. Just at present I'm one of Harmon B. Driscoll's private secretaries, and some of that Mealy House loafing has come in more useful than any job I ever put my hand to. The old man happened to hear I knew something about the inside of the U-Baw deal, and took me on to have the information where he could get at it. I've given him good talk for his money, but I've done some listening, too. U-Baw ain't the only commodity the Driscolls deal in. Mr. Spragg restored his watch to his pocket, and shifted his drowsy gaze from the window to his visitor's face. Yes, said Moffatt, as if in reply to the movement. The Driscolls are getting busy out in Apex. Now they've got all the street railroads in their pocket, they want the water supply, too. But you know that as well as I do. Fact is, they've got to have it, and that's where you and I come in. Mr. Spragg thrust his hands in his waistcoat armholes and turned his eyes back to the window. I'm out of that long ago, he said indifferently. Sure, Moffat acquiesced. But you know what went on when you were in it. Well? said Mr. Spragg, shifting one hand to the Masonic emblem on his watch-chain. "'Well, Representative James J. Rolliver, who was in it with you, ain't out of it yet. He's the man the Driscolls are up against. What do you know about him?' Mr. Spragg twirled the emblem thoughtfully. "'Driscoll tell you to come here?' Moffat laughed. Oh, "'No, sir. Not by a good many miles.' Mr. Spragg removed his feet from the scrap-basket and straightened himself in his chair. "'Well, I didn't either. Good morning, Mr. Moffat.' The young man stared a moment, a humorous glint in his small black eyes, but he made no motion to leave his seat. "'Undine's to be married next week, isn't she?' he asked in a conversational tone. 
Mr. Spragg's face blackened, and he swung about in his revolving chair. "'You go to!' Moffatt raised a deprecating hand. "'Oh, you needn't warn me off. I don't want to be invited to the wedding, and I don't want to forbid the bands.' There was a derisive sound in Mr. Spragg's throat. "'But I do want to get out of Driscoll's office,' Moffatt imperturbably continued. "'There's no future there for a fellow like me. I see things big. That's the reason Apex was too tight a fit for me. It's only the little fellows that succeed in little places. New York's my size, without a single alteration. I could prove it to you tomorrow, if I could put my hand on fifty thousand dollars.' Mr. Spragg did not repeat his gesture of dismissal. He was once more listening guardedly, but intently. Moffatt saw it and continued. "'And I could put my hand on double that sum. Yes, sir, double. If you'd just step round with me to old Driscoll's office before five p.m. See the connection, Mr. Spragg?' The older man remained silent, while his visitor hummed a bar or two of In the Gloaming. Then he said, you want me to tell Driscoll what I know about James J. Rolliver? I want you to tell the truth. I want you to stand for political purity in your native state. A man of your prominence owes it to the community, sir," cried Moffatt. Mr. Spragg was still tormenting his Masonic emblem. "'Rolliver and I always stood together,' he said at last, with a tinge of reluctance. "'Well, how much have you made out of it?' Ain't he always been ahead of the game? I can't do it. I can't do it, said Mr. Spragg, bringing his clenched hand down on the desk, as if addressing an invisible throng of assailants. Moffatt rose without any evidence of disappointment in his ruddy countenance. Well, so long, he said, moving toward the door. Near the threshold he paused to add carelessly, "'Excuse my referring to a personal matter, but I understand Miss Spragg's wedding takes place next Monday.' Mr. Spragg was silent. "'How's that?' Moffatt continued unabashed. "'I saw on the papers the date was set for the end of June.' Mr. Spragg rose heavily from his seat. "'I presume my daughter has her reasons,' he said, moving toward the door in Moffatt's wake. "'I guess she has.' same as I have for wanting you to step round with me to old Driscoll's. If Undine's reasons are as good as mine—' "'Stop right here, Elmer Moffat!' the older man broke out with lifted hand. Moffat made a burlesque feint of evading a blow. Then his face grew serious, and he moved close to Mr. Spragg, whose arm had fallen to his side. "'See here. I know Undine's reasons. I've had a talk with her. Didn't she tell you?' She don't beat about the bush the way you do. She told me straight out what was bothering her. She wants the Marvells to think she's right out of kindergarten. No good sent out on approval from this counter. And I see her point. I don't mean to publish my memoirs. Only a deal's a deal. He paused a moment, twisting his fingers about the heavy gold watch chain that crossed his waistcoat. Tell you what, Mr. Spragg. I don't bear malice. Not against Undine, anyway. And if I could have afforded it, I'd have been glad enough to oblige her and forget old times. But you didn't hesitate to kick me when I was down, and it's taken me a day or two to get on my legs again after that kicking. I see my way now to get there and keep there, and there's a kinder poetic justice in your being the man to help me up. If I can get hold of fifty thousand dollars within a day or so, I don't care who's got the start of me. I've got a dead sure thing in sight, and you're the only man that can get it for me. Now do you see where we're coming out?" Mr. Spragg, during this discourse, had remained motionless, his hands in his pockets, his jaws moving mechanically, as though he mumbled a toothpick under his beard. His sallow cheek had turned a shade paler, and his brows hung threateningly over his half-closed eyes. But there was no threat. There was scarcely more than a note of dull curiosity in the voice with which he said, "'You mean to talk?' Moffatt's rosy face grew as hard as a steel safe. "'I mean you to talk, to old Driscoll.' He paused, and then added, "'It's a hundred thousand down, between us.' Mr. Spragg once more consulted his watch. 
"'I'll see you again,' he said with an effort. Moffat struck one fist against the other. "'No, sir, you won't. You'll only hear from me, through the Marvell family. Your news ain't worth a dollar to Driscoll if you don't get it today." He was checked by the sound of steps in the outer office, and Mr. Sprague's stenographer appeared in the doorway. "'It's Mr. Marvell," she announced, and Ralph Marvell, glowing with haste and happiness, stood between the two men, holding out his hand to Mr. Sprague. "'Am I awfully in the way, sir? Turn me out if I am, but first let me just say a word about this necklace I've ordered for un—' He broke off, made aware by Mr. Sprague's glance of the presence of Elmer Moffat, who, with unwonted discretion, had dropped back into the shadow of the door. Marvell turned on Moffat a bright gaze full of the instinctive hospitality of youth, but Moffat looked straight past him at Mr. Sprague. The latter, as if in response to an imperceptible signal, mechanically pronounced his visitor's name, and the two young men moved toward each other. "'I beg your pardon most awfully. Am I breaking up an important conference?' Ralph asked as he shook hands. "'I know. I guess we're pretty nearly through. I'll step outside and woo the blonde while you're talking.' Moffat rejoined in the same key. "'Thanks so much. I shan't take two seconds.' Ralph broke off to scrutinize him. "'But haven't we met before? It seems to me I've seen you, just lately.' Moffat seemed about to answer, but his reply was checked by an abrupt movement on the part of Mr. Sprague. There was a perceptible pause, during which Moffat's bright black glance rested questioningly on Ralph. Then he looked again at the older man, and their eyes held each other for a silent moment. "'Why, no, not as I'm aware of, Mr. Marvell,' Moffat said, addressing himself amicably to Ralph. "'Better late than never, though.' and I hope to have the pleasure soon again." He divided a nod between the two men, and passed into the outer office, where they heard him addressing the stenographer in a strain of exaggerated gallantry. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 The July sun enclosed in a ring of fire the ilex grove of a villa in the hills near Siena. Below, by the roadside, the long yellow house seemed to waver and palpitate in the glare. But steep by steep behind it, the cool ilex dusk mounted to the ledge, where Ralph Marvell, stretched on his back in the grass, lay gazing up at a black reticulation of branches, between which bits of sky gleamed with the hardness and brilliancy of blue enamel. Up there, too, the air was thick with heat, but compared with the white fire below it was a dim and tempered warmth, like that of the churches in which he and Undine sometimes took refuge at the height of the torrid days. Ralph loved the heavy Italian summer, as he had loved the light spring days leading up to it, the long line of dancing days that had drawn them on and on ever since they had left their ship at Naples four months earlier. Four months of beauty, changeful, inexhaustible, weaving itself about him in shapes of softness and strength, and beside him, hand in hand with him, embodying that spirit of shifting magic, the radiant creature through whose eyes he saw it. This was what their hastened marriage had blessed them with, giving them leisure before summer came to penetrate to remote folds of the southern mountains to linger in the shade of Sicilian orange-groves, and finally, travelling by slow stages to the Adriatic, to reach the central hill-country, where even in July they might hope for a breathable air. To Ralph the Sienese air was not only breathable, but intoxicating. The sun, treading the earth like a vintager, drew from it heady fragrances, crushed out of it new colours. All the values of the temperate landscape were reversed. The noon highlights were whiter, but the shadows had unimagined colour. On the blackness of cork and ilex and cypress lay the green and purple lustres, the coppery iridescences of old bronze, and night after night the skies were wine-blue and bubbling with stars. Ralph said to himself that no one who had not seen Italy thus prostrate beneath the sun knew what secret treasures she could yield. 
as he lay there fragments of past states of emotion fugitive felicities of thought and sensation rose and floated on the surface of his thoughts it was one of those moments when the accumulated impressions of life converge on heart and brain elucidating enlacing each other in a mysterious confusion of beauty he had had glimpses of such a state before of such mergings of the personal with the general life that one felt oneself a mere wave on the wild stream of being yet thrilled with a sharper sense of individuality than can be known within the mere bounds of the actual but now he knew the sensation in its fullness and with it came the releasing power of language words were flashing like brilliant birds through the boughs overhead he had but to wave his magic wand to have them flutter down to him only they were so beautiful up there weaving their fantastic flights against the blue that it was pleasanter for the moment to watch them and let the wand lie he stared up at the pattern they made till his eyes ached with excessive light then he changed his position and looked at his wife undine nearby leaned against a gnarled tree with the slightly constrained air of a person unused to sylvan abandonments her beautiful back could not adapt itself to the irregularities of the tree trunk and she moved a little now and then in the effort to find an easier position but her expression was serene and ralph looking up at her through drowsy lids thought her face had never been more exquisite you look as cool as a wave he said reaching out for the hand on her knee she let him have it and he drew it closer scrutinizing it as if it had been a bit of precious porcelain or ivory it was small and soft a mere featherweight a puff-ball of a hand not quick and thrilling not a speaking hand but one to be fondled and dressed in rings and to leave a rosy blur in the brain the fingers were short and tapering dimpled at the base with nails as smooth as rose-leaves ralph lifted them one by one like a child playing with piano keys but they were inelastic and did not spring back far only far enough to show the dimples he turned the hand over and traced the course of its blue veins from the wrist to the rounding of the palm below the fingers then he put a kiss in the warm hollow between the upper world had vanished his universe had shrunk to the palm of a hand but there was no sense of diminution in the mystic depths whence his passion sprang earthly dimensions were ignored and the curve of beauty was boundless enough to hold whatever the imagination could pour into it ralph had never felt more convinced of his power to write a great poem but now it was undine's hand which held the magic wand of expression she stirred again uneasily answering his last words with a faint accent of reproach i don't feel cool you said there'd be a breeze up here he laughed you poor darling wasn't it ever as hot as this in apex she withdrew her hand with a slight grimace yes but i didn't marry you to go back to apex ralph laughed again then he lifted himself on his elbow and regained the hand i wonder what you did marry me for mercy it's too hot for conundrums she spoke without impatience but with a lassitude less joyous than his he roused himself do you really mind the heat so much we'll go if you do she sat up eagerly go to switzerland you mean well i hadn't taken quite as long a leap i only meant we might drive back to siena she relapsed listlessly against her tree-trunk oh siena's hotter than this we could go and sit in the cathedral it's always cool there at sunset we've sat in the cathedral at sunset every day for a week well what do you say to stopping at lecchetto on the way i haven't shown you lecchetto yet and the drive back by moonlight would be glorious this woke her to a slight show of interest it might be nice but where could we get anything to eat ralph laughed again i don't believe we could you're too practical well somebody's got to be and the food in the hotel is too disgusting if we're not on time 
I admit that the best of it has usually been appropriated by the extremely good-looking cavalry officer who's so keen to know you." Undine's face brightened. "'You know he's not a count. He's a marquis. His name's Roviano. His palace in Rome is in the guide-books, and he speaks English beautifully. Celeste found out about him from the head-waiter," she said, with the security of one who treats of recognized values. Marvell, sitting upright, reached lazily across the grass for his hat. Then there's all the more reason for rushing back to defend our share. He spoke in the bantering tone which had become the habitual expression of his tenderness, but his eyes softened as they absorbed in a last glance the glimmering submarine light of the ancient grove, through which Undine's figure wavered Nereid-like above him. "'You never looked your name more than you do now,' he said kneeling at her side and putting his arm about her. She smiled back a little vaguely, as if not seizing his illusion, and being content to let it drop into the store of unexplained references which had once stimulated her curiosity, but now merely gave her leisure to think of other things. But her smile was no less lovely for its vagueness, and indeed, to Ralph, the loveliness was enhanced by the latent doubt. He remembered afterward that at that moment the cup of life seemed to brim over. Come, dear, here or there, it's all divine. In the carriage, however, she remained insensible to the soft spell of the evening, noticing only the heat and dust, and saying, as they passed under the wooded cliff of Lecchetto, that they might as well have stopped there after all, since with such a headache as she felt coming on, she didn't care if she dined or not. Ralph looked up yearningly at the long walls overhead, but Undine's mood was hardly favourable to communion with such scenes, and he made no attempt to stop the carriage. Instead, he presently said, "'If you're tired of Italy, we've got the world to choose from.' She did not speak for a moment. Then she said, "'It's the heat I'm tired of. Don't people generally come here earlier?' "'Yes, that's why I chose the summer, so that we could have it all to ourselves.' She tried to put a note of reasonableness into her voice. "'If you told me we were going everywhere at the wrong time, of course I could have arranged about my clothes.' "'You poor darling! Let us by all means go to the place where the clothes will be right. They're too beautiful to be left out of our scheme of life.' Her lips hardened. "'I know you don't care how I look.' but you didn't give me time to order anything before we married, and I've got nothing but my last winter's things to wear." Ralph smiled. Even his subjugated mind perceived the inconsistency of Undine's taxing him with having hastened their marriage, but her variations on the eternal feminine still enchanted him. "'We'll go wherever you please. You make every place the one place,' he said, as if he were humouring an irresistible child. To Switzerland, then. Celeste says San Moritz is too heavenly," exclaimed Undine, who gathered her ideas of Europe chiefly from the conversation of her experienced attendant. One can be cool short of the Engadine. Why not go south again, say to Capri? Capri? Is that the island we saw from Naples where the artists go? She drew her brows together. It would be simply awful getting there in this heat. Well, then, I know a little place in Switzerland where one can still get away from the crowd, and we can sit and look at a green waterfall, while I lie in wait for adjectives." Mr. Spragg's astonishment on learning that his son-in-law contemplated maintaining a household on the earnings of his muse was still matter for pleasantry between the pair, and one of the humours of their first weeks together had consisted in picturing themselves as a primeval couple setting forth across a virgin continent, and subsisting on the adjectives which Ralph was to trap for his epic. On this occasion, however, his wife did not take up the joke, and he remained silent while their carriage climbed the long dusty hill to the Fontebranda gate. He had seen her face droop as he suggested the possibility of an escape from the crowds in Switzerland, and it came to him, with the sharpness of a knife-thrust, that a crowd was what she wanted that she was sick to death of being alone with him. He sat motionless, staring ahead at the red-brown walls and towers on the steep above them. After all, there was nothing sudden in this discovery. 
For weeks it had hung on the edge of consciousness, but he had turned from it with the heart's instinctive clinging to the unrealities by which it lives. Even now a hundred qualifying reasons rushed to his aid. They told him it was not of himself that Undine had wearied, but only of their present way of life. He had said a moment before, without conscious exaggeration, that her presence made any place the one place. Yet how willingly would he have consented to share in such a life as she was leading before their marriage! And he had to acknowledge their months of desultory wandering from one remote Italian hilltop to another must have seemed as purposeless to her as balls and dinners would have been to him. An imagination like his, peopled with such varied images and associations, fed by so many currents from the long stream of human experience, could hardly picture the bareness of the small half-lit place in which his wife's spirit fluttered. Her mind was as destitute of beauty and mystery as the prairie schoolhouse in which she had been educated, and her ideals seemed to Ralph as pathetic as the ornaments made of corks and cigar-bands with which her infant hands had been taught to adorn it. He was beginning to understand this, and learning to adapt himself to the narrow compass of her experience. The task of opening new windows in her mind was inspiring enough to give him infinite patience, and he would not yet own to himself that her pliancy and variety were imitative rather than spontaneous. Meanwhile he had no desire to sacrifice her wishes to his, and it distressed him that he dared not confess his real reason for avoiding the Engadine. The truth was that their funds were shrinking faster than he had expected. Mr. Spragg, after bluntly opposing their hastened marriage on the ground that he was not prepared at such short notice to make the necessary provision for his daughter, had shortly afterward, probably, as Undine observed to Ralph, in consequence of a lucky turn in the street, met their wishes with all possible liberality, bestowing on them a wedding in conformity with Mrs. Spragg's ideals and up to the highest standard of Mrs. Heeny's clippings, and pledging himself to provide Undine with an income adequate to so brilliant a beginning. It was understood that Ralph, on their return, should renounce the law for some more paying business, but this seemed the smallest of sacrifices to make for the privilege of calling Undine his wife. And besides, he still secretly hoped that, in the interval, his real vocation might declare itself in some work which would justify his adopting the life of letters. He had assumed that Undine's allowance, with the addition of his own small income, would be enough to satisfy their needs. His own were few, and had always been within his means. But his wife's daily requirements, combined with her intermittent outbreaks of extravagance, had thrown out all his calculations, and they were already seriously exceeding their income. If any one had prophesied before his marriage that he would find it difficult to tell this to Undine, he would have smiled at the suggestion, and during their first days together it had seemed as though pecuniary questions were the last likely to be raised between them. But his marital education had since made strides, and he now knew that a disregard for money may imply not the willingness to get on without it, but merely a blind confidence that it will somehow be provided. If Undine, like the lilies of the field, took no care, it was not because her wants were as few, but because she assumed that care would be taken for her by those whose privilege it was to enable her to unite floral insouciance with Sheban elegance. She had met Ralph's first note of warning with the assurance that she didn't mean to worry, and her tone implied that it was his business to do so for her. He certainly wanted to guard her from this as from all other cares. He wanted also, and still more passionately after the topic had once or twice recurred between them, to guard himself from the risk of judging where he still adored. These restraints to frankness kept him silent during the remainder of the drive, and when, after dinner, Undine again complained of her headache, he let her go up to her room, and wandered out into the dimly lit streets to renewed communion with his problems. They hung on him insistently, as darkness fell, and Sienna grew vocal with that shrill diversity of sounds that breaks on summer nights from every cleft of the masonry in old Italian towns. Then the moon rose, unfolding depth by depth the lines of the antique land, and Ralph, leaning against an old brick parapet, and watching each silver-blue remoteness disclose itself between the dark masses of the middle distance, felt his spirit enlarged and pacified. For the first time, 
as his senses thrilled to the deep touch of beauty, he asked himself if out of these floating and fugitive vibrations he might not build something concrete and stable, if even such dull common cares as now oppressed him might not become the motive power of creation. If he could only, on the spot, do something with all the accumulated spoils of the last months, something that should both put money into his pocket and harmony into the rich confusion of his spirit. I'll write. I'll write. That must be what the whole thing means, he said to himself, with a vague clutch at some solution which should keep him a little longer hanging halfway down the steep of disenchantment. He would have stayed on, heedless of time, to trace the ramifications of his idea in the complex beauty of the scene, but for the longing to share his mood with Undine. For the last few months every thought and sensation had been instantly transmuted into such emotional impulses, and though the currents of communication between himself and Undine were neither deep nor numerous, each fresh rush of feeling seemed strong enough to clear a way to her heart. He hurried back almost breathlessly to the inn, but even as he knocked at her door the subtle emanation of other influences seemed to arrest and chill him. She had put out the lamp, and sat by the window in the moonlight, her head propped on a listless hand. As Marvell entered she turned, then, without speaking, she looked away again. He was used to this mute reception, and had learned that it had no personal motive, but was the result of an extremely simplified social code. Mr. and Mrs. Spragg seldom spoke to each other when they met, and words of greeting seemed almost unknown to their domestic vocabulary. Marvell at first had fancied that his own warmth would call forth a response from his wife, who had been so quick to learn the forms of worldly intercourse, but he soon saw that she regarded intimacy as a pretext for escaping from such forms into a total absence of expression. Tonight, however, he felt another meaning in her silence, and perceived that she intended him to feel it. He met it by silence, but of a different kind. Letting his nearness speak for him, as he knelt beside her, and laid his cheek against hers. She seemed hardly aware of the gesture, but to that he was also used. She had never shown any repugnance to his tenderness, but such response as it evoked was remote and aerial-like, suggesting from the first not so much of the recoil of ignorance as the coolness of the element from which she took her name. As he pressed her to him she seemed to grow less impassive, and he felt her resign herself like a tired child. He held his breath, not daring to break the spell. At length he whispered, "'I've just seen such a wonderful thing. I wish you'd been with me.' "'What sort of a thing?' She turned her head with a faint show of interest. "'Uh, I don't know. A vision. It came to me out there just now with the moonrise.' "'A vision?' her interest flagged. "'I never cared much about spirits. Mother used to try to drag me to séances, but they always made me sleepy.' Ralph laughed. "'I don't mean a dead spirit, but a living one. I saw the vision of a book I mean to do. It came to me suddenly, magnificently, swooped down on me as that big white moon swooped down on the black landscape, tore at me like a great white eagle, like the bird of Jove. After all, imagination was the eagle that devoured Prometheus. She drew away abruptly, and the bright moonlight showed him the apprehension in her face. You're not going to write a book here. He stood up and wandered away a step or two, then he turned and came back. Of course not here. Wherever you want. The main point is that it's come to me. No, that it's come back to me. For it's all these months together, it's all our happiness, it's the meaning of life that I've found. And it's you, dearest, you who've given it to me." He dropped down beside her again, but she disengaged herself, and he heard a little sob in her throat. "'Undine, what's the matter?' "'Nothing. I don't know. I suppose I'm homesick.' "'Homesick? You poor darling. You're tired of travelling. What is it?" "'I don't know. I don't like Europe. It's not what I expected. And I think it's all too dreadfully dreary!' 
the words broke from her in a long wail of rebellion. Marvell gazed at her perplexedly. It seemed strange that such unguessed thoughts should have been stirring in the heart pressed to his. It's less interesting than you expected, or less amusing? Is that it? It's dirty and ugly. All the towns we've been to are disgustingly dirty. I loathe the smells and the beggars. I'm sick and tired of all the stuffy rooms in the hotels. I thought it would all be so splendid, but New York's ever so much nicer. Not New York in July. I don't care. There are the roof gardens, anyway, and there are always people around. All these places seem as if they were dead. It's like some awful cemetery. A sense of compunction checked Marvell's laughter. Don't cry, dear, don't. I see, I understand. You're lonely, and the heat has tired you out. It is dull here, awfully dull. I've been stupid not to feel it. But we'll start at once. We'll get out of it. She brightened instantly. We'll go up to Switzerland? We'll go up to Switzerland. He had a fleeting glimpse of the quiet place with the green waterfall, where he might have made tryst with his vision. Then he turned his mind from it and said, We'll go just where you want. How soon can you be ready to start? Oh, tomorrow, the first thing tomorrow. I'll make Celeste get out of bed now and pack. Can we go right through to St. Moritz? I'd rather sleep in the train than in another of these awful places. She was on her feet in a flash, her face alight, her hair waving and floating about her, as though it rose on her happy heartbeats. Oh, Ralph, it's sweet of you, and I love you, she cried out, letting him take her to his breast. End of chapter 11「Twelve, In the quiet place with the green waterfall, Ralph's vision might have kept faith with him. But how could he hope to surprise it in the midsummer crowds of St. Moritz? Undine, at any rate, had found there what she wanted, and when he was at her side, and her radiant smile included him, every other question was in abeyance. But there were hours of solitary striding over bare grassy slopes, face to face with the ironic interrogation of sky and mountains, when his anxieties came back, more persistent and importunate. Sometimes they took the form of merely material difficulties. How, for instance, was he to meet the cost of their ruinous suite at the Engadine Palace while he awaited Mr. Spragg's next remittance? And once the hotel bills were paid, what would be left for the journey back to Paris, the looming expenses there? the price of the passage to America. These questions would fling him back on the thought of his projected book, which was, after all, to be what the masterpieces of literature had mostly been, a potboiler. Well, why not? Did not the worshipper always heap the rarest essences on the altar of his divinity? Ralph still rejoiced in the thought of giving back to Undine something of the beauty of their first months together. But even on his solitary walks the vision eluded him and he could spare so few hours to its pursuit. Undine's days were crowded, and it was still a matter of course that where she went he should follow. He had risen visibly in her opinion since they had been absorbed into the life of the big hotels, and she had seen that his command of foreign tongues put him at an advantage even in circles where English was generally spoken, if not understood. Undine herself, hampered by her lack of languages, was soon drawn into the group of compatriots who struck the social pitch of their hotel. Their types were familiar enough to Ralph, who had taken their measure in former wanderings, and come across their duplicates in every scene of continental idleness. Foremost among them was Mrs. Harvey Shallum, a showy Parisianized figure, with a small wax-featured husband whose ultra-fashionable clothes seemed a tribute to his wife's importance rather than the mark of his personal taste. Mr. Shallum, in fact, could not be said to have any personal bent. Though he conversed with a colourless fluency in the principal European tongues, he seldom exercised his gift except in intercourse with hotel managers and head waiters, and his long silences were broken only by resigned allusions to the enormities he had suffered at the hands of this gifted but unscrupulous class. Mrs. Shallum, though in command of but a few verbs, all of which on her lips became irregular, managed to express a polyglot personality as vivid as her husband's was effaced. 
Her only idea of intercourse with her kind was to organize it into bands, and subject it to frequent displacements, and society smiled at her for these exertions like an infant vigorously rocked. She saw at once Undine's value as a factor in her scheme, and the two formed an alliance on which Ralph refrained from shedding the cold light of depreciation. It was a point of honour with him not to seem to disdain any of Undine's amusements. The noisy, interminable picnics, the hot, promiscuous balls, the concerts, the bridge-parties, and theatricals which helped to disguise the difference between the High Alps and Paris or New York. He told himself that there is always a Narcissus element in youth, and that what Undine really enjoyed was the image of her own charm, mirrored in the general admiration. With her quick perceptions and adaptabilities, she would soon learn to care more about the quality of the reflecting surface, and meanwhile no criticism of his should mar her pleasure. The appearance at their hotel of the cavalry officer from Siena was not a wholly agreeable surprise, but even after the handsome Marquis had been introduced to Undine and had whirled her through an evening's dances, Ralph was not seriously disturbed. Husband and wife had grown closer to each other since they had come to St. Moritz, and in the brief moments she could give him, Undine was now always gay and approachable. Her fitful humours had vanished, and she showed qualities of comradeship that seemed the promise of a deeper understanding. But this very hope made him more subject to her moods, more fearful of disturbing the harmony between them. Least of all could he broach the subject of money. He had too keen a memory of the way her lips could narrow, and her eyes turn from him, as if he were a stranger. It was a different matter that one day brought the look he feared to her face. She had announced her intention of going on an excursion with Mrs. Shallum, and three or four of the young men, who formed the nucleus of their shifting circle. And, for the first time, she did not ask Ralph if he were coming. But he felt no resentment at being left out. He was tired of these noisy assaults on the high solitudes, and the prospect of a quiet afternoon turned his thoughts to his book. Now if ever there seemed a chance of recapturing the moonlight vision. From his balcony he looked down on the assembling party. Mrs. Shallum was already screaming bilingually at various windows in the long façade, and Undine presently came out of the hotel with the Marques Roviano and two young English diplomatists. Slim and tall in her trim mountain garb, she made the ornate Mrs. Shallum look like a piece of ambulant upholstery. The high air brightened her cheeks and struck new lights from her hair, and Ralph had never seen her so touched with morning freshness. The party was not yet complete, and he felt a movement of annoyance when he recognized, in the last person to join it, a Russian lady of cosmopolitan notoriety whom he had run across in his unmarried days, and as to whom he had already warned Undine. Knowing what strange specimens from the depths slipped through the wide meshes of the watering-place world, he had foreseen that a meeting with the Baroness Adelschein was inevitable, but he had not expected her to become one of his wife's intimate circle. When the excursionists had started, he turned back to his writing-table and tried to take up his work. But he could not fix his thoughts. They were far away, in pursuit of Undine. He had been but five months married, and it seemed, after all, rather soon for him to be dropped out of such excursions as unquestioningly as poor Harvey Shallum. He smiled away this first twinge of jealousy, but the irritation it left found a pretext in his displeasure at Undine's choice of companions. Mrs. Shallum grated on his taste, but she was as open to inspection as a shop-window, and he was sure that time would teach his wife the cheapness of what she had to show. Roviano and the Englishman were well enough too, frankly bent on amusement, but pleasant and well-bred. But they would naturally take their tone from the women they were with, and Madame Adelschein's tone was notorious. He also knew that Undine's faculty of self-defence was weakened by the instinct of adapting herself to whatever company she was in, of copying the others in speech and gesture as closely as she reflected them in dress, and he was disturbed by the thought of what her ignorance might expose her to. She came back late, flushed with her long walk, her face all sparkle and mystery, as he had seen it in the first days of their courtship, and the look somehow revived his irritated sense of having been intentionally left out of the party. "'You've been gone for ever. Was it the Adelschein who made you go such lengths?' he asked her, trying to keep to his usual joking tone. 
undine as she dropped down on the sofa and unpinned her hat shed on him the light of her guileless gaze i don't know everybody was amusing the marquis is awfully bright i'd no idea you or bertha shallum knew madame adelschein well enough to take her off with you in that way undine sat absently smoothing the tuft of glossy cock's feathers in her hat i don't see that you've got to know people particularly well to go for a walk with them the baroness is awfully bright too she always gave her acquaintances their titles seeming not in this respect to have noticed that a simpler form prevailed i don't dispute the interest of what she says but i've told you what decent people think of what she does ralph retorted exasperated by what seemed a wilful pretence of ignorance she continued to scrutinize him with her clear eyes in which there was no shadow of offence you mean they don't want to go round with her you're mistaken it's not true she goes round with everybody she dined last night with the grand duchess roviano told me so this was not calculated to make ralph take a more tolerant view of the question does he also tell you what's said of her what's said of her undine's limpid glance rebuked him do you mean that disgusting scandal you told me about do you suppose i'd let him talk to me about such things i meant your mistake in about her social position he says she goes everywhere ralph laughed impatiently no doubt roviano's an authority but it doesn't happen to be his business to choose your friends for you undine echoed his laugh well i guess i don't need anybody to do that i can do it myself she said with the good-humoured curtness that was the habitual note of intercourse with the sprags ralph sat down beside her and laid a caressing touch on her shoulder no you can't you foolish child you know nothing of the society you're in of its antecedents its rules its conventions and it's my affair to look after you and warn you when you're on the wrong track mercy what a solemn speech she shrugged away his hand without ill-temper i don't believe an american woman needs to know such a lot about their old rules they can see i mean to follow my own and if they don't like it they needn't go with me oh they'll go with you fast enough as you call it they'll be too charmed to the question is how far they'll make you go with them and where they'll finally land you she tossed her head back with the movement she had learned in speaking school pieces about freedom and the british tyrant no one's ever yet gone any farther with me than i wanted she declared she was really exquisitely simple i'm not sure roviano hasn't in vouching for madame adelschein but he probably thinks you know about her to him this isn't society any more than the people in an omnibus are society to everybody here means the sanction of their own special group and of the corresponding groups elsewhere the adelschein goes about in a place like this because it's nobody's business to stop her but the women who tolerate her here would drop her like a shot if she set foot on their own ground the thoughtful air with which undine heard him out made him fancy this argument had carried and as he ended she threw him a bright look well that's easy enough i can drop her if she comes to new york ralph sat silent for a moment then he turned away and began to gather up his scattered pages undine in the ensuing days was no less often with madame adelschein and ralph suspected a challenge in her open frequentation of the lady but if challenge there were he let it lie whether his wife saw more or less of madame adelschein seemed no longer of much consequence she had so amply shown him her ability to protect herself the pang lay in the completeness of the proof in the perfect functioning of her instinct of self-preservation for the first time he was face to face with his hovering dread he was judging where he still adored before long more pressing cares absorbed him he had already begun to watch the post for his father-in-law's monthly remittance without precisely knowing how even with its aid he was to bridge the gulf of expense between st moritz and new york the non-arrival of mr spragg's check was productive of graver fears and these were abruptly confirmed when coming in one afternoon he found undine crying over a letter from her mother her distress made him fear that mr spragg was ill and he drew her to him soothingly but she broke away with an impatient movement oh they're all well enough 
but father's lost a lot of money. He's been speculating, and he can't send us anything for at least three months. Ralph murmured reassuringly, as long as there's no one ill. But in reality, he was following her despairing gaze down the long perspective of their barren quarter. Three months! Three months! Undine dried her eyes, and sat with lips set and tapping foot while he read her mother's letter. Your poor father. It's a hard knock for him. I'm sorry, he said, as he handed it back. For a moment she did not seem to hear. Then she said between her teeth, It's hard for us. I suppose now we'll have to go straight home. He looked at her with wonder. If that were all. In any case, I should have to be back in a few weeks. But we needn't have left here in August. It's the first place in Europe that I've liked, and it's just my luck to be dragged away from it. I'm so awfully sorry, dearest. It's my fault for persuading you to marry a pauper. It's father's fault. Why on earth did he go and speculate? There's no use his saying he's sorry now. She sat brooding for a moment, and then suddenly took Ralph's hand. Couldn't your people do something? Help us out just this once, I mean? He flushed to the forehead. It seemed inconceivable that she should make such a suggestion. I couldn't ask them. It's not possible. My grandfather does as much as he can for me, and my mother has nothing but what he gives her. Undine seemed unconscious of his embarrassment. He doesn't give us nearly as much as father does, she said. And as Ralph remained silent, she went on. Couldn't you ask your sister, then? I must have some clothes to go home in. His heart contracted as he looked at her. What sinister change came over her when her will was crossed? She seemed to grow inaccessible, implacable. Her eyes were like the eyes of an enemy. I don't know. I'll see, he said, rising and moving away from her. At that moment the touch of her hand was repugnant. Yes, he might ask Laura, no doubt, and whatever she had would be his. But the necessity was bitter to him, and Undine's unconsciousness of the fact hurt him more than her indifference to her father's misfortune. What hurt him most was the curious fact that, for all her light irresponsibility, it was always she who made the practical suggestion, hit the nail of expediency on the head. No sentimental scruple made the blow waver or deflected her resolute aim. She had thought at once of Laura, and Laura was his only, his inevitable resource. His anxious mind pictured his sister's wonder, and made him wince under the sting of Henley Fairford's irony. Fairford, who at the time of the marriage had sat silent, and pulled his moustache while every one else argued and objected, yet under whose silence Ralph had felt a deeper protest than under all the reasoning of the others. It was no comfort to reflect that Fairford would probably continue to say nothing. But necessity made light of these twinges, and Ralph set his teeth and cabled. Undine's chief surprise seemed to be that Laura's response, though immediate and generous, did not enable them to stay on at St. Moritz. But she apparently read in her husband's look the uselessness of such a hope, for with one of the sudden changes of mood that still disarmed him, she accepted the need of departure, and took leave philosophically of the Shallums and their band. After all, Paris was ahead, and in September one would have a chance to see the new models and surprise the secret councils of the dressmakers. Ralph was astonished at the tenacity with which she held to her purpose. He tried, when they reached Paris, to make her feel the necessity of starting at once for home. But she complained of fatigue, and of feeling vaguely unwell, and he had to yield to her desire for rest. The word, however, was to strike him as strangely misapplied, for from the day of their arrival she was in a state of perpetual activity. She seemed to have mastered her Paris by divination, and between the bounds of the boulevards and the Place Vendôme she moved at once with supernatural ease. "'Of course,' she explained to him, "'I understand how little we've got to spend, but I left New York without a rag, and it was you who made me countermand my trousseau, instead of having it sent after us. I wish now I hadn't listened to you. Father had had to pay for that before he lost his money. As it is, it'll be cheaper in the end for me to pick up a few things here. 
The advantage of going to the French dressmakers is that they'll wait twice as long for their money as the people at home. And they're all crazy to dress me. Bertha Shallum will tell you so. She says no one ever had such a chance. That's why I was willing to come to this stuffy little hotel. I wanted to save every scrap I could to get a few decent things. And over here they're accustomed to being bargained with. You ought to see how I've beaten them down. Have you any idea what a dinner dress costs in New York?" So it went on, obtusely and persistently, whenever he tried to sound the note of prudence. But on other themes she was more than usually responsive. Paris enchanted her, and they had delightful hours at the theatres, the little ones, amusing dinners at fashionable restaurants, and reckless evenings in haunts where she thrilled with simple glee at the thought of what she must so obviously be taken for. All these familiar diversions regained, for Ralph, a fresh zest in her company. Her innocence, her high spirits, her astonishing comments and credulities, renovated the old Parisian adventure and flung a veil of romance over its hackneyed scenes. Beheld through such a medium, the future looked less near and implacable, and Ralph, when he had received a reassuring letter from his sister, let his conscience sleep, and slipped forth on the high tide of pleasure. After all, in New York amusements would be fewer, and their life, for a time, perhaps more quiet. Moreover, Ralph's dim glimpses of Mr. Spragg's past suggested that the latter was likely to be on his feet again at any moment, and atoning by redoubled prodigalities for his temporary straits. And beyond all these possibilities there was the book to be written, the book on which Ralph was sure he should get a real hold as soon as they settled down in New York. Meanwhile the daily cost of living, and the bills that could not be deferred, were eating deep into Laura's subsidy. Ralph's anxieties returned, and his plight was brought home to him with a shock, when on going one day to engage passages, he learned that the prices were that of the rush season, and one of the conditions, immediate payment. At other times he was told the rules were easier, but in September and October no exception could be made. As he walked away with this fresh weight on his mind, he caught sight of the strolling figure of Peter Van Degen, Peter lounging and luxuriating among the seductions of the boulevard, with the disgusting ease of a man whose wants are all measured by money, and who always has enough to gratify them. His present sense of these advantages revealed itself in the affability of his greeting to Ralph, and in his off-hand request that the latter should look up Clare, who had come over with him to get her winter finery. She's motoring to Italy next week with some of her long-haired friends, but I'm off for the other side, going back on the sorceress. She's just been overhauled at Greenock, and we ought to have a good spin over. Better come along with me, old man." The sorceress was Van Degen's steam-yacht, most huge and complicated of her kind. It was his habit, after his semi-annual flights to Paris and London, to take a joyous company back on her, and let Clare return by steamer. The character of these parties made the invitation almost an offence to Ralph, but reflecting that it was probably a phrase distributed to every acquaintance when Van Degen was in a rosy mood, he merely answered, "'Much obliged, my dear fellow, but Undine and I are sailing immediately.' Peter's glassy eye grew livelier. "'Ah, to be sure, you're not over the honeymoon yet. How's the bride? Stunning as ever. My regards to her, please. I suppose she's too deep in dressmaking to be called on. Don't you forget to look up Clare." He hurried on in pursuit of a flitting petticoat, and Ralph continued his walk home. He prolonged it a little in order to put off telling Undine of his plight, for he could devise only one way of meeting the cost of the voyage, and that was to take it at once, and thus curtail their Parisian expenses. But he knew how unwelcome this plan would be, and he shrank the more from seeing Undine's face harden, since of late he had so basked in its brightness. When at last he entered the little salon she called Stuffy, he found her in conference with a blonde bearded gentleman who wore the red ribbon in his lapel, and who on Ralph's appearance, and at a sign as it appeared from Mrs. Marvell, swept into his note-case some small objects that had lain on the table, and bowed himself out with a Madame, Monsieur, worthy of the highest traditions. Ralph looked after him with amusement. Who's your friend? An ambassador or tailor? Undine was rapidly slipping on her rings, which, as he saw now, had also been scattered over the table. Oh, it was only that jeweller I told you about, 
the one Bertha Shallum goes to. A jeweller? Good heavens, my poor girl! You're buying jewels? The extravagance of the idea struck a laugh from him. Undine's face did not harden. It took on, instead, an almost deprecating look. Of course not! How silly you are! I only wanted a few old things reset. But I won't if you'd rather not. She came to him and sat down at his side, laying her hand on his arm. He took the hand up and looked at the deep gleam of the sapphires in the old family ring he had given her. "'You won't have that reset,' he said, smiling and twisting the ring about on her finger. Then he went on with his thankless explanation. "'It's not that I don't want you to do this or that. It's simply that for the moment we're rather strapped. I've just been to see the steamer people, and our passages will cost a good deal more than I thought.' He mentioned the sum, and the fact that he must give an answer the next day. Would she consent to sail that very Saturday? Or should they go a fortnight later, in a slow boat from Plymouth? Undine frowned on both alternatives. She was an indifferent sailor, and shrank from the possible nastiness of the cheaper boat. She wanted to get the voyage over as quickly and luxuriously as possible. Bertha Shallum had told her that in a deck suite no one need be seasick, but she wanted still more to have another week or two of Paris, and it was always hard to make her see why circumstances could not be bent to her wishes. "'This week? But how on earth can I be ready? Besides, we're dining at Engheim with the Shallums on Saturday, and motoring to Chantilly with the Jim Driscolls on Sunday. I can't imagine how you thought we could go this week.' But she still opposed the cheap steamer, and after they had carried the question on to Voisin's, and there unprofitably discussed it through a long luncheon, it seemed no near a solution. "'Well, think it over. Let me know this evening,' Ralph said, proportioning the waiter's fee to a bill unburdened by Undine's reckless choice of primos. His wife was to join the newly arrived Mrs. Shallum in a round of the Rue de la Paix, and he had seized the opportunity of slipping off to a classical performance at the Francais. On their arrival in Paris, he had taken Undine to one of these entertainments, but it left her too weary and puzzled for him to renew the attempt, and he had not found time to go back without her. He was glad now to shed his cares in such an atmosphere. The play was of the greatest, the interpretation that of the vanishing grand manner which lived in his first memories of the Parisian stage, and his surrender such influences as complete as in his early days. Caught up in the fiery chariot of art, he felt once more the tug of its coursers in his muscles, and the rush of their flight still throbbed in him when he walked back late to the hotel. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 He had expected to find Undine still out, but on the stairs he crossed Mrs. Shallum, who threw at him from under an immense hat-brim. "'Yes, she's in. But you'd better come and have tea with me at the Lux. I don't think husbands are wanted.' Ralph laughingly rejoined that that was just the moment for them to appear, and Mrs. Shallum swept on, crying back, "'All the same, I'll wait for you.' In the sitting-room Ralph found Undine seated behind a tea-table, on the other side of which, in an attitude of easy intimacy, Peter Van Degen stretched his lounging length. He did not move on Ralph's appearance, no doubt thinking their kinship close enough to make his nod and, hello, a sufficient greeting. Peter in intimacy was given to miscalculations of the sort, and Ralph's first movement was to glance at Undine and see how it affected her. But her eyes gave out the vivid rays that noise and banter always struck from them, her face at such moments was like a theatre, with all the lustres blazing. That the illumination should have been kindled by his cousin's husband was not precisely agreeable to Marvell, who thought Peter a bore in society and an insufferable nuisance on closer terms. But he was becoming blunted to Undine's lack of discrimination, and his own treatment of Van Degen was always tempered by his sympathy for Clare. He therefore listened, with apparent good humour, to Peter's suggestion of an evening at a petit théâtre with the Harvey Shallums, and joined in the laugh with which Undine declared, "'Oh, Ralph won't go. 
He only likes the theatres where they walk around in bath towels and talk poetry. Isn't that what you've just been seeing? she added, with a turn of the neck that shed her brightness on him. What? One of those five-barreled shows at the Francais? Great Scott, Ralph! No wonder your wife's pining for the folie bergère. She needn't, my dear fellow. We never interfere with each other's vices. Peter, unsolicited, was comfortably lighting a cigarette. Ah, there's the secret of domestic happiness. Marry somebody who likes all the things you don't, and make love to somebody who likes all the things you do. Undine laughed appreciatively. Only it dooms poor Ralph to such awful frumps. Can't you see the sort of woman who'd love his sort of play? No, oh, I can see her fast enough. My wife loves em said their visitor, rising with a grin, while Ralph threw out, "'So don't waste your pity on me.' And Undine's laugh had the slight note of asperity that the mention of Clare always elicited. "'Tomorrow night, then, at Payard's,' Van Degen concluded. "'And about the other business, that a go, too. I leave it to you to settle the date.' The nod and laugh they exchanged seemed to hint at depths of collusion from which Ralph was pointedly excluded, and he wondered how large a programme of pleasure they had already had time to sketch out. He disliked the idea of Undine's being too frequently seen with Van Degen, whose Parisian reputation was not fortified by the connections that propped it up in New York. But he did not want to interfere with her pleasure, and he was still wondering what to say, when, as the door closed, she turned to him gaily. I'm so glad you've come. I've got some news for you." She laid a light touch on his arm. Touch and tone were enough to disperse his anxieties, and he answered that he was in luck to find her already in when he had supposed her engaged, over a nouveau luxe tea-table, in repairing the afternoon's ravages. Oh, I didn't shop much. I didn't stay out long. She raised a kindling face to him. And what do you think I've been doing? while you were sitting in your stuffy old theatre, worrying about the money I was spending—oh, you needn't fib, I know you were—I was saving you hundreds and thousands. I've saved you the price of our passage." Ralph laughed in pure enjoyment of her beauty. When she shone on him like that, what did it matter what nonsense she talked? "'You wonderful woman! How did you do it? By countermanding a tiara? You know I'm not such a fool as you pretend." She held him at arm's length, with a nod of joyous mystery. "'You'll simply never guess. I've made Peter Van Degen ask us to go home on the Sorceress. What do you say to that?' She flashed it out on a laugh of triumph, without appearing to have a doubt of the effect the announcement would produce. Ralph stared at her. "'The Sorceress! You made him?' Well, I managed it. I worked him round to it. He's crazy about the idea now, but I don't think he'd thought of it before he came. I should say not, Ralph ejaculated. He would never have had the cheek to think of it. Well, I've made him anyhow. Did you ever know such luck? Such luck? He groaned at her obstinate innocence. Do you suppose I'll let you cross the ocean on the sorceress? She shrugged impatiently. You say that because your cousin doesn't go on her. If she doesn't, it's because it's no place for decent women. It's Claire's fault if it isn't. Everybody knows she's crazy about you, and she makes him feel it. That's why he takes up with other women." Her anger reddened her cheeks and dropped her brows like a black bar above her glowing eyes. Even in his recoil from what she said, Ralph felt the tempestuous heat of her beauty but for the first time his latent resentments rose in him, and he gave her back wrath for wrath. "'Is that the precious stuff he tells you?' "'Do you suppose I had to wait for him to tell me? Everybody knows it. Everybody in New York you knew she was wild when you married. That's why she's always been so nasty to me. If you won't go on the sorceress they'll all say it's because she was jealous of me and wouldn't let you.' Ralph's indignation had already flickered down to disgust. Undine was no longer beautiful. She seemed to have the face of her thoughts. He stood up with an impatient laugh. 
Is that another of his arguments? I don't wonder they're convincing. But as quickly as it had come, the sneer dropped, yielding to a wave of pity, the vague impulse to silence and protect her. How could he have given way to the provocation of her weakness, when his business was to defend her from it and lift her above it? He recalled his old dreams of saving her from Van Degenism. It was not thus that he had imagined the rescue. "'Don't let's pay Peter the compliment of squabbling over him,' he said, turning away to pour himself a cup of tea. When he had filled his cup he sat down beside Undine with a smile. "'No doubt he was joking, and thought you were. But if you really made him believe we might go with him, you'd better drop him a line.' Undine's brow still gloomed. "'You refuse, then?' "'Refuse? I don't need to. Do you want to succeed to half the chorus world of New York? They won't be on board with us, I suppose. The echoes of their conversation will. It's the only language Peter knows. He told me he longed for the influence of a good woman. She checked herself, reddening at Ralph's laugh. Well, tell him to apply again when he's been under it a month or two. Meanwhile, we'll stick to the liners. Ralph was beginning to learn that the only road to her reason lay through her vanity, and he fancied that if she could be made to see Van Degen as an object of ridicule, she might give up the idea of the sorceress of her own accord. But her will hardened slowly under his joking opposition, and she became no less formidable as she grew more calm. He was used to women who, in such cases, yielded as a matter of course to masculine judgments. If one pronounced a man not decent, the question was closed. But it was Undine's habit to ascribe all interference with her plans to personal motives, and he could see that she attributed his opposition to the furtive machinations of poor Clare. It was odious to him to prolong the discussion, for the accent of recrimination was the one he most dreaded on her lips. But the moment came when he had to take the brunt of it, averting his thoughts as best he might from the glimpse it gave of a world of mean familiarities, of reprisals drawn from the vulgarest of vocabularies. Certain retorts sped through the air like the flight of household utensils, certain charges rang out like accusations of tampering with the groceries. He stiffened himself against such comparisons, but they stuck in his imagination, and left him thankful when Undine's anger yielded to a burst of tears. He had held his own, and gained his point. The trip on the sorceress was given up, and a note of withdrawal dispatched to Van Degen. But at the same time Ralph cabled to his sister to ask if she could increase her loan. For he had conquered only at the cost of a concession. Undine was to stay in Paris till October, and they were to sail on a fast steamer in a deck suite, like the Harvey Shallums. Undine's ill-humour was soon dispelled by any new distraction, and she gave herself to the untroubled enjoyment of Paris. The Shallums were the centre of a like-minded group, and in the hours the ladies could spare from their dressmakers the restaurants shook with their hilarity, and the suburbs with the shriek of their motors. Van Degen, who had postponed his sailing, was a frequent sharer in these amusements, but Ralph counted on New York influences to detach him from Undine's train. He was learning to influence her through her social instincts, where he had once tried to appeal to other sensibilities. His worst moment came when he went to see Claire Van Degen, who, on the eve of departure, had begged him to come to her hotel. He found her less restless and rattling than usual, with a look in her eyes that reminded him of the days when she had haunted his thoughts. The visit passed off without vain returns to the past, but as he was leaving she surprised him by saying, "'Don't let Peter make a goose of your wife.' Ralph reddened, but laughed. "'Oh, Undine's wonderfully able to defend herself, even against such seductions as Peter's.' Mrs. Van Degen looked down with a smile at the bracelets on her thin brown wrist. "'His personal seductions, yes. But as an inventor of amusements he's inexhaustible, and Undine likes to be amused.' Ralph made no reply, but showed no annoyance. He simply took her hand and kissed it as he said good-bye, and she turned from him without audible farewell. As the day of departure approached, Undine's absorption in her dresses almost precluded the thought of amusement. Early and late she was closeted with fitters and packers. 
even the competent Celeste not being trusted to handle the treasures now pouring in, and Ralph cursed his weakness in not restraining her, and then fled for solace to museums and galleries. He could not rouse in her any scruple about incurring fresh debts, yet he knew she was no longer unaware of the value of money. She had learned to bargain, pare down prices, evade fees, browbeat the small tradespeople and wheedle concessions from the great, not, as Ralph perceived, from any effort to restrain her expenses, but only to prolong and intensify the pleasure of spending. Pained by the trait, he tried to laugh her out of it. He told her once that she had a miserly hand, showing her in proof that for all their softness the fingers would not bend back or the pink palm open. But she retorted a little sharply that it was no wonder, since she'd heard nothing talked of since their marriage but economy, and this left him without any answer. So the purveyors continued to mount to their apartment, and Ralph, in the course of his frequent nights from it, found himself always dodging the corners of black glazed boxes and swaying pyramids of pasteboard, always lifting his hat to sidling milliner's girls, or effacing himself before slender vendeuses floating by in a mist of apopanax. He felt incompetent to pronounce on the needs to which these visitors ministered, but the reappearance among them of the blond-bearded jeweller gave him ground for fresh fears. Undine had assured him that she had given up the idea of having her ornaments reset, and there had been ample time for their return. But on his questioning her, she explained that there had been delays, and bothers, and put him in the wrong by asking ironically if he supposed she was buying things for pleasure, when she knew as well as he that there wasn't any money to pay for them. But his thoughts were not all dark. Undine's moods still infected him, and when she was happy he felt an answering lightness. Even when her amusements were too primitive to be shared, he could enjoy their reflection in her face. Only as he looked back he was struck by the evanescence, the lack of substance, in their moments of sympathy, and by the permanent marks left by each breach between them. Yet he still fancied that some day the balance might be reversed, and that as she acquired a finer sense of values, the depths in her would find a voice. Something of this was in his mind, when, the afternoon before their departure, he came home to help her with their last arrangements. She had begged him for the day to leave her alone in their cramped salon, into which belated bundles were still pouring, and it was nearly dark when he returned. The evening before she had seemed pale and nervous, and at the last moment had excused herself from dining with the Shallums at a suburban restaurant. It was so unlike her to miss any opportunity of the kind that Ralph had felt a little anxious. But with the arrival of the packers she was afoot and in command again, and he withdrew submissively, as Mr. Spragg, in the early apex days, might have fled from the spring storm of house-cleaning. When he entered the sitting-room he found it still in disorder. Every chair was hidden under scattered dresses, tissue-paper surged from the yawning trunks, and prone among her heaped-up finery, Undine lay with closed eyes on the sofa. She raised her head as he entered, and then turned listlessly away. "'My poor girl, what's the matter? Haven't they finished yet?' Instead of answering she pressed her face into the cushion, and began to sob. The violence of her weeping shook her hair down on her shoulders, and her hands, clenching the arm of the sofa, pressed it away from her, as if any contact were insufferable. Ralph bent over her in alarm. "'Why, what's wrong, dear? What's happened?' Her fatigue of the previous evening came back to him, a puzzled, hunted look in her eyes, and with the memory a vague wonder revived. He had fancied himself fairly disencumbered of the stock formulas about the hallowing effects of motherhood, and there were many reasons for not welcoming the news he suspected she had to give, but the woman a man loves is always a special case, and everything was different that befell Undine. If this was what had befallen her, it was wonderful and divine. For the moment that was all he felt. "'Dear, tell me, what's the matter?' he pleaded. She sobbed on unheedingly, and he waited for her agitation to subside. He shrank from the phrases considered appropriate to the situation, but he wanted to hold her close and give her the depth of his heart in a long kiss. Suddenly she sat upright and turned a desperate face on him. "'Why on earth are you staring at me like that? 
anybody can see what's the matter he winced at her tone but managed to get one of her hands in his and they stayed thus in silence eye to eye are you as sorry as all that he began at length conscious of the flatness of his voice sorry sorry i'm i'm she snatched her hand away and went on weeping but undine dearest by and by you'll feel differently i know you will differently differently when in a year it takes a year a whole year out of life what do i care how i shall feel in a year the chill of her tone struck in this was more than a revolt of the nerves it was a settled a reasoned resentment ralph found himself groping for extenuations evasions anything to put a little warmth into her who knows perhaps after all it's a mistake there was no answering light in her face she turned her head from him wearily don't you think dear that you may be mistaken mistaken how on earth can i be mistaken even in that moment of confusion he was struck by the cold competence of her tone and wondered how she could be so sure you mean you've asked you've consulted the irony of it took him by the throat they were the very words he might have spoken in some miserable secret colloquy the words he was speaking to his wife she repeated dully I know I'm not mistaken. There was another long silence. Undine lay still, her eyes shut, drumming on the arm of the sofa with a restless hand. The other lay cold in Ralph's clasp, and through it there gradually stole to him the benumbing influence of the thoughts she was thinking, the sense of the approach of illness, anxiety, and expense, and of the general unnecessary disorganization of their lives that's all you feel then he asked at length a little bitterly as if to disguise from himself the hateful fact that he felt it too he stood up and moved away that's all he repeated why what else do you expect me to feel i feel horribly ill if that's what you want he saw the sobs trembling up through her again poor dear poor girl i'm so sorry so dreadfully sorry the senseless reiteration seemed to exasperate her. He knew it by the quiver that ran through her like the premonitory ripple on smooth water before the coming of the wind. She turned about on him and jumped to her feet. Sorry! You're sorry! You're sorry! By what earthly difference will it make to you? She drew back a few steps and lifted her slender arms from her sides. Look at me! see how i look how i'm going to look you won't hate yourself more and more every morning when you get up and see yourself in the glass your life's going on just as usual but what's mine going to be for months and months and just as i'd been to all this bother fagging myself to death about all these things her tragic gesture swept the disordered room just as I thought I was going home to enjoy myself, and look nice, and see people again, and have a little pleasure after all our worries. She dropped back on the sofa with another burst of tears. For all the good this rubbish will do me now. I loathe the very sight of it. She sobbed, with her face in her hands. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 It was one of the distinctions of Mr. Claude Walsingham Popple that his studio was never too much encumbered with the attributes of his art to permit the installing, in one of its cushioned corners, of an elaborately furnished tea-table, flanked by the most varied seductions in sandwiches and pastry. Mr. Popple, like all great men, had at first had his ups and downs, but his reputation had been permanently established by the verdict of a wealthy patron, who, returning from an excursion into other fields of portraiture, had given it as the final fruit of his experience that Popple was the only man who could do pearls. To sitters for whom this was of the first consequence, 
it was another of the artist's merits that he always subordinated art to elegance, in life as well as in his portraits. The messy element of production was no more visible in his expensively screened and tapestried studio than its results were perceptible in his painting, and it was often said in praise of his work that he was the only artist who kept his studio tidy enough for a lady to sit to him in a new dress. Mr. Popple, in fact, held that the personality of the artist should at all times be dissembled behind that of the man. It was his opinion that the essence of good breeding lay in tossing off a picture as easily as you lit a cigarette. Ralph Marvell had once said of him that when he began a portrait he always turned back his cuffs and said, "'Ladies and gentlemen, you can see there's absolutely nothing here.' And Mrs. Fairford supplemented the description by defining his painting as chafing-dish art. On a certain late afternoon of December, some four years after Mr. Popple's first meeting with Miss Undine Sprague of Apex, even the symbolic chafing-dish was nowhere visible in his studio, the only evidence of its recent activity being the full-length portrait of Mrs. Ralph Marvell, who, from her lofty easel and her heavily garlanded frame, faced the doorway with the air of having been invited to receive for Mr. Popple. The artist himself, becomingly clad in mouse-coloured velveteen, had just turned away from the picture to hover above the teacups, but his place had been taken by the considerably broader bulk of Mr. Peter Van Degen, who, tightly moulded into a coat of the latest cut, stood before the portrait in the attitude of a first arrival. "'Yes, it's good. It's damn good, Pop. You've hit the hair off rippingly. But the pearls ain't big enough,' he pronounced. A slight laugh sounded from the raised dais behind the easel. "'Of course they're not. But it's not his fault, poor man. He didn't give them to me.' As she spoke, Mrs. Ralph Marvell rose from a monumental gilt armchair of pseudo-Venetian design and swept her long draperies to Van Degen's side. "'He might, then, for the privilege of painting you,' the latter rejoined, transferring his bulging stare from the counterfeit to the original. His eyes rested on Mrs. Marvell's in what seemed a quick exchange of understanding. Then they passed on to a critical inspection of her person. She was dressed for the sitting in something faint and shining, above which the long curves of her neck looked dead white in the cold light of the studio, and her hair, all a shadowless rosy gold, was starred with a hard glitter of diamonds. "'The privilege of painting me? Mercy! I have to pay for being painted!' He'll tell you he's giving me the picture, but what do you suppose this cost? She laid a fingertip on her shimmering dress. Van Degen's eye rested on her with cold enjoyment. Does the price come higher than the dress? She ignored the allusion. Of course what they charge is for the cut. What they cut away? That's what they ought to charge for, ain't it, Pop? Undine took this with cool disdain but Mr. Popple's sensibilities were offended. "'My dear Peter, really, the artist, you understand, sees all this as a pure question of colour, of pattern, and it's a point of honour with the man to steel himself against the personal seduction.' Mr. Van Degen received this protest with a sound of almost vulgar derision, but Undine thrilled agreeably under the glance which her portrayer cast on her. She was flattered by Van Degen's notice, and thought his impertinence witty but she glowed inwardly at Mr. Popple's eloquence. After more than three years of social experience, she still thought he spoke beautifully, like the hero of a novel, and she ascribed to jealousy the lack of seriousness with which her husband's friends regarded him. His conversation struck her as intellectual, and his eagerness to have her share his thoughts was in flattering contrast to Ralph's growing tendency to keep his to himself. Popple's homage seemed the subtlest proof of what Ralph could have made of her if he had really understood her. It was but another step to ascribe all her past mistakes to the lack of such understanding, and the satisfaction derived from this thought had once impelled her to tell the artist that he alone knew how to rouse her higher self. He had assured her that the memory of her words would thereafter hallow his life, and as he hinted that it had been stained by the darkest errors, she was moved at the thought of the purifying influence she exerted. Thus it was that a man should talk to a true woman, but how few whom she had known possessed the secret! 
Ralph, in the first months of their marriage, had been eloquent too, had even gone the length of quoting poetry. But he disconcerted her by his baffling twists and strange allusions. She always scented ridicule in the unknown. And the poets he quoted were esoteric and abstruse. Mr. Popple's rhetoric was drawn from more familiar sources, and abounded in favourite phrases and in moving reminiscences of the fifth reader. He was, moreover, as literary as he was artistic, possessing an unequalled acquaintance with contemporary fiction, and dipping even into the lighter type of memoirs, in which the old acquaintances of history are served up in the disguise of a royal sorceress or a passion in a palace. The mastery with which Mr. Popple discussed the novel of the day, especially in relation to the sensibilities of its hero and heroine, gave Undine a sense of intellectual activity, which contrasted strikingly with Marvell's flippant estimate of such works. Passion, the artist implied, would have been the dominant note of his life, had it not been held in check by a sentiment of exalted chivalry, and by the sense that a nature of such emotional intensity as his must always be ridden on the curb. Van Degen was helping himself from the tray of iced cocktails which stood near the tea-table, and Popple, turning to Undine, took up the thread of his discourse. But why, he asked, why allude before others to feelings so few could understand? The average man, lucky devil, with a compassionate glance at Van Degen's back, the average man knew nothing of the fierce conflict between the lower and higher natures, and even the woman whose eyes had kindled it, how much did she guess of its violence? Did she know, Popple recklessly asked, how often the artist was forgotten in the man, how often the man would take the bit between his teeth, were it not that the look in her eyes recalled some sacred memory, some lesson learned perhaps beside his mother's knee? I say, Pop, was that where you learned to mix this drink? Because it does the old lady credit, Van Degen called out, smacking his lips, while the artist, dashing a nervous hand through his hair, muttered, Hang it, Peter! Is nothing sacred to you? It pleased Undine to feel herself capable of inspiring such emotions. She would have been fatigued by the necessity of maintaining her own talk on Popple's level, but she liked to listen to him, and especially to have others overhear what he said to her. Her feeling for Van Degen was different. There was more similarity of tastes between them, though his manner flattered her vanity less than Popple's. She felt the strength of Van Degen's contempt for everything he did not understand or could not buy. That was the only kind of exclusiveness that impressed her. And he was still to her, as in her inexperienced days, the master of the mundane science she had once imagined that Ralph Marvell possessed. During the three years since her marriage she had learned to make distinctions unknown to her girlish categories. She had found out that she had given herself to the exclusive and the dowdy, when the future belonged to the showy and the promiscuous, that she was in the case of those who have cast in their lot with a fallen cause, or, to use an analogy more within her range, who have hired an opera-box on the wrong night. It was all confusing and exasperating. Apex ideals had been based on the myth of old families ruling New York from a throne of revolutionary tradition, with the new millionaires paying them feudal allegiance but experience had long since proved the delusiveness of the simile. Mrs. Marvell's classification of the world into the visited and the unvisited was as obsolete as a medieval cosmogony. Some of those whom Washington Square left unvisited were the centre of social systems far outside its ken, and as indifferent to its opinions as the constellations to the reckonings of the astronomers, and all these systems joyously revolved about their central sun of gold. There were moments after Undine's return to New York when she was tempted to class her marriage with the hateful early mistakes from the memories of which she had hoped it would free her. Since it was never her habit to accuse herself of such mistakes, it was inevitable that she should gradually come to lay the blame on Ralph. She found a poignant pleasure, at this stage of her career, in the question, "'What does a young girl know of life?' and the poignancy was deepened by the fact that each of the friends to whom she put the question seemed convinced that, had the privilege been his, he would have known how to spare her the disenchantment it implied. The conviction of having blundered was never more present to her than when, on this particular afternoon, 
the guests invited by Mr. Popple to view her portrait, began to assemble before it. Some of the principal figures of Undine's group had rallied for the occasion, and almost all were in exasperating enjoyment of the privileges for which she pined. There was young Jim Driscoll, heir apparent of the house, with his short, stout, mistrustful wife, who hated society, but went everywhere lest it might be thought she had been left out. The beautiful Mrs. Beringer, a lovely, aimless being, who kept, as Laura Fairford said, a home for stray opinions, and could never quite tell them apart. Little Dicky Bowles, whom every one invited because he was understood to say things if one didn't. The Harvey Shallums, fresh from Paris, and dragging in their wake a bewildered nobleman vaguely designated as the Count, who offered cautious conversational openings, like an explorer trying beads on savages, and behind these more salient types the usual filling in of those who were seen everywhere because they have learned to catch the social eye. Such a company was one to flatter the artist as much as his sitter, so completely did it represent that unanimity of opinion which constitutes social strength. Not one in the number was troubled by any personal theory of art. All they asked of a portrait was that the costume should be sufficiently lifelike, and the face not too much so and a long experience in idealizing flesh and realizing dress fabrics had enabled Mr. Popple to meet both demands. "'Hang it!' Peter Van Degen pronounced, standing before the easel in an attitude of inspired interpretation. "'The great thing in a man's portrait is to catch the likeness. We all know that. But with a woman's it's different. A woman's picture has got to be pleasing. Who wants it about if it isn't?' Those big chaps who blow about what they call realism, how do their portraits look in a drawing-room? Do you suppose they ever ask themselves that? They don't care. They're not going to live with the things. And what do they know of drawing-rooms, anyhow? Lots of them haven't even got a dress-suit. That's where old Pop has the pull over em. He knows how we live, and what we want. This was received by the artist with a deprecating murmur, and by his public with warm expressions of approval. "'Happily, in this case,' Popple began, "'as in that of so many of my sitters,' he hastily put in, "'there has been no need to idealize. Nature herself has outdone the artist's dream.' Undine, radiantly challenging comparison with her portrait, glanced up at it with a smile of conscious merit, which deepened as young Jim Driscoll declared, "'By Jove, Mamie, you must be done exactly like that for the new music-room.' His wife turned a cautious eye upon the picture. "'How big is it? For our house it would have to be a good deal bigger,' she objected. And Popple, fired by the thought of such a dimensional opportunity, rejoined that it would be the chance of all others to work in a marble portico and a court train. He had just done Mrs. Lycurgus Ambler in a court train and feathers, and as that was for Buffalo, of course the pictures needn't clash. Well, it would have to be a good deal bigger than Mrs. Ambler's, Mrs. Driscoll insisted, and on Popple's suggestion that in that case he might work in Driscoll, in court dress also. You've been presented? Well, you will be. You'll have to if I do the picture, which will make a lovely memento. Van Degen turned aside to murmur to Undine, "'Pure bluff, you know. Jim couldn't pay for a photograph. Old Driscoll's high and dry since the Ararat investigation.' She threw him a puzzled glance, having no time in her crowded existence to follow the perturbations of Wall Street, save as they affected the hospitality of Fifth Avenue. "'You mean they've lost their money? Won't they give their fancy ball, then?' Van Degen shrugged. "'Nobody knows how it's coming out.' That queer chap Elmer Moffat threatens to give old Driscoll a fancy ball, says he's going to dress him in stripes. It seems he knows too much about the Apex Street Railways. Undine paled a little. Though she had already tried on her costume for the Driscoll ball, her disappointment at Van Degen's announcement was effaced by the mention of Moffat's name. She had not had the curiosity to follow the reports of the Ararat Trust investigation, but once or twice lately, in the snatches of smoking-room talk, she had been surprised by a vague allusion to Elmer Moffat, as to an erratic financial influence, half ridiculed, yet already half redoubtable. Was it possible that the redoubtable element had prevailed? That the time had come when Elmer Moffat, 
the Elmer Moffat of Apex, could, even for a moment, cause consternation in the Driscoll camp. He had always said he saw things big, but no one had ever believed he was destined to carry them out on the same scale. Yet apparently in those idle Apex days, while he seemed to be loafing and fooling, as her father called it, he had really been sharpening his weapons of aggression. There had been something, after all, in the effect of loose-drifting power she had always felt in him. Her heart beat faster, and she longed to question Van Degen, but she was afraid of betraying herself, and turned back to the group about the picture. Mrs. Driscoll was still presenting objections in a tone of small, mild obstinacy. "'Oh, it's a likeness, of course. I can see that. But there's one thing I must say, Mr. Popple. It looks like a last year's dress.' The attention of the ladies instantly rallied to the picture, and the artist paled at the challenge. "'It doesn't look like a last year's face, anyhow. That's what makes them all wild.' Van Degen murmured. Undine gave him back a quick smile. She had already forgotten about Moffat. Any triumph in which she shared left a glow in her veins, and the success of the picture obscured all other impressions. She saw herself throning in a central panel at the spring exhibition, with the crowd pushing about the picture, repeating her name, and she decided to stop on the way home and telephone her press agent to do a paragraph about Popple's tea. But in the hall, as she drew on her cloak, her thoughts reverted to the Driscoll fancy ball. What a blow if it were given up after she had taken so much trouble about her dress! She was to go as the Empress Josephine, after the Proudhon portrait in the Louvre. The dress was already fitted and partly embroidered, and she foresaw the difficulty of persuading the dressmaker to take it back. "'Why so pale and sad, fair cousin? What's up?' Van Degen asked as they emerged from the lift in which they had descended alone from the studio. "'I don't know. I'm tired of posing, and it was so frightfully hot.' "'Yes. Popple always keeps his place at low neck temperature, as if the portraits might catch cold.' Van Degen glanced at his watch. "'Where are you off to?' "'West End Avenue, of course, if I can find a cab to take me there.' It was not the least of Undine's grievances that she was still living in the house which represented Mr. Spragg's first real estate venture in New York. It had been understood at the time of her marriage that the young couple were to be established within the sacred precincts of fashion. But on their return from the honeymoon, the still untenanted house in West End Avenue had been placed at their disposal, and in view of Mr. Spragg's financial embarrassment, even Undine had seen the folly of refusing it. That first winter, moreover, she had not regretted her exile. While she awaited her boy's birth, she was glad to be out of sight of Fifth Avenue, and to take her hateful compulsory exercise where no familiar eye could fall on her. And the next year, of course, her father would give them a better house. But the next year rents had risen in the Fifth Avenue quarter, and meanwhile little Paul Marvell, from his beautiful pink cradle, was already interfering with his mother's plans. Ralph, alarmed by the fresh rush of expenses, sided with his father-in-law in urging Undine to resign herself to West End Avenue, and thus after three years she was still submitting to the incessant pin-pricks inflicted by the incongruity between her social and geographical situation, the need of having to give a West Side address to her tradesmen, and the deeper irritation of hearing her friend say, "'Do let me give you a lift home, dear. Oh, I'd forgotten. I'm afraid I haven't the time to go so far.' It was bad enough to have no motor of her own, to be avowedly dependent on lifts, openly and unconcealably in quest of them, and perpetually plotting to provoke their offer. She did so hate to be seen in a cab. But to miss them, as often as not, because of the remoteness of her destination, emphasized the hateful sense of being out of things. Van Degen looked out at the long, snow-piled streets, down which the lamps were beginning to put their dreary yellow splashes. Of course you won't get a cab on a night like this. If you don't mind the open car, you'd better jump in with me. I'll run you out to Highbridge and give you a breath of air before dinner." The offer was tempting, for Undine's triumph in the studio had left her tired and nervous. She was beginning to learn that success may be as fatiguing as failure. Moreover, she was going to a big dinner that evening, and the fresh air would give her the eyes and complexion she needed but in the back of her mind there lingered the vague sense of a forgotten engagement. 
as she tried to recall it she felt van degen raising the fur collar about her chin got anything you can put over your head will that lace thing do come along then he pushed her through the swinging doors and added with a laugh as they reached the street you're not afraid of being seen with me are you it's all right at this hour ralph still swinging on a strap in the elevated the winter twilight was deliriously cold and as they swept through central park and gathered impetus for their northward flight along the darkening boulevard undine felt the rush of physical joy that drowns scruples and silences memory her scruples indeed were not serious but ralph disliked her being too much with van degen and it was her way to get what she wanted with as little fuss as possible moreover she knew it was a mistake to make herself too accessible to a man of peter's sort her impatience to enjoy was curbed by an instinct for holding off and biding her time that resembled the patient skill with which her father had conducted the sale of his bad real estate in the pure water move days but now and then youth had its way she could not always resist the present pleasure and it was amusing too to be talked about with peter van degen who was noted for not caring for nice women she enjoyed the thought of triumphing over meretricious charms it ennobled her in her own eyes to influence such a man for good nevertheless as the motor flew on through the icy twilight her present cares flew with it she could not shake off the thought of the useless fancy dress which symbolized the other crowding expenses she had not dared confess to ralph van degen heard her sigh and bent down lowering the speed of the motor what's the matter isn't everything all right his tone made her suddenly feel that she could confide in him and though she began by murmuring that it was nothing she did so with the conscious purpose of being persuaded to confess and his extraordinary niceness seemed to justify her and to prove that she had been right in trusting her instinct rather than in following the counsels of prudence heretofore in their talks she had never gone beyond the vaguest hint of material bothers as to which dissimulation seemed vain while one lived in west end avenue but now that the avowal of a definite worry had been wrung from her she felt the injustice of the view generally taken of poor peter for he had been neither too enterprising nor too cautious though people said of him that he didn't care to part he had just laughed away in bluff brotherly fashion the gnawing thought of the fancy dress had assured her he'd give a ball himself rather than miss seeing her wear it and had added oh hang waiting for the bill won't a couple of thou make it all right in a tone that showed what a small matter money was to any one who took the larger view of life the whole incident passed off so quickly and easily that within a few minutes she had settled down with a nod for his everything jolly again now to untroubled enjoyment of the hour peace of mind she said to herself was all she needed to make her happy and that was just what ralph had never given her at the thought his face seemed to rise before her with the sharp lines of care between the eyes it was almost like a part of his nagging that he should thrust himself in at such a moment she tried to shut her eyes to the face but a moment later it was replaced by another a small odd likeness of itself and with a cry of compunction she started up from her furs mercy it's the boy's birthday i was to take him to his grandmother's she was to have a cake for him and ralph was to come up town i knew there was something i'd forgotten end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen in the dagonet drawing-room the lamps had long been lit and mrs fairford after a last impatient turn had put aside the curtains of worn damask to strain her eyes into the darkening square she came back to the hearth where charles bowen stood leaning between the prim caryatides of the white marble chimney-piece no sign of her she's simply forgotten bowen looked at his watch and turned to compare it with the high-waisted empire clock six o'clock why not telephone again there must be some mistake perhaps she knew ralph would be late laura laughed i haven't noticed that she follows ralph's movements so closely when i telephoned just now the servant said she'd been out since two the nurse waited till half-past four not liking to come without orders and now it's too late for paul to come 
she wandered away toward the farther end of the room, where, through half-open doors, a shining surface of mahogany reflected a flower-wreathed cake in which two candles dwindled. "'Put them out, please,' she said to someone in the background. Then she shut the doors, and turned back to Bowen. "'It's all so unlucky. My grandfather giving up his drive, and mother backing out of her hospital meeting, and having all the committee down on her. And Henley! I'd even coaxed Henley away from his bridge. He escaped again just before you came. Undine promised she'd have the boy here at four. It's not as if it hasn't happened before. She's always breaking her engagements. She has so many that it's inevitable some should get broken. Oh, if she'd only choose! Now that Ralph has had to go into business and is kept in his office so late, it's cruel of her to drag him out every night. He told us the other day they hadn't dined at home for a month. Undine doesn't seem to notice how hard he works. Bowen gazed meditatively at the crumbling fire. No. Why should she? Why should she? Really, Charles? Why should she, when she knows nothing about it? She may know nothing about his business, but she must know it's her extravagance that forced him into it. Mrs. Fairford looked at Bowen reproachfully. You talk as if you were on her side. Are there sides already? If so, I want to look down on them impartially from the heights of pure speculation. I want to get a general view of the whole problem of American marriages. Mrs. Fairford dropped into her armchair with a sigh. If that's what you want, you must make haste. Most of them don't last long enough to be classified. I grant you it takes an active mind. But the weak point is so frequently the same that after a time one knows where to look for it. What do you call the weak point? He paused. The fact that the average American looks down on his wife. Mrs. Fairford was up with a spring. If that's where paradox lands you. Bowen mildly stood his ground. Well, doesn't he prove it? How much does he let her share in the real business of life? How much does he rely on her judgment and help in the conduct of serious affairs? Take Ralph, for instance. You say his wife's extravagance forces him to work too hard. But that's not what's wrong. It's normal for a man to work hard for a woman. What's abnormal is his not caring to tell her anything about it. To tell Undine? She'd be bored to death if he did. Just so. She'd even feel aggrieved. But why? Because it's against the custom of the country. And whose fault is that? The man's again. I don't mean Ralph. I mean the genus he belongs to. Homo sapiens Americanus. Why haven't we taught our women to take an interest in our work? Simply because we don't take enough interest in them. Mrs. Fairford, sinking back into her chair, sat gazing at the vertiginous depths above which his thought seemed to dangle her. You don't? The American man doesn't? The most slaving, self-effacing, self-sacrificing? Yes, and the most indifferent. There's the point. The slaving's no argument against the indifference. To slave for women is part of the old American tradition. Lots of people give their lives for dogmas they've ceased to believe in. Then again, in this country the passion for making money has preceded the knowing how to spend it, and the American man lavishes his fortune on his wife because he doesn't know what else to do with it. Then you call it a mere want of imagination for a man to spend his money on his wife? Not necessarily. But it's a want of imagination to fancy it's all he owes her. Look about you, and you'll see what I mean. Why does the European woman interest herself so much more in what the men are doing? Because she's so important to them that they make it worth her while. She's not a parenthesis as she is here. She's in the very middle of the picture. I'm not implying that Ralph isn't interested in his wife. He's a passionate, a pathetic exception. But even he has to conform to an environment where all the romantic values are reversed. Where does the real life of most American men lie? In some woman's drawing room or in their offices? The answer's obvious, isn't it? The emotional center of gravity is not the same in the two hemispheres. 
In the effete societies it's love. In our new one it's business. In America the real crime passionnelle is a big steal. There's more excitement in wrecking railways than homes. Bowen paused to light another cigarette, and then took up his theme. Isn't that the key to our easy divorces? If we cared for women in the old barbarous possessive way, do you suppose we'd give them up as readily as we do? The real paradox is the fact that the men who make, materially, the biggest sacrifices for their women should do least for them ideally and romantically. And what's the result? How do the women avenge themselves? All my sympathies with them, poor deluded dears, when I see their fallacious little attempts to trick out the leavings tossed them by the preoccupied male, the money and the motors and the clothes, and pretend to themselves and each other that that's what really constitutes life. Oh, I know what you're going to say. It's less and less of a pretense with them, I grant you. They're more and more succumbing to the force of the suggestion. But here and there I fancy there's one who still sees through the humbug, and knows that money and motors and clothes are simply the big bribe she's paid for keeping out of some man's way. Mrs. Fairford presented an amazed silence to the rush of this tirade, but when she rallied it was to murmur, And is Undine one of the exceptions? Her companion took the shot with a smile. No. She's a monstrously perfect result of the system, the completest proof of its triumph. It's Ralph who's the victim, and the exception. Oh, poor Ralph! Mrs. Fairford raised her head quickly. I hear him now. I suppose, she added in an undertone, we can't give him your explanation for his wife's having forgotten to come. Bowen echoed her sigh and then seemed to toss it from him with his cigarette end. But he stood in silence while the door opened, and Ralph Marvell entered. "'Well, Laura! Hello, Charles! Have you been celebrating, too?' Ralph turned to his sister. "'It's outrageous of me to be so late, and I daren't look my son in the face. But I stayed downtown to make provision for his future birthdays.' He returned Mrs. Fairford's kiss. Don't tell me the party's over and the guest of honour gone to bed. As he stood before them, laughing and a little flushed, the strain of long fatigue sounding through his gaiety and looking out of his anxious eyes, Mrs. Fairford threw a glance at Bowen, and then turned away to ring the bell. Sit down, Ralph. You look tired. I'll give you some tea. He dropped into an armchair. I did have rather a rush to get here, but— Hadn't I better join the revellers? Where are they?" He walked to the end of the room and threw open the dining-room doors. "'Hello! Where have they all got to? What a jolly cake!' He went up to it. "'Why, it's never even been cut!' Mrs. Fairford called after him. "'Come and have your tea first. "'No, no, tea afterward, thanks. Are they all upstairs with my grandfather? I must make my peace with Undine.' His sister put her arm through his, and drew him back to the fire. Undine didn't come. Didn't come? Who brought the boy, then? He didn't come, either. That's why the cake's not cut. Ralph frowned. What's the mystery? Is he ill, or what's happened? Nothing's happened. Paul's all right. Apparently Undine forgot. She never went home for him, and the nurse waited till it was too late to come. She saw his eyes darken, but he merely gave a slight laugh and drew out his cigarette case. Poor little Paul! Poor chap! He moved toward the fire. Yes, please, some tea. He dropped back in his chair with a look of weariness, as if some strong stimulant had suddenly ceased to take effect on him, but before the tea-table was brought back he had glanced at his watch and was on his feet again. But this won't do. I must rush home and see the poor chap before dinner. And my mother? And my grandfather? I want to say a word to them. I must make Paul's excuses. Grandfather's taking his nap, and mother had to rush out for a postponed committee meeting. She left as soon as we heard Paul wasn't coming. Ah, I see. He sat down again. Yes, make the tea strong, please. I've had a beastly fagging sort of day. He leaned back with half-closed eyes 
his untouched cup in his hand. Bowen took leave, and Laura sat silent, watching her brother under lowered lids while she feigned to be busy with the kettle. Ralph presently emptied his cup and put it aside. Then, sinking into his former attitude, he clasped his hands behind his head, and lay staring apathetically into the fire. But suddenly he came to life and started up. A motor-horn had sounded outside, and there was a noise of wheels at the door. "'There's Undine. I wonder what could have kept her.' He jumped up and walked to the door, but it was Claire Van Degen who came in. At sight of him she gave a little murmur of pleasure. "'What luck to find you! No, not luck. I came because I knew you'd be here. He never comes near me, Laura. I have to hunt him down to get a glimpse of him.' Slender and shadowy in her long furs, she bent to kiss Mrs. Fairford, and then turned back to Ralph. "'Yes, I knew I'd catch you here. I knew it was the boy's birthday, and I brought him a present—a vulgar, expensive Van Degen offering. I'm not enough imagination left to find the right thing—the thing it takes feeling and not money to buy. When I look for a present nowadays I never say to the shopman, I want this or that. I simply say, give me something that costs so much." She drew a parcel from her muff. "'Where's the victim of my vulgarity? Let me crush him under the weight of my gold.' Mrs. Fairford sighed out, "'Clare, Clare!' and Ralph smiled at his cousin. "'I'm sorry, but you'll have to depute me to present it. The birthday's over. You're too late.' She looked surprised. "'Why, I've just left Mamie Driscoll, and she told me Undine was still at Popple's studio a few minutes ago. Popple's giving a tea to show the picture.' "'Popple's giving a tea?' Ralph struck an attitude of mock consternation. "'Ah! In that case! In Popple's society who wouldn't forget the flight of time!' He had recovered his usual easy tone, and Laura saw that Mrs. Van Degen's words had dispelled his preoccupation. He turned to his cousin. "'Will you trust me with your present to the boy?' Clare gave him the parcel. "'I'm sorry not to give it myself. I said what I did because I knew what you and Laura were thinking but it's really a battered old Dagonet bowl that came down to me from our revered great-grandmother." "'What? The heirloom you used to eat your porridge out of?' Ralph detained her hand to put a kiss on it. "'That's dear of you.' She threw him one of her strange glances. "'Why not say, that's like you? But you don't remember what I'm like.' She turned away to glance at the clock. "'It's late and I must be off. I'm going to a big dinner at the Chauncey Ellings's. But you must be going there too, Ralph. You'd better let me drive you home." In the motor Ralph leaned back in silence, while the rug was drawn over their knees, and Clare restlessly fingered the row of gold-topped objects in the rack at her elbow. It was restful to be swept through the crowded streets in this smooth fashion, and Clare's presence at his side gave him a vague sense of ease. For a long time now feminine nearness had come to mean to him, not this relief from tension, but the ever-renewed dread of small daily deceptions, evasions, subterfuges. The change had come gradually, marked by one disillusionment after another. But there had been one moment that formed the point beyond which there was no returning. It was the moment, a month or two before his boy's birth, when glancing over a batch of belated Paris bills, he had come on one from the jeweller he had once found in private conference with Undine. The bill was not large, but two of its items stood out sharply. Resetting pearl and diamond pendant, resetting sapphire and diamond ring. The pearl and diamond pendant was his mother's wedding present. The ring was the one he had given Undine on their engagement. That they were both family relics, kept unchanged through several generations, scarcely mattered to him at the time he felt only the stab of his wife's deception. She had assured him in Paris that she had not had her jewels reset. He had noticed soon after their return to New York that she had left off her engagement ring, but the others were soon discarded also, and in answer to his question she had told him that, in her ailing state, rings worried her. Now he saw she had deceived him, and forgetting everything else, he went to her, bill in hand. Her tears and distress filled him with immediate contrition. 
Was this a time to torment her about trifles? His anger seemed to cause her actual physical fear, and at the sight he abased himself in entreaties for forgiveness. When the scene ended, she had pardoned him, and the reset ring was on her finger. Soon afterward the birth of the boy seemed to wipe out these humiliating memories, yet Marvell found in time that they were not effaced, but only momentarily crowded out of sight. In reality the incident had a meaning out of proportion to its apparent seriousness, for it put in his hand a clue to a new side of his wife's character. He no longer minded her having lied about the jeweller. What pained him was that she had been unconscious of the wound she inflicted in destroying the identity of the jewels. He saw that, even after their explanation, she still supposed he was angry only because she had deceived him and the discovery that she was completely unconscious of states of feeling on which so much of his inner life depended, marked a new stage in their relation. He was not thinking of all this as he sat beside Claire Van Degen, but it was part of the chronic disquietude which made him more alive to his cousin's sympathy, her shy, unspoken understanding. After all, he and she were of the same blood, and had the same traditions. She was light and frivolous, without strength of will or depth of purpose. But she had the frankness of her foibles, and she would never have lied to him, or traded on his tenderness. Clare's nervousness gradually subsided, and she lapsed into a low-voiced mood which seemed like an answer to his secret thought. But she did not sound the personal note, and they chatted quietly of commonplace things, of the dinner-dance at which they were presently to meet, of the costume she had chosen for the Driscoll fancy ball, the recurring rumours of old Driscoll's financial embarrassment, and the mysterious personality of Elmer Moffat, on whose movements Wall Street was beginning to fix a fascinated eye. When Ralph, the year after marriage, had renounced his profession to go into partnership with a firm of real estate agents, he had come in contact for the first time with the drama of business, and whenever he could turn his attention from his own tasks, he found a certain interest in watching the fierce interplay of its forces. In the downtown world he had heard things of Moffat that seemed to single him out from the common herd of money-makers. Anecdotes of his coolness, his lazy good temper, the humorous detachment he preserved in the heat of conflicting interests, and his figure was enlarged by the mystery that hung about it, the fact that no one seemed to know whence he came, or how he had acquired the information, which, for the moment, was making him so formidable. I should like to see him," Ralph said. He must be a good specimen of the one of the few picturesque types we've got. Yes, it might be amusing to fish him out. But the most picturesque types in Wall Street are generally the tamest in a drawing-room," Clare considered. But doesn't Undine know him? I seem to remember seeing them together. Undine and Moffat? Then you know him. You've met him. Not actually met him, but he's been pointed out to me. It must have been some years ago. Yes, it was one night at the theatre, just after you announced your engagement." He fancied her voice trembled slightly, as though she thought he might notice her odd way of dating her memories. "'You came into our box,' she went on, "'and I asked you the name of the red-faced man who was sitting in the stall next to Undine. You didn't know, but someone told us it was Moffat. Marvell was more struck by her tone than by what she was saying. "'If Undine knows him, it's odd she's never mentioned it,' he answered indifferently. The motor stopped at his door, and Clare, as she held out her hand, turned a first full look on him. "'Why do you never come to see me? I miss you more than ever,' she said. He pressed her hand without answering, but after the motor had rolled away, he stood for a while on the pavement looking after it. When he entered the house the hall was still dark, and the small over-furnished drawing-room empty. The parlour-maid told him that Mrs. Marvell had not yet come in, and he went upstairs to the nursery. But on the threshold the nurse met him with the whispered request not to make a noise, as it had been hard to quiet the boy after the afternoon's disappointment, and she had just succeeded in putting him to sleep. Ralph went down to his own room and threw himself in the old college armchair, in which, for years previously, he had sat the night out, dreaming of Undine. He had no study of his own, and he had crowded into his narrow bedroom his prints and bookshelves, and the other relics of his youth. As he sat among them now, 
the memory of that other night swept over him, the night when he had heard the call. Fool as he had been not to recognize its meaning then, he knew himself triply mocked in being even now at its mercy. The flame of love that had played about his passion for his wife had died down to its embers. All the transfiguring hopes and illusions were gone, but they had left an unquenchable ache for her nearness, her smile, her touch. His life had come to be nothing but a long effort to win these mercies by one concession after another, the sacrifice of his literary projects, the exchange of his profession for an uncongenial business, and the incessant struggle to make enough money to satisfy her increasing exactions. That was where the call had led him. The clock struck eight, but it was useless to begin to dress until Undine came in, and he stretched himself out in his chair, reached for a pipe, and took up the evening paper. His passing annoyance had died out. He was usually too tired after his day's work for such feelings to keep their edge long. But he was curious, disinterestedly curious, to know what pretext Undine would invent for being so late, and what excuse she would have found for forgetting the little boy's birthday. He read on till half-past eight. Then he stood up and sauntered to the window. The avenue below it was deserted. Not a carriage or motor turned the corner around which he expected Undine to appear, and he looked idly in the opposite direction. There, too, the perspective was nearly empty, so empty that he singled out, a dozen blocks away, the blazing lamps of a large touring-car that was bearing furiously down the avenue from Morningside. As it drew nearer, its speed slackened and he saw it hug the curb and stop at his door. By the light of the street-lamp he recognized his wife as she sprang out, and detected a familiar silhouette in her companion's fur-coated figure. Then the motor flew on, and Undine ran up the steps. Ralph went out on the landing. He saw her coming up quickly, as if to reach her room unperceived. But when she caught sight of him she stopped, her head thrown back and the light falling on her blown hair and glowing face. Well she said, smiling up at him. "'They waited for you all the afternoon in Washington Square. The boy never had his birthday,' he answered. Her color deepened, but she instantly rejoined, "'Why, what happened? Why didn't the nurse take him?' "'You said you were coming to fetch him, so she waited.' "'But I telephoned.' He said to himself, "'Is that the lie?' and answered, "'Where from?' Why, the studio, of course. She flung her cloak open, as if to attest her veracity. The sitting lasted longer than usual. There was something about the dress he couldn't get. But I thought he was giving a tea. He had tea afterward. He always does. And he asked some people in to see my portrait. That detained me, too. I didn't know they were coming, and when they turned up I couldn't rush away. It would have looked as if I didn't like the picture." She paused, and they gave each other a searching, simultaneous glance. "'Who told you it was a tea?' she asked. "'Claire Van Degen. I saw her at my mother's.' "'So you weren't unconsoled, after all.' "'The nurse didn't get any message. My people were awfully disappointed, and the poor boy has cried his eyes out.' "'Dear me! What a fuss! But I might have known my message wouldn't be delivered. Everything always happens to put me in the wrong with your family. With a little air of injured pride, she started to go to her room, but he put out a hand to detain her. You've just come from the studio? Yes. Is it awfully late? I must go and dress. We're dining with the Ellings, you know. I know. How did you come? In a cab? She faced him limpidly. No, I couldn't find one that would bring me. So Peter gave me a lift, like an angel. I'm blown to bits. He had his open car. Her color was still high, and Ralph noticed that her lower lip twitched a little. He had led her to the point they had reached solely to be able to say, If you're straight from the studio, how was it that I saw you coming down from Morningside? Unless he asked her that, there would be no point in his cross-questioning, and he would have sacrificed his pride without a purpose. But suddenly, as they stood there face to face, almost touching, she became something immeasurably alien and far off, and the question died on his lips. "'Is that all?' she asked with a slight smile. 
Yes. You'd better go and dress, he said, and turned back to his room. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 The turnings of life seldom show a signpost. Or rather, though the sign is always there, it is usually placed some distance back, like the notices that give warning of a bad hill or a level railway crossing. Ralph Marvell, pondering upon this, reflected that for him the sign had been set more than three years earlier, in an Italian ilex grove. That day his life had brimmed over. So he had put it at the time. He saw now that it had brimmed over indeed, brimmed to the extent of leaving the cup empty, or at least of uncovering the dregs beneath the nectar. He knew now that he should never hereafter look at his wife's hand without remembering something he had read in it that day. Its surface language had been sweet enough, but under the rosy lines he had seen the warning letters. Since then he had been walking with a ghost, the miserable ghost of his illusion. Only he had somehow vivified, coloured, substantiated it, by the force of his own great need, as a man might breathe the semblance of life into a dear drowned body that he cannot give up for dead. All this came to him with aching distinctness, the morning after his talk with his wife on the stairs. He had accused himself, in midnight retrospect, of having failed to press home his conclusion, because he dared not face the truth. But he knew this was not the case. It was not the truth he feared, it was another lie. If he had foreseen a chance of her saying, Yes, I was with Peter Van Degen, and for the reason you think. He would have put it to the touch, stood up to the blow like a man, but he knew she would never say that. She would go on eluding and doubling, watching him as he watched her, and at that game she was sure to beat him in the end. On their way home from the Elling dinner this certainty had become so insufferable that it nearly escaped him in the cry, "'You needn't watch me. I shall never again watch you.' But he had held his peace, knowing she would not understand. How little, indeed, she ever understood, had been made clear to him, when the same night he had followed her upstairs through the sleeping house. She had gone on ahead while he stayed below to lock doors and put out lights, and he had supposed her to be already in her room when he reached the upper landing. But she stood there waiting, in the spot where he had waited for her a few hours earlier. She had shown her vividest at dinner with the revolving brilliancy that collective approval always struck from her, and the glow of it still hung on her as she paused there in the dimness, her shining cloak dropped from her white shoulders. "'Ralphie,' she began, a soft hand on his arm. He stopped, and she pulled him about so that their faces were close, and he saw her lips curving for a kiss. Every line of her face sought him from the sweep of the narrowed eyelids to the dimples that played away from her smile. His eye received the picture with distinctness. But for the first time it did not pass into his veins. It was as if he had been struck with a subtle blindness that permitted images to give their colour to the eye, but communicated nothing to the brain. "'Good night,' he said, as he passed on. When a man felt in that way about a woman, he was surely in a position to deal with his case impartially. This came to Ralph as the joyless solace of the morning. At least the bandage was off and he could see. And what did he see? Only the uselessness of driving his wife to subterfuges that were no longer necessary. Was Van Degen her lover? Probably not. The suspicion died as it rose. She would not take more risks than she could help, and it was admiration not love, that she wanted. She wanted to enjoy herself, and her conception of enjoyment was publicity, promiscuity, the band, the banners, the crowd, the close contact of covetous impulses, and the sense of walking among them in cool security. Any personal entanglement might mean bother, and bother was the thing she most abhorred. Probably, as the queer formula went, his honour was safe, he could count on the letter of her fidelity. 
At the moment the conviction meant no more to him than if he had been assured of the honesty of the first stranger he met in the street. A stranger. That was what she had always been to him. So malleable outwardly, she had remained insensible to the touch of the heart. These thoughts accompanied him on his way to business the next morning. Then, as the routine took him back, the feeling of strangeness diminished. There he was again at his daily task. Nothing tangible was altered. He was there for the same purpose as yesterday, to make money for his wife and child. The woman he had turned from on the stairs a few hours earlier was still his wife and the mother of Paul Marvell. She was an inherent part of his life. The inner disruption had not resulted in any outward upheaval. And with the sense of inevitableness there came a sudden wave of pity. Poor Undine! She was what the gods had made her, a creature of skin-deep reactions, a mote in the beam of pleasure. He had no desire to preach down such heart as she had. He felt only a stronger wish to reach it, teach it, move it to something of the pity that filled his own. They were fellow victims in the noyade of marriage, but if they ceased to struggle, perhaps the drowning would be easier for both. Meanwhile the first of the month was at hand, with its usual batch of bills, and there was no time to think of any struggle less pressing than that connected with paying them. Undine had been surprised, and a little disconcerted, at her husband's acceptance of the birthday incident. Since the resetting of her bridal ornaments, the relations between Washington Square and West End Avenue had been more and more strained, and the silent disapproval of the Marvell ladies was more irritating to her than open recrimination. She knew how keenly Ralph must feel her last slight to his family, and she had been frightened when she guessed that he had seen her returning with Van Degen. He must have been watching from the window, since, credulous as he always was, he evidently had a reason for not believing her when she told him she had come from the studio. There was, therefore, something both puzzling and disturbing in his silence, and she made up her mind that it must be either explained or cajoled away. These thoughts were with her as she dressed, but at the Ellings they fled like ghosts before light and laughter. She had never been more open to the suggestions of immediate enjoyment. At last she had reached the envied situation of the pretty woman with whom society must reckon, and if she had only had the means to live up to her opportunities, she would have been perfectly content with life, with herself, and her husband. She still thought Ralph sweet when she was not bored by his good advice or exasperated by his inability to pay her bills. The question of money was what chiefly stood between them, and now that this was momentarily disposed of by Van Degen's offer, she looked at Ralph more kindly. She even felt a return of her first impersonal affection for him. Everybody could see that Claire Van Degen was gone on him, and Undine always liked to know that what belonged to her was coveted by others. Her reassurance had been fortified by the news she had heard at the Elling dinner, the published fact of Harmon B. Driscoll's unexpected victory. The Ararat investigation had been mysteriously stopped, quashed, in the language of the law, and Elmer Moffat turned down, as Van Degen, who sat next to her, expressed it. "'I don't believe we'll ever hear of that gentleman again,' he said contemptuously, and their eyes crossed gaily as she exclaimed, "'Then they'll give the fancy ball after all.' "'I should have given you one anyhow. Shouldn't you have liked that as well?' "'Oh, you can give me one, too,' she returned, and he bent closer to say, "'By Jove, I will, and anything else you want.' But on the way home her fears revived. Ralph's indifference struck her as unnatural. He had not returned to the subject of Paul's disappointment, had not even asked her to write a word of excuse to his mother. Van Degen's way of looking at her at dinner—he was incapable of graduating his glances—had made it plain that the favour she had accepted would necessitate her being more conspicuously in his company, though she was still resolved that it should be on just such terms as she chose and it would be extremely troublesome if, at this juncture, Ralph should suddenly turn suspicious and secretive. Undine hitherto had found more benefits than drawbacks in her marriage, but now the tie began to gall. It was hard to be criticised for every grasp at opportunity by a man so avowedly unable to do the reaching for her. Ralph had gone into business to make more money for her, 
but it was plain that the more would never be much, and that he would not achieve the quick rise to affluence which was man's natural tribute to woman's merits. Undine felt herself trapped, deceived, and it was intolerable that the agent of her disillusionment should presume to be the critic of her conduct. Her annoyance, however, died out with her fears. Ralph, the morning after the Elling dinner, went his way as usual, and after nerving herself for the explosion which did not come, she set down his indifference to the dulling effect of business. No wonder poor women whose husbands were always downtown had to look elsewhere for sympathy. Van Degen's check helped to calm her, and the weeks whirled on toward the Driscoll Ball. The ball was as brilliant as she had hoped, and her own part in it as thrilling as a page from one of the society novels with which she had cheated the monotony of Apex days. She had no time for reading now. Every hour was packed with what she would have called life, and the intensity of her sensations culminated on that triumphant evening. What could be more delightful than to feel that, while all the women envied her dress, the men did not so much as look at it? Their admiration was all for herself, and her beauty deepened under it as flowers take a warmer colour in the rays of sunset. Only Van Degen's glance weighed on her a little too heavily. Was it possible that he might become a bother less negligible than those he had relieved her of? Undine was not greatly alarmed. She still had full faith in her powers of self-defence, but she disliked to feel the least crease in the smooth surface of existence. She had always been what her parents called sensitive. As the winter passed, material cares once more assailed her. In the thrill of liberation produced by Van Degen's gift, she had been imprudent, had launched into fresh expenses. Not that she accused herself of extravagance. She had done nothing not really necessary. The drawing-room, for instance, cried out to be done over, and Popple, who was an authority on decoration, had shown her with a few strokes of his pencil how easily it might be transformed into a French period-room, all curves and cupids, just the setting for a pretty woman and his portrait of her. But Undine, still hopeful of leaving West End Avenue, had heroically resisted the suggestion, and contented herself with the renewal of the curtains and carpet, and the purchase of some fragile gilt chairs, which, as she told Ralph, would be so much to the good when they moved. The explanation, as she made it, seemed an additional evidence of her thrift. Partly as a result of these exertions, she had a nervous breakdown toward the middle of the winter, and her physician having ordered a massage and a daily drive, it became necessary to secure Mrs. Heeney's attendance and to engage a motor by the month. Other unforeseen expenses, the bills that at such times seemed to run up without visible impulsion, were added to by a severe illness of little Paul's, a long, costly illness, with three nurses and frequent consultations. During these days Ralph's anxiety drove him to what seemed to Undine foolish excesses of expenditure, and when the boy began to get better, the doctors advised country air. Ralph at once hired a small house at Tuxedo, and Undine, of course, accompanied her son to the country. But she spent only the Sundays with him, running up to town during the week to be with her husband, as she explained. This necessitated the keeping up of two households, and even for so short a time the strain on Ralph's purse was severe. So it came about that the bill for the fancy dress was still unpaid, and Undine left to wonder distractedly what had become of Van Degen's money. That Van Degen seemed also to wonder was becoming unpleasantly apparent. His check had evidently not brought in the return he expected, and he put his grievance to her frankly one day, when he motored down to lunch at Tuxedo. They were sitting after luncheon in the low-ceilinged drawing-room to which Undine had adapted her usual background of cushions, bric-a-brac, and flowers, since one must make one's setting homelike, however little one's habits happened to correspond with that particular effect. Undine, conscious of the intimate charm of her mise-en-scene, and of the recovered freshness and bloom which put her in harmony with it, had never been more sure of her power to keep her friend in the desired state of adoring submission. But Peter, as he grew more adoring, became less submissive, and there came a moment when she needed all her wits to save the situation. It was easy enough to rebuff him, 
the easier as his physical proximity always roused in her a vague instinct of resistance. But it was so hard to temper the rebuff with promise that the game of suspense should still delude him. He put it to her at last, standing squarely before her, his Batrachian sallowness unpleasantly flushed, and primitive man looking out of the eyes from which a frock-coated gentleman usually pined at her. "'Look here. The installment plan's all right. But ain't you a bit behind even on that?' She had brusquely eluded a nearer approach. "'Anyhow, I think I'd rather let the interest accumulate for a while. This is good-bye till I get back from Europe.' The announcement took her by surprise. "'Europe? Why, when are you sailing?' "'On the first of April. Good day for a fool to acknowledge his folly. I'm beaten, and I'm running away.' She sat looking down, her hand absently occupied with the twist of pearls he had given her. In a flash she saw the peril of this departure. Once off on the sorceress, he was lost to her. The power of old associations would prevail. Yet if she were as nice to him as he asked, nice enough to keep him, the end might not be much more to her advantage. Hitherto she had let herself drift on the current of their adventure, but she now saw what port she had half unconsciously been trying for. If she had striven so hard to hold him, had played him with such patience and such skill, it was for something more than her passing amusement and convenience, for a purpose the more tenaciously cherished that she had not dared name it to herself. In the light of this discovery, she saw the need of feigning complete indifference. "'Ah, you happy man! It's good-bye indeed, then!' she threw back at him, lifting a plaintive smile to his frown. "'Oh, you'll turn up in Paris later, I suppose, to get your things for Newport.' "'Paris! Newport! They're not on my map. When Ralph can get away we shall go to the Adirondacks for the boy. I hope I shan't need Paris clothes there. It doesn't matter at any rate.' she ended, laughing, because nobody I care about will see me. Van Degen echoed her laugh. Oh, come, that's rough on Ralph. She looked down with a slight increase of colour. I oughtn't to have said it, ought I? But the fact is I'm unhappy, and a little hurt. Unhappy? Hurt? He was at her side again. Why, what's wrong? She lifted her eyes with a grave look. I thought you'd be sorrier to leave me. Oh, it won't be for long. It needn't be, you know. He was perceptibly softening. It's damnable the way you're tied down. Fancy rotting all summer in the Adirondacks. Why do you stand it? You oughtn't to be bound for life by a girl's mistake. The lashes trembled slightly on her cheek. Aren't we all bound by our mistakes? We women? Don't let us talk of such things. Ralph would never let me go abroad without him. She paused, and then, with a quick upward sweep of the lids, After all it's better it should be good-bye, since I'm paying for another mistake in being so unhappy at your going. Another mistake? Why do you call it that? Because I've misunderstood you, or you me. She continued to smile at him wistfully. And some things are best mended by a break. He met her smile with a loud sigh. She could feel him in the meshes again. "'Is it to be a break between us?' "'Haven't you just said so? Anyhow it might as well be, since we shan't be in the same place again for months.' The frock-coated gentleman once more languished from his eyes. She thought she trembled on the edge of victory. "'Hang it!' he broke out. "'You ought to have a change. You're looking awfully pulled down.' Why can't you coax your mother to run over to Paris with you? Ralph couldn't object to that. She shook her head. I don't believe she could afford it, even if I could persuade her to leave father. You know father hasn't done very well lately. I shouldn't like to ask him for the money. You're so confoundedly proud. He was edging nearer. It would all be so easy if you'd only be a little fond of me. She froze to her sofa end. We women can't repair our mistakes. Don't make me more miserable by reminding me of mine. Oh, nonsense. There's nothing cash won't do. Why won't you let me straighten things out for you? Her color rose again, 
and she looked him quickly and consciously in the eye. It was time to play her last card. "'You seem to forget that I am married,' she said. Van Degen was silent. For a moment she thought he was swaying to her in the flush of surrender. But he remained doggedly seated, meeting her look with an odd clearing of his heated gaze, as if a shrewd businessman had suddenly replaced the pining gentleman at the window. "'Hang it! So am I!' he rejoined. And Undine saw that in the last issue he was still the stronger of the two. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 Nothing was bitterer to her than to confess to herself the failure of her power, but her last talk with Van Degen had taught her a lesson almost worth the abasement. She saw the mistake she had made in taking money from him, and understood that if she drifted into repeating that mistake, her future would be irretrievably compromised. What she wanted was not a hand-to-mouth existence of precarious intrigue. To one with her gifts, the privileges of life should come openly. Already in her short experience she had seen enough of the women who sacrifice future security for immediate success, and she meant to lay solid foundations before she began to build up the light superstructure of enjoyment. Nevertheless it was galling to see Van Degen leave, and to know that for the time he had broken away from her. Over a nature so insensible to the spells of memory, the visible and tangible would always prevail. If she could have been with him again in Paris, where in the shining spring days every sight and sound ministered to such influences, she was sure she could have regained her hold. And the sense of frustration was intensified by the fact that every one she knew was to be there. Her potential rivals were crowding the eastbound steamers. New York was a desert, and Ralph's seeming unconsciousness of the fact increased her resentment. She had had but one chance at Europe since her marriage, and that had been wasted through her husband's unaccountable perversity. She knew now with what packed hours of Paris and London they had paid for their empty weeks in Italy. Meanwhile the long months of the New York spring stretched out before her in all their social vacancy to the measureless blank of a summer in the Adirondacks. In her girlhood she had plumbed the dim depths of such summers, but then she had been sustained by the hope of bringing some capture to the surface. Now she knew better. There were no finds for her in that direction. The people she wanted would be at Newport, or in Europe, and she was too resolutely bent on a definite object, too sternly animated by her father's business instinct, to turn aside in quest of casual distractions. The chief difficulty in the way of her attaining any distant end had always been her reluctance to plod through the intervening stretches of dullness and privation. She had begun to see this, but she could not always master the weakness. Never had she stood in greater need of Mrs. Heeney's, "'Go slow, Undine!' Her imagination was incapable of long flights. She could not cheat her impatience with the mirage of far-off satisfactions, and for the moment present and future seemed equally void. But her desire to go to Europe and to rejoin the little New York world that was reforming itself in London and Paris was fortified by reasons which seemed urgent enough to justify an appeal to her father. She went down to his office to plead her case, fearing Mrs. Spragg's intervention. For some time past Mr. Spragg had been rather continuously overworked, and the strain was beginning to tell on him. He had never quite regained, in New York, the financial security of his apex days. Since he had changed his base of operations, his affairs had followed an uncertain course, and Undine suspected that his breach with his old political ally, the representative Rolliver who had seen him through the muddiest reaches of the pure water move, was not unconnected with his failure to get a footing in Wall Street. But all this was vague and shadowy to her. Even had business been less of a mystery, she was too much absorbed in her own affairs to project herself into her father's case, and she thought she was sacrificing enough to delicacy of feeling in sparing him the bother of Mrs. Spragg's opposition. When she came to him with a grievance he always heard her out with the same mild patience, but the long habit of managing him had made her, in his own language, discount this tolerance, and when she ceased to speak, 
her heart throbbed with suspense as he leaned back, twirling an invisible toothpick under his sallow moustache. Presently he raised a hand to stroke the limp beard in which the moustache was merged, then he groped for the Masonic emblem that had lost itself in one of the folds of his depleted waistcoat. He seemed to fish his answer from the same rusty depths, for as his fingers closed about the trinket he said, "'Yes, the heated term is trying in New York. That's why the Fresh Air Fund pulled my last dollar out of me last week.' Undine frowned. There was nothing more irritating in these encounters with her father than his habit of opening the discussion with a joke. I wish you'd understand that I'm serious, father. I've never been strong since the baby was born, and I need a change. But it's not only that. There are other reasons for my wanting to go." Mr. Spragg still held to his mild tone of banter. "'I never knew you short on reasons, Undy. Trouble is, you don't always know other people's when you see em. His daughter's lips tightened. "'I know your reasons when I see them, father. I've heard them often enough but you can't know mine because I haven't told you, not the real ones." Gee, Josephat! I thought they were all real as long as you had a use for them. Experience had taught her that such protracted trifling usually concealed an exceptional vigor of resistance, and the suspense strengthened her determination. "'My reasons are all real enough,' she answered. "'But there's one more serious than the others.' Mr. Spragg's brows began to jut more bills. No. She stretched out her hand, and began to finger the dusty objects on his desk. I'm unhappy at home. Unhappy? His start overturned the gorged waste-paper basket, and shot a shower of paper across the rug. He stooped to put the basket back. Then he turned his slow, fagged eyes on his daughter. Why, he worships the ground you walk on, Undie. That's not always a reason for a woman." It was the answer she would have given to Popple or Van Degen, but she saw in an instant the mistake of thinking it would impress her father. In the atmosphere of sentimental casuistry to which she had become accustomed, she had forgotten that Mr. Spragg's private rule of conduct was as simple as his business morality was complicated. He glowered at her under thrust-out brows. "'It isn't a reason, isn't it?' I can seem to remember the time when you used to think it was equal to a whole carload of whitewash." She blushed a bright red, and her own brows were leveled at his above her stormy steel-gray eyes. The sense of her blunder made her angrier with him, and more ruthless. "'I can't expect you to understand. You never have, you or mother, when it came to my feelings. I suppose some people are born sensitive. I can't imagine anybody choose to be so. Because I've been too proud to complain, you've taken it for granted that I was perfectly happy. But my marriage was a mistake from the beginning. And Ralph feels about it just as I do. His people hate me. They've always hated me. And he looks at everything as they do. They've never forgiven me for his having had to go into business. With their aristocratic ideas, they look down on a man who works for his living. Of course it's all right for you to do it, because you're not a Marvell or a Dagonet. But they think Ralph ought to just lie back and let you support the baby and me." This time she had found the right note. She knew it by the tightening of her father's slack muscles and the sudden straightening of his back. "'By George, he pretty near does!' he exclaimed, bringing down his fist on the desk. "'They haven't been taking it out of you about that, have they?' "'They don't fight fair enough to say so. They just egg him on to turn against me. They only consented to his marrying me because they thought you were so crazy about the match you'd give us everything, and he'd have nothing to do but sit at home and write books." Mr. Spragg emitted a derisive groan. "'From what I hear of the amount of business he's doing, I guess he could keep the poet's corner going right along. I suppose the old man was right. He hasn't got it in him to make money." "'Of course not. He wasn't brought up to it. And in his heart of hearts he's ashamed of having to do it. He told me it was killing a little more of him every day. Do they back him up in that kind of talk? They back him up in everything. Their ideas are all different from ours. They look down on us, can't you see that? Can't you guess how they treat me from the way they've acted to you and Mother?" He met this with a puzzled stare. The way they've acted to me and Mother? Why, we never so much as set eyes on them. 
That's just what I mean. I don't believe they've even called on Mother this year, have they? Last year they just left their cards without asking. And why do you suppose they never invite you to dine? In their set lots of people older than you and Mother dine out every night of the winter. Society's full of them. The Marvells are ashamed to have you meet their friends. That's the reason. They are ashamed to have it known that Ralph married an Apex girl, and that you and Mother haven't always had your own servants and carriages. And Ralph's ashamed of it, too, now he's got over being crazy about me. If he was free I believe he'd turn round tomorrow and marry that Ray girl his mother's saving up for him." Mr. Spragg listened with a heavy brow and pushed out lip. His daughter's outburst seemed at last to have roused him to a faint resentment. After she had ceased to speak he remained silent, twisting an inky penhandle between his fingers. Then he said, "'I guess Mother and I can worry along without having Ralph's relatives drop in. But I'd like to make it clear to them that if you came from Apex your income came from there, too. I presume they'd be sorry if Ralph was left to support you on his.' She saw that she had scored in the first part of the argument, but every watchful nerve reminded her that the hardest stage was still ahead. "'Oh, they're willing enough he should take your money. That's only natural, they think.' A chuckle sounded deep down under Mr. Spragg's loose collar. "'There seems to be practical unanimity on that point,' he observed. "'But I don't see,' he continued, jerking round his bushy brows on her, "'how going to Europe is going to help you out.' Undine leaned close enough for her lowered voice to reach him. "'Can't you understand that, knowing how they all feel about me, and how Ralph feels, I'd give almost anything to get away." Her father looked at her compassionately. "'I guess most of us feel that once in a way when we're young, Undine. Later on you'll see going away ain't much use when you've got to turn around and come back." She nodded at him with close-pressed lips, like a child in possession of some solemn secret. "'That's just it. That's the reason I'm so wild to go. Because it might mean I wouldn't ever have to come back not come back what on earth are you talking about it might mean that i could get free begin over again he had pushed his seat back with a sudden jerk and cut her short by striking his palm on the arm of the chair for the lord's sake undine do you know what you're saying oh yes i know she gave him back a confident smile if i can get away soon go straight over to paris there's someone there who'd do anything, who could do anything, if I was free." Mr. Spragg's hands continued to grasp his chair arms. "'Good God, Undine Marvell! Are you sitting there in your sane senses and talking to me of what you could do if you were free?' Their glances met in an interval of speechless communion. But Undine did not shrink from her father's eyes, and when she lowered her own, it seemed to be only because there was nothing left for them to say. I know just what I could do if I were free. I could marry the right man," she answered boldly. He met her with a murmur of helpless irony. The right man! The right man! Haven't you had enough of trying for him yet? As he spoke the door behind them opened, and Mr. Spragg looked up abruptly. The stenographer stood on the threshold and above her shoulder Undine perceived the ingratiating grin of Elmer Moffat. "'A little farther lend thy guiding hand, but I guess I can go the rest of the way alone,' he said, insinuating himself through the doorway with an airy gesture of dismissal. Then he turned to Mr. Spragg and Undine. "'I agree entirely with Mrs. Marvell, and I'm happy to have the opportunity of telling her so,' he proclaimed, holding his hand out gallantly. Undine stood up with a laugh. It sounded like old times, I suppose. You thought that father and I were quarreling? But we never quarrel any more. He always agrees with me. She smiled at Mr. Spragg, and turned her shining eyes on Moffat. I wish that treaty had been signed a few years sooner, the latter rejoined in his usual tone of humorous familiarity. Undine had not met him since her marriage and of late the adverse turn of his fortunes had carried him quite beyond her thoughts. But his actual presence was always stimulating, 
and even through her self-absorption she was struck by his air of almost defiant prosperity. He did not look like a man who has been beaten, or rather he looked like a man who does not know when he is beaten, and his eye had the gleam of mocking confidence that had carried him unabashed through his lowest hours at Apex. "'I presume you're here to see me on business?' Mr. Spragg inquired, rising from his chair with a glance that seemed to ask his daughter's silence. "'Why, yes, Senator,' rejoined Moffatt, who was given in playful moments to the bestowal of titles high-sounding. "'At least I'm here to ask you a little question that may lead to business.' Mr. Spragg crossed the office and held open the door. "'Step this way, please,' he said, guiding Moffatt out before him, though the latter hung back to exclaim, "'No family secrets, Mrs. Marvell. Anybody can turn the fierce white light on me.' With the closing of the door Undine's thoughts turned back to her own preoccupations. It had not struck her as incongruous that Moffatt should have business dealings with her father. She was even a little surprised that Mr. Spragg should still treat him so coldly. But she had no time to give to such considerations. Her own difficulties were too importunately present to her. She moved restlessly about the office, listening to the rise and fall of the two voices on the other side of the partition, without once wondering what they were discussing. What should she say to her father when he came back? What argument was most likely to prevail with him? If he really had no money to give her, she was imprisoned fast. Van Degen was lost to her, and the old life must go on interminably. In her nervous pacing she paused before the blotched looking-glass that hung in a corner of the office, under a steel engraving of Daniel Webster. Even that defective surface could not disfigure her, and she drew fresh hope from the sight of her beauty. Her few weeks of ill health had given her cheeks a subtler curve, and deepened the shadows beneath her eyes, and she was handsomer than before her marriage. No, Van Degen was not lost to her even. From narrowed lids to parted lips, her face was swept by a smile like refracted sunlight. He was not lost to her while she could smile like that. Besides, even if her father had no money, there were always mysterious ways of raising it. In the old Apex days, he had often boasted of such feats. As the hope rose, her eyes widened trustfully, and this time the smile that flowed up to them was as limpid as a child's. That was the way her father liked her to look at him. The door opened, and she heard Mr. Spragg say behind her, "'No, sir, I won't. That's final.' He came in alone with a brooding face, and lowered himself heavily into his chair. It was plain that the talk between the two men had had an abrupt ending. Undine looked at her father with a passing flicker of curiosity. Certainly it was an odd coincidence that Moffatt should have called while she was there. "'What did he want?' she asked, glancing back toward the door. Mr. Spragg mumbled his invisible toothpick. "'Oh, just another of his wild-cat schemes. Some real estate deal he's in. Why did he come to you about it? He looked away from her, fumbling among the letters on the desk. Guess he tried everybody else first. He'd go and ring the devil's front doorbell if he thought he could get anything out of him. I suppose he did himself a lot of harm by testifying in the Ararat investigation. Yes, sir. He's down and out this time. He uttered the words with a certain satisfaction. His daughter did not answer, and they sat silent, facing each other across the littered desk. Under their brief talk about Elmer Moffat, currents of rapid intelligence seemed to be flowing between them. Suddenly Undine leaned over the desk, her eyes widening trustfully, and the limpid smile flowing up to them. "'Father, I did what you wanted that one time, anyhow. Won't you listen to me, and help me out now?' End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 Undine stood alone on the landing outside her father's office. Only once before had she failed to gain her end with him, and there was a peculiar irony in the fact that Moffatt's intrusion should have brought before her the providential result of her previous failure. Not that she confessed to any real resemblance between the two situations. In the present case she knew well enough what she wanted and how to get it, but the analogy had served her father's purpose, 
and Moffat's unlucky entrance had visibly strengthened his resistance. The worst of it was that the obstacles in the way were real enough. Mr. Spragg had not put her off with vague asseverations. Somewhat against her will he had forced his proofs on her, showing her how much above his promised allowance he had contributed in the last three years to the support of her household. Since she could not accuse herself of extravagance, having still full faith in her gift of managing, she could only conclude that it was impossible to live on what her father and Ralph could provide and this seemed a practical reason for desiring her freedom. If she and Ralph parted he would of course return to his family, and Mr. Spragg would no longer be burdened with a helpless son-in-law. But even this argument did not move him. Undine, as soon as she had risked Van Degen's name, found herself face to face with a code of domestic conduct as rigid as its exponent's business principles were elastic. Mr. Spragg did not regard divorce as intrinsically wrong, or even inexpedient, and of its social disadvantages he had never even heard. Lots of women did it, as Undine said, and if their reasons were adequate they were justified. If Ralph Marvell had been a drunkard or unfaithful, Mr. Spragg would have approved Undine's desire to divorce him. But that it should be prompted by her inclination for another man, and a man with a wife of his own, was as shocking to him as it would have been to the most uncompromising of the Dagonets and Marvells. Such things happened, as Mr. Spragg knew, but they should not happen to any woman of his name while he had the power to prevent it, and Undine recognized that for the moment he had that power. As she emerged from the elevator she was surprised to see Moffat in the vestibule. His presence was an irritating reminder of her failure, and she walked past him with a rapid bow, but he overtook her. "'Mrs. Marvell, I have been waiting to say a word to you.' If it had been any one else she would have passed on, but Moffatt's voice had always a detaining power. Even now that she knew him to be defeated and negligible, the power asserted itself, and she paused to say, "'I'm afraid I can't stop. I'm late for an engagement.' "'I shan't make you much later, but if you'd rather have me call round at your house—' "'Oh, I'm so seldom in.' She turned a wondering look on him. "'What is it you wanted to say?' "'Just two words. I've got an office in this building, and the shortest way would be to come up there for a minute. As her look grew distant, he added, I think what I've got to say is worth the trip. His face was serious, without underlying irony, the face he wore when he wanted to be trusted. Very well, she said, turning back. Undine, glancing at her watch as she came out of Moffat's office, saw that he had been true to his promise of not keeping her more than ten minutes. The fact was characteristic. Under all his incalculableness there had always been a hard foundation of reliability. It seemed to be a matter of choice with him whether he let one feel that solid bottom or not. And in specific matters the same quality showed itself in an accuracy of statement, a precision of conduct, that contrasted curiously with his usual hyperbolic banter and his loose, lounging manner. No one could be more elusive, yet no one could be firmer to the touch. Her face had cleared, and she moved more lightly as she left the building. Moffat's communication had not been completely clear to her, but she understood the outline of the plan he had laid before her, and was satisfied with the bargain they had struck. He had begun by reminding her of her promise to introduce him to any friend of hers who might be useful in the way of business. Over three years had passed since they made the pact, and Moffat had kept loyally to his side of it. With the lapse of time the whole matter had become less important to her, but she wanted to prove her good faith, and when he reminded her of her promise she at once admitted it. "'Well, then, I want you to introduce me to your husband.' Undine was surprised, but beneath her surprise she felt a quick sense of relief. Ralph was easier to manage than so many of her friends, and it was a mark of his present indifference to acquiesce in anything she suggested. "'My husband? Why, what can he do for you?' Moffat explained at once, in the fewest words, as his way was when it came to business. He was interested in a big deal which involved the purchase of a piece of real estate held by a number of wrangling heirs. The real estate broker with whom Ralph Marvell was associated represented these heirs, but Moffat had his reasons for not approaching him directly. And he didn't want to go to Marvell with a business proposition. It would be better to be thrown with him socially, as if by accident. It was with that object that Moffat had just appealed to Mr. Spragg, 
but Mr. Spragg, as usual, had turned him down, without even consenting to look into the case. "'He'd rather have you miss a good thing than have it come to you through me. I don't know what on earth he thinks it's in my power to do to you, or ever was, for that matter,' he added. "'Anyhow,' he went on to explain, "'the power's all on your side now, and I'll show you how little the doing will hurt you as soon as I can have a quiet chat with your husband.' He branched off again into technicalities, nebulous projections of capital and interest, taxes and rents, from which she finally extracted, and clung to, the central fact that if the deal went through, it would mean a commission of forty thousand dollars to Marvell's firm, of which something over a fourth would come to Ralph. "'By Jove, that's an amazing fellow!' Ralph Marvell exclaimed, turning back into the drawing-room a few evenings later, at the conclusion of one of their little dinners. Undine looked up from her seat by the fire. She had had the inspired thought of inviting Moffatt to meet Claire Van Degen, Mrs. Fairford, and Charles Bowen. It had occurred to her that the simplest way of explaining Moffatt was to tell Ralph that she had unexpectedly discovered an old Apex acquaintance in the protagonist of the great Ararat Trust fight. Moffatt's defeat had not wholly divested him of interest. As a factor in affairs he no longer inspired apprehension, but as the man who had dared to defy Harmon B. Driscoll, he was a conspicuous, and to some minds, almost an heroic figure. Undine remembered that Clare and Mrs. Fairford had once expressed a wish to see this braver of the Olympians, and her suggestion that he should be asked to meet them gave Ralph evident pleasure. It was long since she had made any conciliatory sign to his family. Moffat's social gifts were hardly of a kind to please the two ladies, he would have shown more brightly in Peter Van Degen's set than in his wife's. But neither Clare nor Mrs. Fairford had expected a man of conventional cut, and Moffatt's loud easiness was obviously less disturbing to them than to their hostess. Undine only felt his crudeness, and the tacit criticism passed on it by the mere presence of such men as her husband and Bowen. But Mrs. Fairford seemed to enjoy provoking him to fresh excesses of slang and hyperbole. Gradually she drew him into talking of the Driscoll campaign, and he became recklessly explicit. He seemed to have nothing to hold back. All the details of the prodigious exploit poured from him with Homeric volume. Then he broke off abruptly, thrusting his hands into his trouser pockets and shaping his red lips to a whistle, which he checked as his glance met on Dean's. To conceal his embarrassment he leaned back in his chair, looked about the table with complacency, and said, I don't mind if I do," to the servant who approached to refill his champagne glass. The men sat long over their cigars, but after an interval Undine called Charles Bowen into the drawing-room to settle some question in dispute between Clare and Mrs. Fairford, and thus gave Moffatt a chance to be alone with her husband. Now that their guests had gone, she was throbbing with anxiety to know what had passed between the two, but when Ralph rejoined her in the drawing-room she continued to keep her eyes on the fire and twirl her fan listlessly. "'That's an amazing chap,' Ralph repeated, looking down at her. "'Where was it you ran across him? Out at Apex?' As he leaned against the chimney-piece, lighting his cigarette, it struck Undine that he looked less fagged and lifeless than usual, and she felt more and more sure that something important had happened during the moment of isolation she had contrived. She opened and shut her fan reflectively. "'Yes, years ago, Father had some business with him and brought him home to dinner one day. And you've never seen him since? She waited, as if trying to piece her recollections together. I suppose I must have. But all that seems so long ago, she said, sighing. She had been given of late to such plaintive glances toward her happy girlhood, but Ralph seemed not to notice the illusion. Do you know? he exclaimed after a moment. I don't believe the fellow's beaten yet. She looked up quickly. "'Don't you?' "'No, and I could see that Bowen didn't either. He strikes me as the kind of man who develops slowly, needs a big field, and perhaps makes some big mistakes, but gets where he wants to in the end. Jove, I wish I could put him in a book. There's something epic about him, a kind of epic effrontery.' Undine's pulses beat faster as she listened. Was it not what Moffat had always said of himself? that all he needed was time and elbow-room? How odd that Ralph, who seemed so dreamy and unobservant, should instantly have reached the same conclusion! 
but what she wanted to know was the practical result of their meeting. "'What did you and he talk about when you were smoking?' "'Oh, he got on the Driscoll fight again, gave us some extraordinary details. The man's a thundering brute, but he's full of observation and humour. Then, after Bowen joined you, he told me about a new deal he's gone into, rather a promising scheme, but on the same titanic scale. It's just possible, by the way, that we may be able to do something for him. Part of the property he's after is held in our office." He paused, knowing Undine's indifference to business matters, but the face she turned to him was alive with interest. "'You mean you might sell the property to him?' "'Well, if the thing comes off. There would be a big commission if we did.' He glanced down on her half-ironically. "'You'd like that, wouldn't you?' She answered with a shade of reproach. "'Why do you say that? I haven't complained.' "'Oh, no. But I know I've been a disappointment as a money-maker.' She leaned back in her chair, closing her eyes as if in utter weariness and indifference, and in a moment she felt him bending over her. "'What's the matter? Don't you feel well?' "'I'm a little tired. It's nothing.' She pulled her hand away, and burst into tears. Ralph knelt down by her chair and put his arm about her. It was the first time he had touched her since the night of the boy's birthday, and the sense of her softness woke a momentary warmth in his veins. "'What is it, dear? What is it?' Without turning her head, she sobbed out, "'You seem to think I'm too selfish and odious, that I'm just pretending to be ill.' "'No, no,' he assured her smoothing back her hair. But she continued to sob on in a gradual crescendo of despair, till the vehemence of her weeping began to frighten him, and he drew her to her feet and tried to persuade her to let herself be led upstairs. She yielded to his arm, sobbing in short, exhausted gasps, and leaning her whole weight on him as he guided her along the passage to her bedroom. On the lounge to which he lowered her, she lay white and still, tears trickling through her lashes, and her handkerchief pressed against her lips. He recognized the symptoms with a sinking heart. She was on the verge of a nervous attack, such as she had had in the winter, and he foresaw with dismay the disastrous train of consequences, the doctors' and nurses' bills, and all the attendant confusion and expense. If only Moffatt's project might be realized, if for once he could feel a round sum in his pocket, and be freed from the perpetual daily strain. The next morning Undine, though calmer, was too weak to leave her bed, and her doctor prescribed rest and absence of worry, later, perhaps, a change of scene. He explained to Ralph that nothing was so wearing to a high-strung nature as monotony, and that if Mrs. Marvell were contemplating a Newport season, it was necessary that she be fortified to meet it. In such cases he often recommended a dash to Paris or London, just to tone up the nervous system. Undine regained her strength slowly, and as the days dragged on, the suggestion of the European trip recurred with increasing frequency. But it came always from her medical adviser. She herself had grown strangely passive and indifferent. She continued to remain upstairs on her lounge, seeing no one but Mrs. Heeny, whose daily ministrations had once more been prescribed, and asking only that the noise of Paul's play should be kept from her. His scamperings overhead disturbed her sleep, and his bed was moved into the day-nursery, above his father's room. The child's early romping did not trouble Ralph, since he himself was always awake before daylight. The days were not long enough to hold his cares, and they came and stood by him through the silent hours, when there was no other sound to drown their voices. Ralph had not made a success of his business. The real estate brokers who had taken him into partnership had done so only with the hope of profiting by his social connections and in this respect the alliance had been a failure. It was in such directions that he most lacked facility, and so far he had been of use to his partners only as an office drudge. He was resigned to the continuance of such drudgery, though all his powers cried out against it. But even for the routine of business his aptitude was small, and he began to feel that he was not considered an addition to the firm. The difficulty of finding another opening made him fear a break and his thoughts turned hopefully to Elmer Moffat's hint of a deal. The success of the negotiation might bring advantages beyond the immediate pecuniary profit, and that, at the present juncture, was important enough in itself. Moffat reappeared two days after the dinner, 
presenting himself in West End Avenue in the late afternoon with the explanation that the business in hand necessitated discretion, and that he preferred not to be seen in Ralph's office. It was a question of negotiating with the utmost privacy for the purchase of a small strip of land between two large plots already acquired by purchasers cautiously designated by Moffat as his parties. How far he stood in with the parties he left it to Ralph to conjecture, but it was plain that he had a large stake in the transaction, and that it offered him his first chance of recovering himself since Driscoll had thrown him. The owners of the coveted plot did not seem anxious to sell, and there were personal reasons for Moffat's not approaching them through Ralph's partners, who were the regular agents of the estate, so that Ralph's acquaintance with the conditions, combined with his detachments from the case, marked him out as a useful intermediary. Their first talk left Ralph with a dazzled sense of Moffat's strength and keenness, but with a vague doubt as to the straightness of the proposed transaction. Ralph had never seen his way clearly in that dim underworld of affairs where men of the Moffat and Driscoll type moved like shadowy, destructive monsters beneath the darting small fry of the surface. He knew that business had created its own special morality, and his musings on man's relation to his self-imposed laws had shown him how little human conduct is generally troubled about its own sanctions. He had a vivid sense of the things a man of his kind didn't do, but his inability to get a mental grasp on large financial problems made it hard to apply to them so simple a measure as this inherited standard. He only knew, as Moffat's plan developed, that it seemed all right while he talked of it with its originator, but vaguely wrong when he thought it over afterward. It occurred to him to consult his grandfather, and if he renounced the idea for the obvious reason that Mr. Dagonet's ignorance of business was as fathomless as his own, this was not his sole motive. Finally, it occurred to him to put the case hypothetically to Mr. Spragg. As far as Ralph knew, his father-in-law's business record was unblemished, yet one felt in him an elasticity of adjustment not allowed for in the Dagonet Code. Mr. Spragg listened thoughtfully to Ralph's statement of the case, growling out here and there a tentative correction, and turning his cigar between his lips as he seemed to turn the problem over in the loose grasp of his mind. "'Well, what's the trouble with it?' he asked at length, stretching his big square-toed shoes against the grate of his son-in-law's dining-room, where, in the after-dinner privacy of a family evening, Ralph had seized the occasion to consult him. "'The trouble?' Ralph considered. "'Why, that's just what I should like you to explain to me.' Mr. Spragg threw back his head, and stared at the garlanded French clock on the chimney-piece. Mrs. Spragg was sitting upstairs in her daughter's bedroom, and the silence of the house seemed to hang about the two men like a listening presence. "'Well, I don't know but what I agree with the doctor who said there weren't any diseases, but only sick people. Every case is different, I guess.' Mr. Spragg, munching his cigar, turned a ruminating glance on Ralph. "'Seems to me it all boils down to one thing. Was this fellow we're supposing about under any obligation to the other party, the one he was trying to buy the property from?' Ralph hesitated. "'Only the obligation recognized between decent men to deal with each other decently.' Mr. Spragg listened to this with the suffering air of a teacher compelled to simplify upon his simplest questions. Any personal obligation, I meant. Had the other fellow done him a good turn any time? No, I don't imagine them to have had any previous relations at all. His father-in-law stared. Where's your trouble, then? He sat for a moment, frowning at the embers. Even when it's the other way around, it ain't always so easy to decide how far that kind of thing's binding. And they say shipwrecked fellows will make a meal of a friend as quick as they would of a total stranger. He drew himself together with a shake of his shoulders, and pulled back his feet from the grate. "'But I don't see the conundrum in your case. I guess it's up to both parties to take care of their own skins.' He rose from his chair, and wandered upstairs to Undine. That was the Wall Street Code. It all boiled down to the personal obligation, to the salt eaten in the enemy's tent. Ralph's fancy wandered off on a long trail of speculation, from which he was pulled back with a jerk by the need of immediate action. Moffat's deal would not wait. Quick decisions were essential to effective action, 
and brooding over ethical shades of difference might work more ill than good in a world committed to swift adjustments. The arrival of several unforeseen bills confirmed this view, and once Ralph had adopted it he began to take a detached interest in the affair. In Paris, in his younger days, he had once attended a lesson in acting given at the Conservatoire by one of the great lights of the theatre, and had seen an apparently uncomplicated role of the classic repertory, familiar to him through repeated performances, taken to pieces before his eyes, dissolved into its component elements, and built up again with a minuteness of elucidation and a range of reference that made him feel as though he had been let into the secret of some age-long natural process. As he listened to Moffat, the remembrance of that lesson came back to him. At the outset the deal, and his own share in it, had seemed simple enough. He would have put on his hat and gone out on the spot in the full assurance of being able to transact the affair. But as Moffat talked, he began to feel as blank and blundering as the class of dramatic students before whom the great actor had analyzed his part. The affair was, in fact, difficult and complex, and Moffat saw at once just where the difficulties lay and how the personal idiosyncrasies of the parties affected them. Such insights fascinated Ralph, and he strayed off into wondering why it did not qualify every financier to be a novelist, and what intrinsic barrier divided the two arts. Both men had strong incentives for hastening the affair, and within a fortnight after Moffat's first advance, Ralph was able to tell him that his offer was accepted. Over and above his personal satisfaction, he felt the thrill of the agent whom some powerful negotiator has charged with a delicate mission he might have been an eager young Jesuit carrying compromising papers to his superior. It had been stimulating to work with Moffat, and to study at close range the large, powerful instrument of his intelligence. As he came out of Moffat's office at the conclusion of this visit, Ralph met Mr. Spragg descending from his eyry. He stopped short with a backward glance at Moffat's door. "'Hello. What were you doing in there with those cutthroats?' Ralph judged discretion to be essential. Oh, just a little business for the firm. Mr. Spragg said no more, but resorted to the soothing labial motion of revolving his phantom toothpick. How's Undy getting along? he merely asked, as he and his son-in-law descended together in the elevator. She doesn't seem to feel much stronger. The doctor wants her to run over to Europe for a few weeks. She thinks of joining her friends, the Shalems, in Paris. Mr. Spragg was again silent but he left the building at Ralph's side, and the two walked together toward Wall Street. Presently the older man said, "'How did you get acquainted with Moffat?' "'Why, by chance. Undine ran across him somewhere and asked him to dine the other night.' "'Undine asked him to dine?' "'Yes. She told me you used to know him out at Apex.' Mr. Spragg appeared to search his memory for confirmation of the fact. I believe he used to be round there at one time. I've never heard any good of him yet. He paused at a crossing and looked probingly at his son-in-law. Is she terribly set on this trip to Europe? Ralph smiled. You know how it is when she takes a fancy to do anything. Mr. Spragg, by a slight lift of his brooding brows, seemed to convey a deep, if unspoken, response. Well, I'd let her do it this time. I'd let her do it he said, as he turned down the steps of the subway. Ralph was surprised, for he had gathered from some frightened references of Mrs. Spragg's that Undine's parents had wind of her European plan and were strongly opposed to it. He concluded that Mr. Spragg had long since measured the extent of profitable resistance and knew just when it became vain to hold out against his daughter or advise others to do so. Ralph, for his own part, had no inclination to resist. As he left Moffat's office, his inmost feeling was one of relief. He had reached the point of recognizing that it was best for both that his wife should go. When she returned, perhaps their lives would readjust themselves. But for the moment he longed for some kind of benumbing influence, something that should give relief to the dull daily ache of feeling her so near and yet so inaccessible. Certainly there were more urgent uses for their brilliant windfall, Heavy arrears of household debts had to be met, and the summer would bring its own burden. But perhaps another stroke of luck might befall him, 
He was getting to have the drifting dependence on luck of the man conscious of his inability to direct his life. And meanwhile, it seemed easier to let Undine have what she wanted. Undine, on the whole, behaved with discretion. She received the good news languidly, and showed no unseemly haste to profit by it. But it was as hard to hide the light in her eyes as to dissemble the fact that she had not only thought out every detail of the trip in advance, but had decided exactly how her husband and son were to be disposed of in her absence. Her suggestion that Ralph should take Paul to his grandparents, and that the West End Avenue house should be let for the summer, were too practical not to be acted on, and Ralph found she had already put her hand on the Harry Lipscombs, who after three years of neglect were to be dragged back to favour, and made to feel, as the first step in their reinstatement, the necessity of hiring for the summer months a cool, airy house on the west side. On her return from Europe, Undine explained, she would of course go straight to Ralph and the boy in the Adirondacks, and it seemed a foolish extravagance to let the house stand empty when the Lipscombs were so eager to take it. As the day of departure approached, it became harder for her to temper her beams, but her pleasure showed itself so amiably that Ralph began to think she might, after all, miss the boy and himself more than she imagined. She was tenderly preoccupied with Paul's welfare, and, to prepare for his translation to his grandparents, she gave the household in Washington Square more of her time than she had accorded it since her marriage. She explained that she wanted Paul to grow used to his new surroundings, and with that object she took him frequently to his grandmother's, and won her way into old Mr. Dagonet's sympathies by her devotion to the child and pretty way of joining in his games. Undine was not consciously acting a part. This new phase was as natural to her as the other. In the joy of her gratified desires, she wanted to make everybody about her happy. If only everyone would do as she wished, she would never be unreasonable. She much preferred to see smiling faces about her, and her dread of the reproachful and dissatisfied countenance gave the measure of what she would do to avoid it. These thoughts were in her mind, when, a day or two before sailing, she came out of the Washington Square house with her boy. It was a late spring afternoon, and she and Paul had lingered on till long past the hour sacred to his grandfather's nap. Now, as she came out into the square, she saw that, however well Mr. Dagonet had borne their protracted romp, it had left his playmate flushed and sleepy, and she lifted Paul in her arms to carry him to the nearest cab-stand. As she raised herself, she saw a thick-set figure approaching her across the square, and a moment later she was shaking hands with Elmer Moffat. In the bright spring air he looked seasonably glossy and prosperous, and she noticed that he wore a bunch of violets in his buttonhole. His small black eyes twinkled with approval as they rested on her, and Undine reflected that, with Paul's arms about her neck, and his little flushed face against her own, she must present a not unpleasing image of young motherhood. "'That the heir apparent?' Moffat asked, adding, "'Happy to make your acquaintance, sir,' as the boy, at Undine's bidding, held out a fist sticky with sugar-plums. "'He's been spending the afternoon with his grandfather, and they played so hard that he's sleepy,' she explained. Little Paul, at that stage in his career, had a peculiar grace of wide-gazing deep-lashed eyes and arched cherubic lips, and Undine saw that Moffat was not insensible to the picture she and her son composed. She did not dislike his admiration, for she no longer felt any shrinking from him. She would even have been glad to thank him for the service he had done her husband, if she had known how to allude to it without awkwardness. Moffat seemed equally pleased at the meeting, and they looked at each other almost intimately, over Paul's tumbled curls. "'He's a mighty fine fellow, and no mistake. But isn't he rather an armful for you?' Moffat asked, his eyes lingering with real kindliness on the child's face. "'Oh, we haven't far to go. I'll pick up a cab at the corner.' "'Well, let me carry him that far, anyhow,' said Moffat. Undine was glad to be relieved of her burden, for she was unused to the child's weight, and disliked to feel that her skirt was dragging on the pavement. "'Go to the gentleman, Polly. He'll carry you better than mother,' she said. The little boy's first movement was one of recoil from the ruddy, sharp-eyed countenance that was so unlike his father's delicate face. But he was an obedient child, and after a moment's hesitation, he wound his arms trustfully about the red gentleman's neck. "'That's a good fellow. Sit tight and I'll give you a ride,' Moffat cried, hoisting the boy to his shoulder. 
Paul was not used to being perched at such a height, and his nature was hospitable to new impressions. "'Oh, I like it up here! You're higher than father!' he exclaimed, and Moffatt hugged him with a laugh. "'It must feel mighty good to come up town to a fellow like you in the evenings,' he said, addressing the child, but looking at Undine, who also laughed a little. "'Oh, they're a dreadful nuisance, you know, but Paul's a very good boy.' "'I wonder if he knows what a friend I've been to him lately,' Moffatt went on, as they turned into Fifth Avenue. Undine smiled. She was glad he should have given her an opening. "'He shall be told as soon as he's old enough to thank you. I'm so glad you came to Ralph about that business.' "'Oh, I gave him a leg up, and I guess he's given me one, too. Queer the way things come round. He's fairly put me in the way of a fresh start.' Their eyes met in a silence which Undine was the first to break. It's been awfully nice of you to do what you've done right along, and this last thing has made a lot of difference to us. Well, I'm glad you feel that way. I never wanted to be anything but nice, as you call it. Moffatt paused a moment and then added, If you're less scared of me than your father is, I'd be glad to call round and see you once in a while. The quick blood rushed to her cheeks. There was nothing challenging, demanding in his tone. She guessed at once that if he made the request, it was simply for the pleasure of being with her, and she liked the magnanimity implied. Nevertheless, she was not sorry to have to answer, "'Of course I'll always be glad to see you. Only as it happens, I'm just sailing for Europe.' "'For Europe!' The word brought Moffat to a stand so abruptly that little Paul lurched on his shoulder. "'For Europe!' he repeated. "'Why, I thought you said the other evening you expected to stay on in town till July. Didn't you think of going to the Adirondacks?' Flattered by his evident disappointment, she became high and careless in her triumph. "'Oh, yes, but that's all changed. Ralph and the boy are going. But I sail on Saturday to join some friends in Paris, and later I may do some motoring in Switzerland and Italy.' She laughed a little in the mere enjoyment of putting her plans into words, and Moffatt laughed, too, but with an edge of sarcasm. "'I see, I see. Everything's changed, as you say, and your husband can blow you off to the trip.' Well, I hope you'll have a first-class time. Their glances crossed again, and something in his cool scrutiny impelled Undine to say, with a burst of candor, If I do, you know, I shall owe it all to you. Well, I always told you I meant to act white by you, he answered. They walked on in silence, and presently he began again in his usual joking strain. See what one of the Apex girls has been up to? Apex was too remote for her to understand the reference, and he went on. Why, Millard Binch's wife, Indiana Frusk, that was. Didn't you see in the papers that Indiana had fixed it up with James J. Rolliver to marry her? They say it was easy enough squaring Millard Binch. You'd know it would be. But it cost Rolliver near a million to mislay Mrs. R. and the children. Well, Indiana's pulled it off, anyhow. She always was a bright girl. But she never came up to you. Oh! she stammered with a laugh, astonished and agitated by his news. Indiana Frusk and Rolliver! It showed how easily the thing could be done. If only her father had listened to her! If a girl like Indiana Frusk could gain her end so easily, what might not Undine have accomplished? She knew Moffatt was right in saying that Indiana had never come up to her. She wondered how the marriage would strike Van Degen. She signaled to a cab, and they walked toward it without speaking. Undine was recalling with intensity that one of Indiana's shoulders was higher than the other, and that people in Apex had thought her lucky to catch Millard Binch, the druggist's clerk, when Undine herself had cast him off after a lingering engagement. And now Indiana Frusk was to be Mrs. James J. Rolliver. Undine got into the cab, and bent forward to take little Paul. Moffat lowered his charge with exaggerated care, and a steady there, steady, that made the child laugh. Then, stooping over, he put a kiss on Paul's lips before handing him over to his mother. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19. The Parisian Diamond Company, Anglo-American Branch 
Charles Bowen, seated one rainy evening of the Paris season in a corner of the great Nouveau Luxe restaurant, was lazily trying to resolve his impressions of the scene into the phrases of a letter to his old friend, Mrs. Henley Fairford. The long habit of unwritten communion with this lady, in no way conditioned by the short rare letters they actually exchanged, usually caused his notations, in absence, to fall into such terms when the subject was of a kind to strike an answering flash from her. And who but Mrs. Fairford would see, from his own precise angle, the fantastic improbability, the layers on layers of unsubstantialness, on which the seemingly solid scene before him rested. The dining-room of the Nouveau Lux was at its fullest, and having contracted on the garden side through stress of weather, had even overflowed to the farther end of the long hall beyond, so that Bowen, from his corner, surveyed a seemingly endless perspective of plumed and jewelled heads, of shoulders bare or black-coated, encircling the close-packed tables. He had come half an hour before the time he had named to his expected guest, so that he might have the undisturbed amusement of watching the picture compose itself again before his eyes. During some forty years' perpetual exercise of his perceptions, he had never come across anything that gave them the special titillation produced by the sight of the dinner-hour at the Nouveau Lux. The same sense of putting his hand on human nature's passion for the factitious, its incorrigible habit of imitating the imitation. As he sat watching the familiar faces swept toward him on the rising tide of arrival, for it was one of the joys of the scene that the type was always the same even when the individual was not, he hailed with renewed appreciation this costly expression of a social ideal. The dining-room at the Nouveau Lux represented, on such a spring evening, what unbounded material power had devised for the delusion of its leisure. A phantom society, with all the rules, smirks, gestures of its model, but evoked out of promiscuity and incoherence, while the other had been the product of continuity and choice. And the instinct which had driven a new class of world-compellers to bind themselves to slavish imitation of the superseded, and their prompt and reverent faith in the reality of the sham they had created, seemed to Bowen the most satisfying proof of human permanence. With this thought in his mind, he looked up to greet his guest. The Comte Raymond de Chelle, straight, slim, and gravely smiling, came toward him with frequent pauses of salutation at the crowded tables, saying, as he seated himself and turned his pleasant eyes on the scene, Il n'y a pas à dire, my dear Bowen. It's charming and sympathetic and original. We owe America a great debt of gratitude for inventing it. Bowen felt a last touch of satisfaction. They were the very words to complete his thought. My dear fellow, it's really you and your kind who are responsible. It's the direct creation of feudalism, like all the great social upheavals. Raymond de Chelles stroked his handsome brown moustache. I should have said, on the contrary, that one enjoyed it for the contrast. It's such a refreshing change from our institutions, which are nevertheless the necessary foundations of society. But just as one may have an infinite admiration for one's wife, and yet occasionally— He waved a light hand toward the spectacle. This, in the social order, is the diversion, the permitted diversion, that your original race has devised, a kind of superior bohemia, where one may be respectable without being bored. Bowen laughed. <laughs> You've put it in a nutshell. The ideal of the American woman is to be respectable without being bored, and from that point of view this world they've invented has more originality than I gave it credit for. Shell thoughtfully unfolded his napkin. My impression's a superficial one, of course, for as to what goes on underneath. He looked across the room. If I married, I shouldn't care to have my wife come here too often. Bowen laughed again. <laughs> She'd be as safe as in a bank. Nothing ever goes on. Nothing that ever happens here is real. Ah, quant à cela, the Frenchman murmured, inserting a fork into his melon. Bowen looked at him with enjoyment. He was such a precious footnote to the page. The two men, accidentally thrown together some years previously during a trip up the Nile, always met again with pleasure when Bowen returned to France. Raymond de Chelles, who came of a family of moderate fortune, 
lived for the greater part of the year on his father's estates in Burgundy, but he came up every spring to the entresol of the old Marquis's hôtel for a two-month study of human nature, applying to the pursuit of the discriminating taste and transient ardour that give the finest bloom to pleasure. Bowen liked him as a companion, and admired him as a charming specimen of the Frenchman of his class, embodying in his lean, fatigued, and finished person that happy mean of simplicity and intelligence of which no other race has found the secret. If Raymond de Chelles had been English, he would have been a mere fox-hunting animal, with appetites but without tastes. But in his lighter Gallic clay, the wholesome territorial savour, the inherited passion for sport and agriculture, were blent with an openness to finer sensations, a sense of the come and go of ideas, under which one felt the tight hold of two or three inherited notions, religious, political, and domestic, in total contradiction to his surface attitude. That the inherited notions would in the end prevail, everything in his appearance declared, from the distinguished slant of his nose to the narrow forehead under his thinning hair. He was the kind of man who would inevitably revert when he married. But meanwhile, the surface he presented to the play of life was broad enough to take in the fantastic spectacle of the nouveau luxe, and to see its gestures reflected in a Latin consciousness was an endless entertainment to Bowen. The tone of his guest's last words made him take them up. "'But is the lady you allude to more than a hypothesis? Surely you're not thinking of getting married?' Shell raised his eyebrows ironically. "'When hasn't one to think of it in my situation? One hears of nothing else at home. One knows that, like death, it has to come.' His glance, which was still mustering the room, came to a sudden pause and kindled. "'Who's the lady over there, fair-haired in white, the one who's just come in with that red-faced man? They seem to be with a party of your compatriots.' Bowen followed his glance to a neighbouring table, where at the moment Undine Marvell was seating herself at Peter Van Degen's side, in the company of the Harvey Shallums, the beautiful Mrs. Beringer, and a dozen other New York figures. She was so placed that as she took her seat she recognized Bowen and sent him a smile across the tables. She was more simply dressed than usual, and the pink lights, warming her cheeks and striking gleams from her hair, gave her face a dewy freshness that was new to Bowen. He had always thought her beauty too obvious, too bathed in the bright publicity of the American air. But to-night she seemed to have been brushed by the wing of poetry and its shadow lingered in her eyes. Shell's gaze made it evident that he had received the same impression. "'One is sometimes inclined to deny your compatriots actual beauty, to charge them with producing the effect without having the features. Uh, but in this case, you say you know the lady?' "'Yes, she's the wife of an old friend.' "'The wife? She's married. There again it's so puzzling. Your young girls look so experienced.' and your married women sometimes so unmarried. Well, they often are, in these days of divorce. The other's interest quickened. Your friend's divorced? Oh, no, heaven forbid. Mrs. Marvell hasn't been long married, and it was a love match of the good old kind. Ah, and the husband's? Which is he? He's not here. He's in New York. Uh, feverishly adding to a fortune already monstrous. No, not precisely monstrous. The Marvells are not well off, said Bowen, amused by his friend's interrogations. And he allows an exquisite being like that to come to Paris without him, and in company with the red-faced gentleman who seems so alive to his advantages. We don't allow our women this or that. I don't think we set much store by the compulsory virtues. His companion received this with amusement. "'If you're as detached as that, why does the obsolete institution of marriage survive with you?' "'Oh, it still has its uses. One couldn't be divorced without it.' Shell laughed again, but his straying eye still followed the same direction, and Bowen noticed that the fact was not unremarked by the object of his contemplation. Undine's party was one of the liveliest in the room. 
The American laugh rose above the din of the orchestra, as the American toilets dominated the less daring effects at the other tables. Undine, on entering, had seemed to be in the same mood as her companions, but Bowen saw that, as she became conscious of his friend's observation, she isolated herself in a kind of soft abstraction, and he admired the adaptability which enabled her to draw from such surroundings the contrasting graces of reserve. They had greeted each other with all the outer signs of cordiality, but Bowen fancied she would not care to have him speak to her. She was evidently dining with Van Degen, and Van Degen's proximity was the last fact she would wish to have transmitted to the critics in Washington Square. Bowen was therefore surprised when, as he rose to leave the restaurant, he heard himself hailed by Peter. "'Hello. Hold on. When did you come over? Mrs. Marvell's dying for the last news about the old homestead.' Undine's smile confirmed the appeal. She wanted to know how lately Bowen had left New York, and pressed him to tell her when he had last seen her boy, how he was looking, and whether Ralph had been persuaded to go down to Clare's on Saturdays and get a little riding and tennis. And dear Laura, was she well too, and was Paul with her, or still with his grandmother? They were all dreadfully bad correspondents, and so was she, Undine laughingly admitted, and when Ralph had last written her these questions had still been undecided. As she smiled up at Bowen, he saw her glance stray to the spot where his companion hovered, and when the diners rose to move toward the garden for coffee, she said with a sweet note and a detaining smile, "'Do come with us. I haven't half finished.' Van Degen echoed the request, and Bowen, amused by Undine's arts, was presently introducing Shell and joining with him in the party's transit to the terrace. The rain had ceased, and under the clear evening sky the restaurant garden opened green depths that skilfully hid its narrow boundaries. Van Degen's company was large enough to surround two of the tables on the terrace, and Bowen noted the skill with which Undine, leaving him to Mrs. Shallum's care, contrived to draw Raymond de Chelles to the other table. Still more noticeable was the effect of this stratagem on Van Degen, who also found himself relegated to Mrs. Shallum's group. Poor Peter's state was betrayed by the irascibility which wrecked itself on a jostling waiter, and found cause for loud remonstrance in the coldness of the coffee and the badness of the cigars. And Bowen, with something more than the curiosity of the looker-on, wondered whether this were the real clue to Undine's conduct. He had always smiled at Mrs. Fairford's fears for Ralph's domestic peace. He thought Undine too clear-headed to forfeit the advantages of her marriage, but now it struck him that she might have had a glimpse of larger opportunities. Bowen, at the thought, felt the pang of the sociologist over the individual havoc wrought by every social readjustment. It had so long been clear to him that poor Ralph was a survival, and destined, as such, to go down in any conflict with the rising forces. End of chapter 19《Chapter Twenty Some six weeks later, Undine Marvell stood at the window smiling down on her recovered Paris. Her hotel sitting-room had, as usual, been flowered, cushioned, and lamp-shaded into a delusive semblance of stability, and she had really felt, for the last few weeks, that the life she was leading there must be going to last. It seemed so perfect an answer to all her wants. As she looked out at the thronged street, on which the summer light lay like a blush of pleasure, she felt herself naturally akin to all the bright and careless freedom of the scene. She had been away from Paris for two days, and the spectacle before her seemed more rich and suggestive after her brief absence from it. Her senses luxuriated in all its material details, the thronging motors, the brilliant shops, the novelty and daring of the women's dresses, the piled-up colours of the ambulant flower-carts, the appetising expanse of the fruiterers' windows, even the chromatic effects of the pettifores behind the plate-glass of the pastry-cooks, all the surface sparkle and variety of the inexhaustible streets of Paris. The scene before her typified to Undine her first real taste of life. How meagre and starved the past appeared in comparison with this abundant present! The noise, the crowd, the promiscuity beneath her eyes symbolized the glare and movement of her life. 
Every moment of her days was packed with excitement and exhilaration. Everything amused her. The long hours of bargaining and debate with dressmakers and jewellers, the crowded lunches at fashionable restaurants, the perfunctory dash through a picture show, or the lingering visit to the last new milliner, the afternoon motor rush to some leafy suburb, where tea and music and sunset were hastily absorbed on a crowded terrace above the Seine, the whirl home through the bois to dress for dinner and start again on the round of evening diversions, the dinner at the Nouveau Lux or the Café de Paris, and the little play at the Capucine or the Varieté, followed, because the night was too lovely, and it was a shame to waste it, by a breathless flight back to the bois, with supper in one of its lamp-hung restaurants, or, if the weather forbade, a tumultuous progress through the midnight haunts, where ladies were not supposed to show themselves, and might consequently taste the thrill of being occasionally taken for their opposites. As the varied vision unrolled itself, Undine contrasted it with the pale monotony of her previous summers. The one she most resented was the first after her marriage, the European summer out of whose joys she had been cheated by her own ignorance and Ralph's perversity. They had been free, then, there had been no child to hamper their movements, their money anxieties had hardly begun, the face of life had been fresh and radiant, and she had been doomed to waste such opportunities on a succession of ill-smelling Italian towns. She still felt it to be her deepest grievance against her husband, and now that, after four years of petty household worries, another chance of escape had come, he already wanted to drag her back to bondage. This fit of retrospection had been provoked by two letters which had come that morning. One was from Ralph, who began by reminding her that he had not heard from her for weeks, and went on to point out, in his usual tone of good-humoured remonstrance, that since her departure the drain on her letter of credit had been deep and constant. "'I wanted you,' he wrote, "'to get all the fun you could out of the money I made last spring. But I didn't think you'd get through it quite so fast. Try to come home without leaving too many bills behind you. Your illness and Paul's cost more than I expected, and Lipscomb has had a bad knock in Wall Street, and hasn't yet paid his first quarter. Always the same monotonous refrain. Was it her fault that she and the boy had been ill, or that Harry Lipscomb had been on the wrong side of Wall Street? Ralph seemed to have money on the brain. His business life had certainly deteriorated him. And, since he hadn't made a success of it after all, why shouldn't he turn back to literature? and try to write his novel. Undine, the previous winter, had been dazzled by the figures which a well-known magazine editor whom she had met at a dinner had named as within reach of the successful novelist. She perceived for the first time that literature was becoming fashionable, and instantly decided that it would be amusing and original if she and Ralph should owe their prosperity to his talent. She already saw herself as the wife of a celebrated author, wearing artistic dresses, and doing the drawing-room over with gothic tapestries and dim lights in altar candlesticks. But when she suggested Ralph's taking up his novel, he answered with a laugh that his brains were sold to the firm, that when he came back at night the tank was empty, and now he wanted her to sail for home in a week. The other letter excited a deeper resentment. It was an appeal from Laura Fairford to return and look after Ralph. He was overworked and out of spirits, she wrote and his mother and sister, reluctant as they were to interfere, felt they ought to urge Undine to come back to him. Details followed, unwelcome and officious. What right had Laura Fairford to preach to her of wifely obligations? No doubt Charles Bowen had sent home a highly coloured report, and there was really a certain irony in Mrs. Fairford's criticising her sister-in-law's conduct on information obtained from such a source. Undine turned from the window, and threw herself down on her deeply cushioned sofa. She was feeling the pleasant fatigue consequent on her trip to the country, whither she and Mrs. Shallum had gone with Raymond de Chelles to spend a night at the old Marquis's chateau. When her travelling companions, an hour earlier, had left her at her door, she had half promised to rejoin them for a late dinner in the bois, and as she leaned back among the cushions, Disturbing thoughts were banished by the urgent necessity of deciding what dress she should wear. These bright weeks of the Parisian spring had given her a first real glimpse into the art of living. 
from the experts who had taught her to subdue the curves of her figure and soften her bright free stare with dusky pencillings, to the skilled purveyors of countless forms of pleasure, the theatres and restaurants, the green and blossoming suburbs, the whole shining shifting spectacle of nights and days. Every sight and sound and word had combined to charm her perceptions and refine her taste. And her growing friendship with Raymond de Chelles had been the most potent of these influences. Shell, at once immensely taken, had not only shown his eagerness to share in the helter-skelter motions of Undine's party, but had given her glimpses of another, still more brilliant existence, that life of the inaccessible Faubourg, of which the first tantalizing hints had but lately reached her. Hitherto she had assumed that Paris existed for the stranger, that its native life was merely an obscure foundation for the dazzling superstructure of hotels and restaurants in which her compatriots disported themselves. But lately she had begun to hear about other American women, the women who had married into the French aristocracy, and who led, in the high-walled houses beyond the Seine, which she had once thought so dull and dingy, a life that made her own seem as undistinguished as the social existence of the Mealy House. Perhaps what most exasperated her was the discovery, in this impenetrable group, of the Miss Wincher who had poisoned her far-off summer at Potash Springs. To recognize her old enemy in the Marquise de Trezac, who so frequently figured in the Parisian Chronicle, was the more irritating to Undine, because her intervening social experiences had caused her to look back on Nettie Wincher as a frumpy girl who wouldn't have had a show in New York. Once more all the accepted values were reversed and it turned out that Miss Wincher had been in possession of some key to success on which Undine had not yet put her hand. To know that others were indifferent to what she had thought important was to cheapen all present pleasure, and turn the whole force of her desires in a new direction. What she wanted for the moment was to linger on in Paris, prolonging her flirtation with Shell, and profiting by it to detach herself from her compatriots, and enter doors closed to their approach and Shell himself attracted her. She thought him as sweet as she had once thought Ralph, whose fastidiousness and refinement were blent in him with a delightful foreign vivacity. His chief value, however, lay in his power of exciting Van Degen's jealousy. She knew enough of French customs to be aware that such devotion as Shell's was not likely to have much practical bearing on her future. But Peter had an alarming way of lapsing into security, and as a spur to his ardour, she knew the value of other men's attentions. It had become Undine's fixed purpose to bring Van Degen to a definite expression of his intentions. The case of Indiana Frusk, whose brilliant marriage the journals of two continents had recently chronicled with unprecedented richness of detail, had made less impression on him than she hoped. He treated it as a comic episode without special bearing on their case, and once, when Undine cited Rolliver's expensive fight for freedom as an instance of the power of love over the most invulnerable natures, had answered carelessly, "'Oh, his first wife was a laundress, I believe.' But all about them couples were unpairing and pairing again with an ease and rapidity that encouraged Undine to bide her time. It was simply a question of making Van Degen want her enough and of not being obliged to abandon the game before he wanted her as much as she meant he should. This was precisely what would happen if she were compelled to leave Paris now. Already the event had shown how right she had been to come abroad. The attention she attracted in Paris had reawakened Van Degen's fancy, and her hold over him was stronger than when they had parted in America. But the next step must be taken with coolness and circumspection and she must not throw away what she had gained by going away at a stage when he was sure of her than she of him. She was still intensely considering these questions, when the door behind her opened, and he came in. She looked up with a frown, and he gave a deprecating laugh. <laughs> Didn't I knock? Don't look so savage. They told me downstairs you'd got back, and I'd just bolted in without thinking." He had widened and purpled since their first encounter five years earlier, but his features had not matured. His face was still the face of a covetous, bullying boy, with a large appetite for primitive satisfactions and a sturdy belief in his intrinsic right to them. 
It was all the more satisfying to Undine's vanity to see his look change at her tone from command to conciliation, and from conciliation to the entreaty of a capriciously treated animal. "'What a ridiculous hour for a visit!' she exclaimed, ignoring his excuse. "'Well, if you disappear like that without a word—' "'I told my maid to telephone you I was going away.' "'You couldn't make time to do it yourself, I suppose.' "'We rushed off suddenly. I'd hardly time to get to the station.' "'You rushed off where, may I ask?' Van Degen still lowered down on her. "'Oh, didn't I tell you? I've been down staying at Shell Chateau in Burgundy.' Her face lit up, and she raised herself eagerly on her elbow. "'It's the most wonderful old house you ever saw, a real castle, with towers and water all round it, and a funny kind of bridge they pull up. Shell said he wanted me to see just how they lived at home, and I did. I saw everything. The tapestries that Louis Cannes gave them, and the family portraits, and the chapel, where their own priest says mass, and they sit by themselves in a balcony with crowns all over it. The priest was a lovely old man. He said he'd give anything to convert me. Do you know, I think there's something very beautiful about the Roman Catholic religion. I've often felt I might have been happier if I'd had some religious influence in my life. She sighed a little, and turned her head away. She flattered herself that she had learned to strike the right note with Van Degen. At this crucial stage he needed a taste of his own methods, a glimpse of the fact that there were women in the world who could get on without him. He continued to gaze down at her sulkily. Were the old people there? You never told me you knew his mother. I don't. They weren't there. But it didn't make a bit of difference, because Raymond sent down a cook from the Lux. Oh, Lord! Van Degen groaned, dropping down on the end of the sofa. Was the cook got down to chaperone you? Undine laughed. <laughs> you talk like Ralph. I had Bertha with me. Bertha! His tone of contempt surprised her. She had supposed that Mrs. Shallum's presence had made the visit perfectly correct. "'You went without knowing his parents, and without their inviting you? Don't you know what that sort of thing means out here? Shell did it to brag about you at his club. He wants to compromise you. That's his game.' "'Do you suppose he does?' A flicker of a smile crossed her lips. "'I'm so unconventional. When I like a man I never stop to think about such things. But I ought to, of course. You're quite right." She looked at Van Degen thoughtfully. At any rate, he's not a married man. Van Degen had got to his feet again and was standing accusingly before her, but as she spoke the blood rose to his neck and ears. "'What difference does that make?' "'It might make a good deal. I see,' she added. How careful I ought to be about going round with you. With me? His face fell at the retort. Then he broke into a laugh. He adored Undine's smartness, which was of precisely the same quality as his own. Oh, that's another thing. You can always trust me to look after you. With your reputation? <laughs> Much obliged. Van Degen smiled. She knew he liked such allusions, and was pleased that she thought him compromising. Oh, I'm as good as gold. You've made a new man of me. Have I? She considered him in silence for a moment. I wonder what you've done to me but make a discontented woman of me, discontented with everything I had before I knew you. The change of tone was thrilling to him. He forgot her mockery, forgot his rival, and sat down at her side, almost in possession of her waist. Look here, he asked. Where are we going to dine tonight? His nearness was not agreeable to Undine, but she liked his free way, his contempt for verbal preliminaries. Ralph's reserves and delicacies, his perpetual desire that he and she should be attuned to the same key, had always vaguely bored her, whereas in Van Degen's manner she felt a hint of the masterful way that had once subdued her in Elmer Moffat. But she drew back, releasing herself. Tonight. I can't. I'm engaged. I know you are. Engaged to me. You promised last Sunday you'd dine with me out of town tonight. How can I remember what I promised last Sunday? Besides, after what you've said, I see I oughtn't to. 
"'What do you mean by what I've said?' "'Why, that I'm imprudent, that people are talking.' He stood up with an angry laugh. "'I suppose you're dining with Shell. Is that it?' "'Is that the way you cross-examine Claire?' "'I don't care a hang what Claire does. I never have.' "'That must, in some ways, be rather convenient for her.' "'Glad you think so. Are you dining with him?' She slowly turned the wedding ring upon her finger. "'You know I'm not married to you. Yet.' He took a random turn through the room. Then he came back and planted himself wrathfully before her. "'Can't you see the man's doing his best to make a fool of you?' She kept her amused gaze on him. "'Does it strike you that it's such an awfully easy thing to do?' The edges of his ears were purple. "'I sometimes think it's easier for these damned little dancing masters than for one of us.' Undine was still smiling up at him, but suddenly her face grew grave. "'What does it matter what I do or don't do, when Ralph has ordered me home next week?' "'Ordered you home?' His face changed. "'Well, you're not going, are you?' "'What's the use of saying such things?' She gave a disenchanted laugh. "'I'm a poor man's wife, and can't do the things my friends do. It's not because Ralph loves me that he wants me back. It's simply because he can't afford to let me stay.' Van Degen's perturbation was increasing. "'But you mustn't go. It's preposterous. Why should a woman like you be sacrificed when a lot of dreary frumps have everything they want? Besides, you can't chuck me like this. Why, we're all to motor down to X next week, and perhaps take a dip into Italy. Oh, Italy, she murmured, on a note of yearning. He was closer now and had her hands. You'd love that, wouldn't you? As far as Venice, anyhow. And then in August there's Trouville. You've never tried Trouville. There's an awfully jolly crowd there, and the motoring's ripping in Normandy. If you say so, I'll take a villa there instead of going back to Newport. And I'll put the sorceress in commission, and you can make up parties and run off whenever you like to Scotland or Norway. He hung above her. Don't dine with Shell tonight. Come with me, and we'll talk things over. And next week we'll run down to Trouville to choose the villa. Undine's heart was beating fast but she felt within her a strange lucid force of resistance. Because of that sense of security she left her hands in Van Degen's. So Mr. Sprague might have felt at the tensest hour of the pure water move. She leaned forward, holding her suitor off by the pressure of her bent back palms. "'Kiss me good-bye, Peter. I sail on Wednesday,' she said. It was the first time she had permitted him a kiss, and as his face darkened down on her, she felt a moment's recoil. But her physical reactions were never very acute. She always vaguely wondered why people made such a fuss, were so violently for or against such demonstrations. A cool spirit within her seemed to watch over and regulate her sensations, and leave her capable of measuring the intensity of those she provoked. She turned to look at the clock. "'You must go now.' I shall be hours late for dinner. Go? After that? He held her fast. Kiss me again, he commanded. It was wonderful how cool she felt, how easily she could slip out of his grasp. Any man could be managed like a child if he were really in love with one. Don't be a goose, Peter. Do you suppose I'd have kissed you if— If what? What, what? He mimicked her ecstatically, not listening. She saw that if she wished to make him hear her, she must put more distance between them, and she rose and moved across the room. From the fireplace she turned to add, "'If we hadn't been saying good-bye?' "'Good-bye? Now? What's the use of talking like that?' He jumped up and followed her. "'Look here, Undine, I'll do anything on earth you want, only don't talk of going. If you'll only stay, I'll make it all as straight and square as you please. I'll get Bertha Shallum to stop over with you for the summer. I'll take a house at Trouville and make my wife come out there. Hang it, she shall, if only you say so. Only be a little good to me. Still she stood before him without speaking, aware that her implacable brows and narrowed lips would hold him off as long as she chose. What's the matter, Undine? Why don't you answer? 
You know you can't go back to that deadly dry rot. She swept about on him with indignant eyes. I can't go on with my present life either. It's hateful, as hateful as the other. If I don't go home, I've got to decide on something different. What do you mean by something different? She was silent, and he insisted. Are you really thinking of marrying Shell? She started as if he had surprised a secret. I'll never forgive you if you speak of it. Good Lord! Good Lord! he groaned. She remained motionless, with lowered lids, and he went up to her and pulled her about so that she faced him. Undine, honor bright, do you think he'll marry you? She looked at him with a sudden hardness in her eyes. I really can't discuss such things with you. Oh, for the Lord's sake, don't take that tone. I don't half know what I'm saying. But you mustn't throw yourself away a second time. I'll do anything you want. I swear I will. A knock on the door sent them apart, and a servant entered with a telegram. Undine turned away to the window with the narrow blue slip. She was glad of the interruption. The sense of what she had at stake made her want to pause a moment and to draw breath. The message was a long cable, signed with Laura Fairford's name. It told her that Ralph had been taken suddenly ill with pneumonia, that his condition was serious, and that the doctors advised his wife's immediate return. Undine had to read the words over two or three times to get them into her crowded mind, and even after she had done so, she needed more time to see their bearing on her own situation. If the message had concerned her boy, her brain would have acted more quickly. She had never troubled herself over the possibility of Paul's falling ill in her absence, but she understood now that if the cable had been about him, she would have rushed to the earliest steamer. With Ralph it was different. Ralph was always perfectly well. She could not picture him as being suddenly at death's door and in need of her. Probably his mother and sister had had a panic. They were always full of sentimental terrors. The next moment an angry suspicion flashed across her. What if the cable were a device of the Marvell women to bring her back? Perhaps it had been sent with Ralph's connivance. No doubt Bowen had written home about her. Washington Square had received some monstrous report of her doings. Yes, the cable was clearly an echo of Laura's letter. Mother and daughter had cooked it up to spoil her pleasure. Once the thought had occurred to her, it struck root in her mind and began to throw out giant branches. Van Degen followed her to the window his face still flushed and working. "'What's the matter?' he asked, as she continued to stare silently at the telegram. She crumpled the strip of paper in her hand. If only she had been alone, had had a chance to think out her answers. "'What on earth's the matter?' he repeated. "'Oh, nothing. Nothing.' "'Nothing? When you're as white as a sheet?' "'Am I?' She gave a slight laugh. It's only a cable from home. Ralph? She hesitated. No. Laura. What the devil is she cabling you about? She says Ralph wants me. Now? At once? At once. Van Degen laughed impatiently. Why don't he tell you so himself? What business is it of Laura Fairford's? Undine's gesture implied a... What indeed? Is that all she says? She hesitated again. Yes, that's all. As she spoke, she tossed the telegram into the basket beneath the writing table. As if I didn't have to go anyhow, she exclaimed. With an aching clearness of vision, she saw what lay before her. The hurried preparations, the long, tedious voyage on a steamer chosen at haphazard, the arrival in the deadly July heat, and the relapse into all the insufferable daily fag of nursery and kitchen. She saw it, and her imagination recoiled. Van Degen's eyes still hung on her. She guessed that he was intensely engaged in trying to follow what was passing through her mind. Presently he came up to her again, no longer perilous and importunate, but awkwardly tender, ridiculously moved by her distress. Undine, listen. Won't you let me make it all right for you to stay?" Her heart began to beat more quickly, and she let him come close, meeting his eyes coldly, but without anger. 
What do you call making it all right? Paying my bills? Don't you see that's what I hate, and will never let myself be dragged into again? She laid her hand on his arm. The time has come when I must be sensible, Peter. That's why we must say good-bye. Do you mean to tell me you're going back to Ralph? She paused a moment, then she murmured between her lips, I shall never go back to him. Then you do mean to marry Shell? I've told you we must say good-bye. I've got to look out for my future. He stood before her, irresolute, tormented, his lazy mind and impatient senses laboring with a problem beyond their power. Ain't I here to look out for your future? he said at last. No one shall look out for it in the way you mean. I'd rather never see you again. He gave her a baffled stare. Oh, damn it, if that's how you feel. He turned and flung away toward the door. She stood motionless where he left her, every nerve strung to the highest pitch of watchfulness. As she stood there, the scene about her stamped itself on her brain with the sharpest precision. She was aware of the fading of the summer light outside, of the movements of her maid, who was laying out her dinner dress in the room beyond, and of the fact that the tea roses on her writing table, shaken by Van Degen's tread, were dropping their petals all over Ralph's letter, and down on the crumpled telegram which she could see through the trellised sides of the scrap basket. In another moment Van Degen would be gone. Worse yet, while he wavered in the doorway, the Shallums and Shell, after vainly awaiting her, might dash back from the bois and break in on them. These and other chances rose before her, urging her to action. But she held fast, immovable, unwavering, a proud yet plaintive image of renunciation. Van Degen's hand was on the door. He half opened it, and then turned back. "'That's all you've got to say, then?' "'That's all.' He jerked the door open and passed out. She saw him stop in the anteroom to pick up his hat and stick, his heavy figure silhouetted against the glare of the wall-lights. A ray of the same light fell on her where she stood in the unlit sitting-room, and her reflection bloomed out like a flower from the mirror that faced her. She looked at the image and waited. Van Degen put his hat on his head and slowly opened the door into the outer hall. Then he turned abruptly, his bulk eclipsing her reflection as he plunged back into the room and came up to her. "'I'll do anything you say, Undine. I'll do anything in God's world to keep you.' She turned her eyes from the mirror and let them rest on his face, which looked as small and withered as an old man's, with a lower lip that trembled queerly. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 The spring in New York proceeded through more than its usual extremes of temperature to the threshold of a sultry June. Ralph Marvell, wearily bent to his task, felt the fantastic humors of the weather as only one more incoherence in the general chaos of his case. It was strange enough, after four years of marriage, to find himself again in his old brown room in Washington Square. It was hardly there that he had expected Pegasus to land him, and like a man returning to the scenes of his childhood, he found everything on a much smaller scale than he had imagined. Had the Dagonet boundaries really narrowed, or had the breach in the walls of his own life let in a wider vision? Certainly there had come to be other differences between his present and his former self than that embodied in the presence of his little boy in the next room. Paul, in fact, was now the chief link between Ralph and his past. Concerning his son, he still felt and thought, in a general way, in the terms of the Dagonet tradition. He still wanted to implant in Paul some of the reserves and discriminations which divided that tradition from the new spirit of limitless concession. But for himself it was different. Since his transaction with Moffat, he had had the sense of living under a new dispensation. He was not sure that it was any worse than the other, but then he was no longer very sure about anything. Perhaps this growing indifference was merely the reaction from a long nervous strain. That his mother and sister thought it so was shown by the way in which they mutely watched and hovered. Their discretion was like the hushed tread about a sick-bed. They permitted themselves no criticism of Undine. 
he was asked no awkward questions, subjected to no ill-timed sympathy. They simply took him back, on his own terms, into the life he had left them to, and their silence had none of those subtle implications of disapproval which may be so much more wounding than speech. For a while he received a weekly letter from Undine. Vague and disappointing though they were, these missives helped him through the days, but he looked forward to them rather as a pretext for replies than for their actual contents. Undine was never at a loss for the spoken word. Ralph had often wondered at her verbal range and her fluent use of terms outside the current vocabulary. She had certainly not picked these up in books, since she never opened one. They seemed rather like some odd transmission of her preaching grandparents' oratory. But in her brief and colourless letters she repeated the same bald statements in the same few terms. She was well, she had been round with Bertha Shallum, she had dined with the Jim Driscolls or May Beringer or Dickie Bowles, the weather was too lovely or too awful. Such was the gist of her news. On the last page she hoped Paul was well and sent him a kiss, but she never made a suggestion concerning his care or asked a question about his pursuits. One could only infer that, knowing in what good hands he was, she judged such solicitude superfluous, and it was thus that Ralph put the matter to his mother. "'Of course she's not worrying about the boy. Why should she? She knows that with you and Laura he's as happy as a king.' To which Mrs. Marvell would answer gravely, "'When you write, be sure to say I shan't put on his thinner flannels as long as this east wind lasts.' As for her husband's welfare, Undine's sole allusion to it consisted in the invariable expression of the hope that he was getting along all right. The phrase was always the same, and Ralph learned to know just how far down the third page to look for it. In a postscript she sometimes asked him to tell her mother about a new way of doing hair or cutting a skirt, and this was usually the most eloquent passage of the letter. What satisfaction he extracted from these communications he would have found it hard to say, yet when they did not come he missed them hardly less than if they had given him all he craved. Sometimes the mere act of holding the blue or mauve sheet and breathing its scent was like holding his wife's hand and being enveloped in her fresh young fragrance. The sentimental disappointment vanished in the penetrating physical sensation. In other moods it was enough to trace the letters of the first line, and the last, for the desert of perfunctory phrases between the two to vanish, leaving him only the vision of their interlaced names, as of a mystic bond which her own hand had tied. Or else he saw her closely, palpably before him, as she sat at her writing-table, frowning and a little flushed, her bent nape showing the light on her hair, her short lip pulled up by the effort of composition, and this picture had the violent reality of dream-images on the verge of waking. At other times, as he read her letter, he felt simply that at least in the moment of writing it she had been with him. But in one of the last she had said, to excuse a bad blot and an incoherent sentence. Everybody's talking to me at once, and I don't know what I'm writing. That letter he had thrown into the fire. After the first few weeks the letters came less and less regularly. At the end of two months they ceased. Ralph had got into the habit of watching for them on the days when a foreign post was due, and as the weeks went by without a sign, he began to invent excuses for leaving the office earlier and hurrying back to Washington Square to search the letter-box for a big tinted envelope with a straggling blotted superscription. Undine's departure had given him a momentary sense of liberation. At that stage in their relations any change would have brought relief. But now that she was gone, he knew she could never really go. Though his feeling for her had changed, it still ruled his life. If he saw her in her weakness, he felt her in her power, the power of youth and physical radiance that clung to his disenchanted memories as the scent she used clung to her letters. Looking back at their four years of marriage, he began to ask himself if he had done all he could to draw her half-formed spirit from its sleep. Had he not expected too much at first, and grown too indifferent in the sequel? 
After all, she was still in the toy age, and perhaps the very extravagance of his love had retarded her growth, helped to imprison her in a little circle of frivolous illusions. But the last months had made a man of him, and when she came back he would know how to lift her to the height of his experience. So he would reason, day by day, as he hastened back to Washington Square. But when he opened the door, and his first glance at the hall table showed him there was no letter there, his illusions shriveled down to their weak roots. She had not written. She did not mean to write. He and the boy were no longer a part of her life. When she came back, everything would be as it had been before, with the dreary difference that she had tasted new pleasures, and that their absence would take the savour from all he had to give her. Then the coming of another foreign male would lift his hopes, and as he hurried home he would imagine new reasons for expecting a letter. Week after week he swung between the extremes of hope and dejection, and at last, when the strain had become unbearable, he cabled her. The answer ran, Very well, best love, writing. But the promised letter never came. He went on steadily with his work. He even passed through a phase of exaggerated energy. But his baffled youth fought in him for air. Was this to be the end? Was he to wear his life out in useless drudgery? The plain prose of it, of course, was that the economic situation remained unchanged by the sentimental catastrophe, and that he must go on working for his wife and child. But at any rate, as it was mainly for Paul that he would henceforth work, it should be on his own terms, and according to his inherited notions of straightness. He would never again engage in any transaction resembling his compact with Moffat. Even now he was not sure that there had been anything crooked in that, but the fact of his having instinctively referred the point to Mr. Spragg, rather than to his grandfather, implied a presumption against it. His partners were quick to profit by his sudden spurt of energy, and his work grew no lighter. He was not only the youngest and most recent member of the firm, but the one who had so far added least to the volume of its business. His hours were the longest, his absences, as summer approached, the least frequent, and the most grudgingly accorded. No doubt his associates knew that he was pressed for money, and could not risk a break. They worked him, and he was aware of it, and submitted because he dared not lose his job. But the long hours of mechanical drudgery were telling on his active body and undisciplined nerves. He had begun too late to subject himself to the persistent mortification of spirit and flesh which is a condition of the average business life, and after the long, dull days in the office the evenings at his grandfather's whist-table did not give him the counter-stimulus he needed. Almost every one had gone out of town, but now and then Miss Ray came to dine, and Ralph, seated beneath the family portraits and opposite the desiccated Harriet, who had already faded to the semblance of one of her own great aunts, listened languidly to the kind of talk that the originals might have exchanged about the same table when New York gentility centred in the battery and the bowling green. Mr. Dagonet was always pleasant to see and hear, but his sarcasms were growing faint and recondite. They had as little bearing on life as the humours of a restoration comedy. As for Mrs. Marvell and Miss Ray, they seemed to the young man even more spectrally remote. Hardly anything that mattered to him existed for them, and their prejudices reminded him of signposts warning off trespassers who have long since ceased to intrude. Now and then he dined at his club, and went on to the theatre with some young men of his own age. But he left them afterward, half vexed with himself for not being in the humour to prolong the adventure. There were moments when he would have liked to affirm his freedom in however commonplace a way, moments when the vulgarest way would have seemed the most satisfying. But he always ended by walking home alone, and tiptoeing upstairs through the sleeping house, lest he should wake his boy. On Saturday afternoons, when the business world was hurrying to the country for golf and tennis, he stayed in town, and took Paul to see the Spraggs. Several times since his wife's departure he had tried to bring about closer relations with his own family and Undine's, and the ladies of Washington Square, in their eagerness to meet his wishes, had made various friendly advances to Mrs. Spragg. But they were met by a mute resistance, which made Ralph suspect that Undine's strictures on his family had taken root in her mother's brooding mind, and he gave up the struggle to bring together what had been so effectually put asunder. 
If he regretted his lack of success, it was chiefly because he was so sorry for the Spraggs. Soon after Undine's marriage, they had abandoned their polychrome suite at the Stentorian, and since then their peregrinations had carried them through half the hotels of the metropolis. Undine, who had early discovered her mistake in thinking hotel life fashionable, had tried to persuade her parents to take a house of their own. But though they refrained from taxing her with inconsistency, they did not act on her suggestion. Mrs. Spragg seemed to shrink from the thought of going back to housekeeping, and Ralph suspected that she depended on the transit from hotel to hotel as the one element of variety in her life. As for Mr. Spragg, it was impossible to imagine any one in whom the domestic sentiments were more completely unlocalized and disconnected from any fixed habits. And he was probably aware of his changes of abode chiefly as they obliged him to ascend from the subway, or descend from the elevated, a few blocks higher up or lower down. Neither husband nor wife complained to Ralph of their frequent displacements, or assigned to them any cause save the vague one of guessing they could do better. But Ralph noticed that the decreasing luxury of their life synchronized with Undine's growing demands for money. During the last few months they had transferred themselves to the Malibran, a tall, narrow structure resembling a grain elevator divided into cells, where linoleum and lincrusta simulated the stucco and marble of the stentorian, and fagged businessmen and their families consumed the watery stews dispensed by coloured help in the grey twilight of a basement dining-room. Mrs. Spragg had no sitting-room, and Paul and his father had to be received in one of the long public parlours, between ladies seated at rickety desks in the throes of correspondence, and groups of listlessly conversing residents and callers. The Spraggs were intensely proud of their grandson, and Ralph perceived that they would have liked to see Paul charging uproariously from group to group, and thrusting his bright curls and cherubic smile upon the general attention. The fact that the boy preferred to stand between his grandfather's knees, and play with Mr. Spragg's Masonic emblem, or dangle his legs from the arm of Mrs. Spragg's chair, seemed to his grandparents evidence of ill health, or undue repression, and he was subjected by Mrs. Spragg to searching inquiries as to how his food set, and whether he didn't think his pauper was too strict with him. A more embarrassing problem was raised by the surprise, in the shape of peanut candy or chocolate creams, which he was invited to hunt for in Grandma's pockets, and which Ralph had to confiscate on the way home, lest the dietary rules of Washington Square should be too visibly infringed. Sometimes Ralph found Mrs. Heeney, ruddy and jovial, seated in the armchair opposite Mrs. Spragg, and regaling her with selections from a new batch of clippings. During Undine's illness of the previous winter, Mrs. Heeney had become a familiar figure to Paul, who had learned to expect almost as much from her bag as from his grandmother's pockets, so that the intemperate Saturdays at the Malibran were usually followed by languid and abstemious Sundays in Washington Square. Mrs. Heeney, being unaware of this sequel to her bounties, formed the habit of appearing regularly on Saturdays, and while she chatted with his grandmother the little boy was encouraged to scatter the grimy carpet with face-creams and bunches of clippings in his thrilling quest for the sweets at the bottom of her bag. "'I declare, if he ain't in just as much of a hurry for everything as his mother!' she exclaimed one day in her rich rolling voice, and stooping to pick up a long strip of newspaper which Paul had flung aside, she added, as she smoothed it out, "'I guess if he was a little mite older he'd be better pleased with this and the candy. It's the very thing I was trying to find for you the other day, Mrs. Spragg,' she went on, holding the bit of paper at arm's length, and she began to read out, with a loudness proportioned to the distance between her eyes and the text. "'With two such sprinters as Pete Van Degen and Dickie Bowles to set the pace, it's no wonder the New York set in Paris has struck a livelier gait than ever this spring. It's a high-pressure season, and no mistake, and no one lags behind less than the fascinating Mrs. Ralph Marvell, who was to be seen daily and nightly in all the smartest restaurants and naughtiest theatres, with so many devoted swains in attendance that the rival beauties of both worlds are said to be making catty comments. But then Mrs. Marvell's gowns are almost as good as her looks, and how can you expect the other women to stand for such a monopoly? To escape the strain of these visits, Ralph once or twice tried the experiment of leaving Paul with his grandparents and calling for him in the late afternoon. 
but one day, on re-entering the Malibran, he was met by a small abashed figure clad in a kaleidoscopic tartan and a green velvet cap with a silver thistle. After this experience of the surprises of which Grandma was capable when she had a chance to take Paul shopping, Ralph did not again venture to leave his son, and their subsequent Saturdays were passed together in the sultry gloom of the Malibran. Conversation with the Spraggs was almost impossible. Ralph could talk with his father-in-law in his office, but in the hotel parlour Mr. Spragg sat in a ruminating silence, broken only by the emission of an occasional, "'Well, well,' addressed to his grandson. As for Mrs. Spragg, her son-in-law could not remember having had a sustained conversation with her since the distant day when he had first called at the Stentorian, and had been entertained, in Undine's absence, by her astonished mother. The shock of that encounter had moved Mrs. Spragg to eloquence, but Ralph's entrance into the family, without making him seem less of a stranger, appeared once for all to have relieved her of the obligation of finding something to say to him. The one question she invariably asked, "'You heard from Undy?' had been relatively easy to answer, while his wife's infrequent letters continued to arrive. But a Saturday came when he felt the blood rise to his temples, as, for the fourth consecutive week, he stammered out, under the snapping eyes of Mrs. Heeney, "'No, not by this post, either. I begin to think I must have lost a letter.' And it was then that Mr. Spragg, who had sat silently looking up at the ceiling, cut short his wife's exclamation by an inquiry about real estate in the Bronx. After that, Ralph noticed, Mrs. Spragg never again renewed her question and he understood that his father-in-law had guessed his embarrassment, and wished to spare it. Ralph had never thought of looking for any delicacy of feeling under Mr. Spragg's large, lazy irony, and the incident drew the two men nearer together. Mrs. Spragg, for her part, was certainly not delicate, but she was simple and without malice, and Ralph liked her for her silent acceptance of her diminished state. Sometimes, as he sat between the lonely, primitive old couple, he wondered from what source Undine's voracious ambitions had been drawn. All she cared for, and attached importance to, was as remote from her parents' conception of life as her impatient greed from their passive stoicism. One hot afternoon toward the end of June, Ralph suddenly wondered if Claire Van Degen were still in town. She had dined in Washington Square some ten days earlier, and he remembered her saying that she had sent the children down to Long Island, but that she herself meant to stay on in town till the heat grew unbearable. She hated her big showy place on Long Island. She was tired of the spring trip to London and Paris, where one met at every turn the faces one had grown sick of seeing all winter, and she declared that in the early summer New York was the only place in which one could escape from New Yorkers. She put the case amusingly, and it was like her to take up any attitude that went against the habits of her set but she lived at the mercy of her moods, and one could never tell how long any one of them would rule her. As he sat in his office, with the noise and glare of the endless afternoon rising up in hot waves from the street, there wandered into Ralph's mind a vision of her shady drawing-room. All day it hung before him, like the mirage of a spring before a dusty traveller. He felt a positive thirst for her presence, for the sound of her voice, the wide spaces and luxurious silences surrounding her. It was perhaps because, on that particular day, a spiral pain was twisting around in the back of his head, and digging in a little deeper with each twist, and because the figures on the balance-sheet before him were hopping about like black imps in an infernal forward and back, that the picture hung there so persistently. It was a long time since he had wanted anything as much as, at that particular moment, he wanted to be with Claire, and hear her voice. And as soon as he had ground out the day's measure of work, he rang up the Van Degen place, and learned that she was still in town. The lowered awnings of her inner drawing-room cast a luminous shadow on old cabinets and consoles, and on the pale flowers scattered here and there in vases of bronze and porcelain. Claire's taste was as capricious as her moods, and the rest of the house was not in harmony with this room. There was, in particular, another drawing-room, which she now described as Peter's creation, but which Ralph knew to be partly hers, a heavily decorated apartment, where Popple's portrait of her throned over a waste of gilt furniture. 
It was characteristic that to-day she had had Ralph shown in by another way, and that as she had spared him the polyphonic drawing-room, so she had skilfully adapted her own appearance to her soberer background. She sat near the window, reading, in a clear, cool dress, and at his entrance she merely slipped a finger between the pages and looked up at him. Her way of receiving him made him feel that her restlessness and stridency were as unlike her genuine self as the gilded drawing-room, and that this quiet creature was the only real Clare, the Clare who had once been so nearly his, and who seemed to want him to know that she had never wholly been any one else's. "'Why didn't you let me know you were still in town?' he asked, as he sat down in the sofa-corner near her chair. Her dark smile deepened. I hoped you'd come and see. One never knows with you. He was looking about the room with a kind of confused pleasure in its pale shadows and spots of dark rich color. The old lacquer screen behind Clare's head looked like a lustreless black pool with gold leaves floating on it, and another piece, a little table at her elbow, had the brown bloom and the pear-like curves of an old violin. I like to be here, Ralph said. She did not make the mistake of asking, "'Then why do you never come?' Instead she turned away, and drew an inner curtain across the window to shut out the sunlight, which was beginning to slant in under the awning. The mere fact of her not answering, and the final touch of well-being which her gesture gave, reminded him of other summer days they had spent together, long rambling boy and girl days in the hot woods and sunny fields, when they had never thought of talking to each other unless there was something they particularly wanted to say. His tired fancy strayed off for a second to the thought of what it would have been like to come back, at the end of the day, to such a sweet community of silence. But his mind was too crowded with importunate facts for any lasting view of visionary distances. The thought faded, and he merely felt how restful it was to have her near. "'I'm glad you stayed in town. You must let me come again,' he said. "'I suppose you can't always get away,' she answered, and she began to listen, with grave, intelligent eyes, to his description of his tedious days. With her eyes on him he felt the exquisite relief of talking about himself as he had not dared to talk to any one since his marriage. He would not for the world have confessed his discouragement, his consciousness of incapacity. To Undine and in Washington Square any hint of failure would have been taken as a criticism of what his wife demanded of him. Only to Clare Van Degen could he cry out his present despondency and his loathing of the interminable task ahead. A man doesn't know till he tries it how killing uncongenial work is, and how it destroys the power of doing what one's fit for, even if there's time for both. But there's Paul to be looked out for, and I daren't chuck my job. I'm in mortal terror of its chucking me." Little by little he slipped into a detailed recital of all his lesser worries, the most recent of which was his experience with the Lipscombs, who after a two-month's tenancy of the West End Avenue house, had decamped without paying their rent. Clare laughed contemptuously. Yes, I heard he'd come to grief and been suspended from the stock exchange, and I see in the papers that his wife's retort has been to sue for a divorce. Ralph knew that, like all their clan, his cousin regarded a divorce suit as a vulgar and unnecessary way of taking the public into one's confidence. His mind flashed back to the family feast in Washington Square in celebration of his engagement. He recalled his grandfather's chance allusion to Mrs. Lipscomb, and Undine's answer fluted out on her highest note. "'Oh, I guess he'll get a divorce pretty soon. He's been a disappointment to her.' Ralph could still hear the horrified murmur with which his mother had rebuked his laugh. For he had laughed, had thought Undine's speech fresh and natural. Now he felt the ironic rebound of her words. Heaven knew he had been a disappointment to her. And what was there in her own feeling, or in her inherited prejudices, to prevent her seeking the same redress as Mabel Lipscomb? He wondered if the same thought were in his cousin's mind. They began to talk of other things books, pictures, plays, and one by one the closed doors opened, and light was let into dusty shuttered places. Clare's mind was neither keen nor deep. 
Ralph, in the past, had often smiled at her rash ardours and vague intensities. But she had his own range of illusions, and a great gift of momentary understanding, and he had so long beaten his thoughts out against a blank wall of incomprehension that her sympathy seemed full of insight. She began by a question about his writing, but the subject was distasteful to him, and he turned the talk to a new book in which she had been interested. She knew enough of it to slip in the right word here and there, and thence they wandered on to kindred topics. Under the warmth of her attention his torpid ideas awoke again, and his eyes took their fill of pleasure as she leaned forward, her thin brown hands clasped on her knees, and her eager face reflecting all his feelings. There was a moment when the two currents of sensation were merged in one, and he began to feel confusedly that he was young and she was kind, and that there was nothing he would like better than to go on sitting there, not much caring what she said or how he answered, if only she would let him look at her, and give him one of her thin brown hands to hold. Then the corkscrew in the back of his head dug into him again with a deeper thrust, and she seemed suddenly to recede to a great distance, and be divided from him by a fog of pain. The fog lifted after a minute, but it left him queerly remote from her, from the cool room, with its scents and shadows, and from all the objects which, a moment before, had been so sharply impinged upon his senses. It was as though he looked at it all through a rain-blurred pane, against which his hand would strike if he held it out to her. That impression passed also, and he found himself thinking how tired he was, and how little anything mattered. He recalled the unfinished piece of work on his desk, and for a moment he had the odd illusion that it was there before him. She exclaimed, "'But are you going?' And her exclamation made him aware that he had left his seat and was standing in front of her. He fancied there was some kind of appeal in her brown eyes, but she was so dim and far off that he couldn't be sure of what she wanted, and the next moment he found himself shaking hands with her, and heard her saying something kind and cold about its having been so nice to see him. Halfway up the stairs little Paul, shining and rosy from supper, lurked in ambush for his evening game. Ralph was fond of stooping down to let the boy climb up his outstretched arms to his shoulders, but to-day, as he did so, Paul's hug seemed to crush him in a vice, and the shout of welcome that accompanied it racked his ears like an explosion of steam-whistles. The queer distance between himself and the rest of the world was annihilated again. Everything stared and glared and clutched him. He tried to turn away his face from the child's hot kisses, and as he did so he caught sight of a mauve envelope among the hats and sticks on the hall table. Instantly he passed Paul over to his nurse, stammered out a word about being tired, and sprang up the long flights to his study. The pain in his head had stopped, but his hands trembled as he tore open the envelope. Within it was a second letter bearing a French stamp, and addressed to himself. It looked like a business communication, and had apparently been sent to Undine's hotel in Paris, and forwarded to him by her hand. "'Another bill,' he reflected grimly, as he threw it aside, and felt in the outer envelope for her letter. There was nothing there, and after a first sharp pang of disappointment he picked up the enclosure and opened it. Inside was a lithographed circular, headed Confidential, and bearing the Paris address of a firm of private detectives, who undertook, in conditions of attested and inviolable discretion, to investigate delicate situations, look up doubtful antecedents, and furnish reliable evidence of misconduct, all on the most reasonable terms. For a long time Ralph sat and stared at this document. Then he began to laugh, and tossed it into the scrap-basket. After that, with a groan, he dropped his head against the edge of his writing-table. End of chapter 21「XXII」When he woke, the first thing he remembered was the fact of having cried. He could not think how he had come to be such a fool. He hoped to heaven no one had seen him. He supposed he must have been worrying about the unfinished piece of work at the office. Where was it, by the way, he wondered? Why, 
Where he had left it the day before, of course. What a ridiculous thing to worry about! But it seemed to follow him about like a dog. He said to himself that he must get up presently and go down to the office. Presently, when he could open his eyes. Just now there was a dead weight on them. He tried one after another in vain. The effort set him weakly trembling, and he wanted to cry again. Nonsense! He must get out of bed. He stretched his arms out, trying to reach something to pull himself up, but everything slipped away and evaded him. It was like trying to catch at bright, short waves. Then suddenly his fingers clasped themselves about something firm and warm. A hand! A hand that gave him back his pressure! The relief was inexpressible. He lay still and let the hand hold him, while mentally he went through the motions of getting up and beginning to dress. So indistinct were the boundaries between thought and action that he really felt himself moving about the room, in a queer disembodied way, as one treads the air in sleep. Then he felt the bedclothes over him, and the pillows under his head. "'I must get up,' he said, and pulled at the hand. It pressed him down again, down into a dim, deep pool of sleep. He lay there for a long time, in a silent blackness far below light and sound. Then he gradually floated to the surface, with the buoyancy of a dead body. But his body had never been more alive. Jagged strokes of pain tore through it, hands dragged at it with nails that bit like teeth. They wound thongs about him, bound him, tied weights to him, tried to pull him down with them. But still he floated, floated, danced on the fiery waves of pain, with barbed light pouring down on him from an arrowy sky. Charmed intervals of rest, blue sailings on melodious seas, alternated with the anguish. He became a leaf on the air, a feather on a current, a straw on the tide, the spray of the wave spinning itself to sunshine as the wave toppled over into gulfs of blue. He woke on a stony beach, his legs and arms still lashed to his sides and the thongs cutting into him. But the fierce sky was hidden, and hidden by his own languid lids. He felt the ecstasy of decreasing pain, and courage came to him to open his eyes and look about him. The beach was his own bed, the tempered light lay on familiar things, and some one was moving about in a shadowy way between bed and window. He was thirsty, and some one gave him a drink. His pillow burned, and some one turned the cool side out. His brain was clear enough now for him to understand that he was ill, and to want to talk about it. But his tongue hung in his throat like a clapper in a bell. He must wait till the rope was pulled. So time and life stole back on him, and his thoughts labored weakly with dim fears. Slowly he cleared a way through them, adjusted himself to his strange state, and found out that he was in his own room, in his grandfather's house, that alternating with the white-capped faces about him were those of his mother and sister, and that in a few days, if he took his beef tea and didn't fret, Paul would be brought up from Long Island, whither, on account of the great heat, he had been carried off by Claire Van Degen. No one named Undine to him, and he did not speak of her. But one day as he lay in bed in the summer twilight, he had a vision of a moment, a long way behind him, at the beginning of his illness, it must have been, when he had called out for her in his anguish, and some one had said, "'She's coming. She'll be here next week.' Could it be that next week was not yet here? He supposed that illness robbed one of all sense of time, and he lay still as if in ambush, watching his scattered memories come out one by one and join themselves together. If he watched long enough he was sure he should recognize one that fitted into his picture of the day when he had asked for Undine. And at length a face came out of the twilight, a freckled face, benevolently bent over him under a starched cap. He had not seen the face for a long time, but suddenly it took shape and fitted itself into the picture. Laura Fairford sat nearby, a book on her knee. At the sound of his voice she looked up. What was the name of the first nurse? The first? The one that went away. Oh, Miss Hicks, you mean? How long is it since she went? It 
must be three weeks. She had another case. He thought this over carefully. Then he spoke again. Call Undine. She made no answer, and he repeated irritably, Why don't you call her? I want to speak with her. Mrs. Fairford laid down her book and came to him. She's not here. Just now. He dealt with this also, laboriously. You mean she's out? She's not in the house? I mean she hasn't come yet. As she spoke, Ralph felt a sudden strength and hardness in his brain and body. Everything in him became as clear as noon. But it was before Miss Hicks left that you told me you'd sent for her, and that she'd be here the following week. And you say Miss Hicks has been gone three weeks. This was what he had worked out in his head, and what he meant to say to his sister. But something seemed to snap shut in his throat, and he closed his eyes without speaking. Even when Mr. Spragg came to see him, he said nothing. They talked about his illness, about the hot weather, about the rumors that Harmon B. Driscoll was again threatened with indictment, and then Mr. Spragg pulled himself out of his chair and said, I presume you'll call round at the office before you leave the city. Oh, yes, as soon as I'm up, Ralph answered. They understood each other. Clare had urged him to come down to Long Island to complete his convalescence there, but he preferred to stay in Washington Square till he should be strong enough for the journey to the Adirondacks, whither Laura had already preceded him with Paul. He did not want to see any one but his mother and grandfather till his legs could carry him to Mr. Spragg's office. It was an oppressive day in mid-August, with a yellow mist of heat in the sky, when at last he entered the big office building. Swirls of dust lay on the mosaic floor, and a stale smell of decayed fruit and salt air and steaming asphalt filled the place like a fog. As he shot up in the elevator, someone slapped him on the back, and turning he saw Elmer Moffat at his side, smooth and rubicund under a new straw hat. Moffat was loudly glad to see him. I haven't laid eyes on you for months. At the old stand still? So am I, he added, as Ralph assented. Hope to see you there again some day. Don't forget it's my turn this time. Glad if I can be any use to you. So long. Ralph's weak bones ached under his handshake. How's Mrs. Marvell? He turned back from his landing to call out. And Ralph answered, Thanks. She's very well. Mr. Spragg sat alone in his murky inner office, the fly-blown engraving of Daniel Webster above his head, and the congested scrap-basket beneath his feet. He looked fagged and sallow, like the day. Ralph sat down on the other side of the desk. For a moment his throat contracted, as it had when he had tried to question his sister. Then he asked, "'Where's Undine?' Mr. Spragg glanced at the calendar that hung from a hat-peg on the door. Then he released the Masonic emblem from his grasp, drew out his watch, and consulted it critically. "'If the train's on time, I presume she's somewhere between Chicago and Omaha round about now.' Ralph stared at him, wondering if the heat had gone to his head. "'I don't understand. "'The twentieth century is generally considered the best route to Dakota,' explained Mr. Spragg, who pronounced the word route. Do you mean to say Undine's in the United States? Mr. Spragg's lower lip groped for the phantom toothpick. Why, let me see. Hasn't Dakota been a state a year or two now? Oh, God! Ralph cried, pushing his chair back violently and striding across the narrow room. As he turned, Mr. Spragg stood up and advanced a few steps. He had given up the quest for the toothpick and his drawn-in lips were no more than a narrow depression in his beard. He stood before Ralph, absently shaking the loose change in his trouser pockets. Ralph felt the same hardness and lucidity that had come to him when he had heard his sister's answer. "'She's gone, you mean. Left me. With another man?' Mr. Spragg drew himself up with a kind of slouching majesty. "'My daughter is not in that style. I understand Undine thinks there have been mistakes on both sides. She considers the tie was formed too hastily. I believe desertion is the usual plea in such cases." Ralph stared about him, 
hardly listening. He did not resent his father-in-law's tone. In a dim way he guessed that Mr. Spragg was suffering hardly less than himself. But nothing was clear to him, save the monstrous fact suddenly upheaved in his path. His wife had left him, and the plan for her evasion had been made and executed while he lay helpless. She had seized the opportunity of his illness to keep him in ignorance of her design. The humour of it suddenly struck him, and he laughed. "'Do you mean to tell me that Undine's divorcing me?' "'I presume that's her plan,' Mr. Spragg admitted. "'For desertion!' Ralph pursued, still laughing. His father-in-law hesitated a moment. Then he answered, "'You've always done all you could for my daughter. There wasn't any other plea she could think of. She presumed this would be the most agreeable to your family.' "'It was good of her to think of that.' Mr. Spragg's only comment was a sigh. "'Does she imagine I won't fight it?' Ralph broke out with sudden passion. His father-in-law looked at him thoughtfully. "'I presume you realize it ain't easy to change Undine once she's set on a thing.' "'Perhaps not. But if she really means to apply for a divorce, I can make it a little less easy for her to get.' "'That's so.' Mr. Spragg conceded. He turned back to his revolving chair, and, seating himself in it, began to drum on the desk with cigar-stained fingers. "'And by God I will!' Ralph thundered. Anger was the only emotion in him now. He had been fooled, cheated, made a mock of, but the score was not settled yet. He turned back and stood before Mr. Spragg. "'I suppose she's gone with Van Degen?' My daughter's gone alone, sir. I saw her off at the station. I understood she was to join a lady friend. At every point Ralph felt his hold slip off the surface of his father-in-law's impervious fatalism. Does she suppose Van Degen's going to marry her? Undine didn't mention her future plans to me. After a moment Mr. Spragg appended, If she had, I should have declined to discuss them with her. Ralph looked at him curiously perceiving that he intended in this negative way to imply his disapproval of his daughter's course. "'I shall fight it. I shall fight it,' the young man cried again. "'You may tell her I shall fight it to the end.' Mr. Spragg pressed the nib of his pen against the dust-coated inkstand. "'I suppose you would have to engage a lawyer. She'll know it that way,' he remarked. "'She'll know it. <laughs> you may count on that.' Ralph had begun to laugh again. Suddenly he heard his own laugh, and it pulled him up. What was he laughing about? What was he talking about? The thing was to act, to hold his tongue and act. There was no use uttering windy threats to this broken-spirited old man. A fury of action burned in Ralph, pouring light into his mind and strength into his muscles. He caught up his hat and turned to the door. As he opened it, Mr. Spragg rose again and came forward with his slow, shambling step. He laid his hand on Ralph's arm. "'I'd have given anything, anything short of my girl herself, not to have this happen to you, Ralph Marvell.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Ralph. They looked at each other for a moment. Then Mr. Spragg added, "'But it has happened, you know. Bear that in mind. Nothing you can do will change it. Time and again I've found that a good thing to remember. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 In the Adirondacks, Ralph Marvell sat day after day on the balcony of his little house above the lake, staring at the great white cloud reflections in the water and at the dark line of trees that closed them in. Now and then he got into the canoe, and paddled himself through a winding chain of ponds to some lonely clearing in the forest, and there he lay on his back in the pine-needles, and watched the great clouds form and dissolve themselves above his head. All his past life seemed to be symbolized by the building up and breaking down of those fluctuating shapes, which incalculable wind-currents perpetually shifted and remodeled or swept from the zenith like a pinch of dust. 
His sister told him that he looked well, better than he had in years, and there were moments when his listlessness, his stony insensibility to the small pricks and frictions of daily life, might have passed for the serenity of recovered health. There was no one with whom he could speak of Undine. His family had thrown over the whole subject a pall of silence, which even Laura Fairford shrank from raising. As for his mother, Ralph had seen at once that the idea of talking over the situation was positively frightening to her. There was no provision for such emergencies in the moral order of Washington Square. The affair was a scandal, and it was not in the Dagonet tradition to acknowledge the existence of scandals. Ralph recalled a dim memory of his childhood, the tale of a misguided friend of his mother's who had left her husband for a more congenial companion, and who, years later, returning ill and friendless to New York, had appealed for sympathy to Mrs. Marvell. The latter had not refused to give it, but she had put on her black cashmere and two veils when she went to see her unhappy friend, and had never mentioned these errands of mercy to her husband. Ralph suspected that the constraint shown by his mother and sister was partly due to their having but a dim and confused view of what had happened. In their vocabulary, the word divorce was wrapped in such a dark veil of innuendo as no ladylike hand would care to lift. They had not reached the point of differentiating divorces, but classed them indistinctively as disgraceful incidents, in which the woman was always to blame, but the man, though her innocent victim, was yet inevitably contaminated. The time involved in the proceedings was viewed as a penitential season, during which it behoved the family of the persons concerned to behave as though they were dead. Yet any open allusion to the reason for adopting such an attitude would have been regarded as the height of indelicacy. Mr. Dagonet's notion of the case was almost as remote from reality. All he asked was that his grandson should thrash somebody, and he could not be made to understand that the modern drama of divorce is sometimes cast without a lovelace. "'You might as well tell me there was nobody but Adam in the garden when Eve picked the apple. You say your wife was discontented? No woman ever knows she's discontented till some man tells her so. My God! I've seen smash-ups before now, but I never yet saw a marriage dissolved like a business partnership. Divorce without a lover? Why, it's—it's it's as unnatural as getting drunk on lemonade." After this first explosion, Mr. Dagonet also became silent, and Ralph perceived that what annoyed him most was the fact of the scandal's not being won in any gentlemanly sense of the word. It was like some nasty business mess, about which Mr. Dagonet couldn't pretend to have an opinion, since such things didn't happen to men of his kind. That such a thing should have happened to his only grandson was probably the bitterest experience of his pleasantly uneventful life, and it added a touch of irony to Ralph's unhappiness to know how little, in the whole affair, he was cutting the figure Mr. Dagonet expected him to cut. At first he had chafed under the taciturnity surrounding him, had passionately longed to cry out his humiliation, his rebellion, his despair. Then he began to feel the tonic effect of silence and the next stage was reached when it became clear to him that there was nothing to say. There were thoughts and thoughts. They bubbled up perpetually from the black springs of his hidden misery. They stole on him in the darkness of night. They blotted out the light of day. But when it came to putting them into words and applying them to the external facts of the case, they seemed totally unrelated to it. One more white and sun-touched glory had gone from his sky, but there seemed no way of connecting that with such practical issues as his being called on to decide whether Paul was to be put in knickerbockers or trousers, and whether he should go back to Washington Square for the winter, or hire a small house for himself and his son. The latter question was ultimately decided by his remaining under his grandfather's roof. November found him back in the office again, in fairly good health, with an outer skin of indifference slowly forming over his lacerated soul. There had been a hard minute to live through when he came back to his old brown room in Washington Square. The walls and tables were covered with photographs of Undine, effigies of all shapes and sizes, expressing every possible sentiment dear to the photographic tradition. Ralph had gathered them all up when he had moved from West End Avenue after Undine's departure for Europe, 
and they throned over his other possessions as her image had throned over his future the night he had sat in that very room and dreamed of soaring up with her into the blue. It was impossible to go on living with her photographs about him, and one evening, going up to his room after dinner, he began to unhang them from the walls, and to gather them up from bookshelves and mantelpieces and tables. Then he looked about for some place in which to hide them. There were drawers under his bookcases, but they were full of old discarded things, and even if he emptied the drawers the photographs, in their heavy frames, were almost all too large to fit into them. He turned next to the top shelf of his cupboard, but here the nurse had stored Paul's old toys, his sand-pails, shovels, and croquet-box. Every corner was packed with the vain impedimenta of living, and the mere thought of clearing a space in the chaos was too great an effort. He began to replace the pictures one by one, and the last was still in his hand when he heard his sister's voice outside. He hurriedly put the portrait back in its usual place on his writing-table, and Mrs. Fairford, who had been dining in Washington Square, and had come to bid him good-night, flung her arms about him in a quick embrace, and went down to her carriage. The next afternoon, when he came home from the office, he did not at first see any change in his room, but when he had lit his pipe and thrown himself into his armchair, he noticed that the photograph of his wife's picture by Popple no longer faced him from the mantelpiece. He turned to his writing-table, but her image had vanished there too. Then his eye, making the circuit of the walls, perceived that they also had been stripped. Not a single photograph of Undine was left. Yet so adroitly had the work of elimination been done, so ingeniously had the remaining objects readjusted, that the change attracted no attention. Ralph was angry, sore, ashamed. He felt as if Laura, whose hand he instantly detected, had taken a cruel pleasure in her work, and for an instant he hated her for it. Then a sense of relief stole over him. He was glad he could look about him without meeting Undine's eyes, and he understood that what had been done to his room he must do to his memory and his imagination. He must so readjust his mind that, whichever way he turned his thoughts, her face should no longer confront him. But that was a task that Laura could not perform for him, a task to be accomplished only by the hard, continuous tension of his will. With the setting in of the mood of silence, all desire to fight his wife's suit died out. The idea of touching publicly on anything that had passed between himself and Undine had become unthinkable. Insensibly he had been subdued to the point of view about him, and the idea of calling on the law to repair his shattered happiness struck him as even more grotesque than it was degrading. Nevertheless, some contradictory impulse of his divided spirit made him resent, on the part of his mother and sister, a too ready acceptance of his attitude. There were moments when their tacit assumption that his wife was banished and forgotten irritated him, like the hushed tread of sympathizers about the bed of an invalid who will not admit that he suffers. His irritation was aggravated by the discovery that Mrs. Marvell and Laura had already begun to treat Paul as if he were an orphan. One day, coming unnoticed into the nursery, Ralph heard the boy ask when his mother was coming back, and Mrs. Fairford, who was with him, answered, She's not coming back, dearest, and you're not to speak of her to father. Ralph, when the boy was out of hearing, rebuked his sister for her answer. I don't want you to talk of his mother as if she were dead. I don't want you to forbid Paul to speak of her. Laura, though usually so yielding, defended herself. What's the use of encouraging him to speak of her when he's never to see her? The sooner he forgets her, the better. Ralph pondered. Later. If she asks to see him, I shan't refuse. Mrs. Fairford pressed her lips together to check the answer. She never will. Ralph heard it, nevertheless, and let it pass. Nothing gave him so profound a sense of estrangement from his former life as the conviction that his sister was probably right. He did not really believe that Undine would ever ask to see her boy. But if she did, he was determined not to refuse her request. Time wore on, the Christmas holidays came and went, and the winter continued to grind out the weary measure of its days. Toward the end of January, Ralph received a registered letter, addressed to him at his office, and bearing in the corner of the envelope the name of a firm of Sioux Falls attorneys. 
He instantly divined that it contained the legal notification of his wife's application for divorce, and as he wrote his name in the postman's book, he smiled grimly at the thought that the stroke of his pen was doubtless signing her release. He opened the letter, found it to be what he had expected, and locked it away in his desk without mentioning the matter to any one. He supposed that with the putting away of this document he was thrusting the whole subject out of sight, but not more than a fortnight later, as he sat in the subway on his way downtown, his eye was caught by his own name on the first page of the heavily headlined paper which the unshaved occupant of the next seat held between grimy fists. The blood rushed to Ralph's forehead as he looked over the man's arm and read, "'Society leader gets decree,' and beneath it the subordinate clause, "'says husband too absorbed in business to make home happy.'" For weeks afterward, wherever he went, he felt that blush upon his forehead. For the first time in his life the coarse fingering of public curiosity had touched the secret places of his soul, and nothing that had gone before seemed as humiliating as this trivial comment on his tragedy. The paragraph continued on its way through the press, and whenever he took up a newspaper he seemed to come upon it, slightly modified, variously developed, but always reverting with a kind of unctuous irony to his financial preoccupations and his wife's consequent loneliness. The phrase was even taken up by the paragraph writer, called forth excited letters from similarly situated victims, was commented on in humorous editorials, and served as a text for pulpit denunciations of the growing craze for wealth. And finally, at his dentist's, Ralph came across it in a family weekly, as one of the heart problems propounded to subscribers, with a gramophone, a straight-front corset, and a vanity box among the prizes offered for its solution. End of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four If only you'd had the sense to come straight to me, Undine Sprague. There isn't a tip I couldn't have given you. Not one. This speech, in which a faintly contemptuous compassion for her friend's case was blent with the frankest pride in her own, probably represented the nearest approach to tact that Mrs. James J. Rolliver had yet acquired. Undine was impartial enough to note in it a distinct advance on the youthful methods of Indiana Frusk, yet it required a good deal of self-control to take the words to herself with a smile, and while they seemed to be laying a visible scarlet welt across the pale face she kept valiantly turned to her friend. The fact that she must permit herself to be pitied by Indiana Frusk gave her the uttermost measure of the depth to which her fortunes had fallen. This abasement was inflicted on her in the staring gold apartment of the Hôtel Nouveau Lux in which the Rollivers had established themselves on their recent arrival in Paris. The vast drawing-room, adorned only by two high-shouldered gilt baskets of orchids drooping on their wires, reminded Undine of the Louis suite, in which the opening scenes of her own history had been enacted and the resemblance and the difference were emphasized by the fact that the image of her past self was not inaccurately repeated in the triumphant presence of Indiana Rolliver. "'There isn't a tip I couldn't have given you, not one,' Mrs. Rolliver reproachfully repeated, and all Undine's superiorities and discriminations seemed to shrivel up in the crude blaze of the other's solid achievement." There was little comfort in noting, for one's private delectation, that Indiana spoke of her husband as Mr. Rolliver, that she twanged a piercing R, that one of her shoulders was still higher than the other, and that her striking dress was totally unsuited to the hour, the place, and the occasion. She still did and was all that Undine had so sedulously learned not to be and to do. But to dwell on these obstacles to her success was but to be more deeply impressed by the fact that she had nevertheless succeeded. Not much more than a year had elapsed since Undine Marvell, sitting in the drawing-room of another Parisian hotel, had heard the immense orchestral murmur of Paris rise through the open windows like the ascending movement of her own hopes. The immense murmur still sounded on, deafening and implacable as some elemental force, and the discord in her fate no more disturbed it than the motor-wheels rolling by under the windows were disturbed by the particles of dust that they ground to finer powder as they passed. 
I could have told you one thing right off, Mrs. Rolliver went on with her ringing energy, and that is, to get your divorce first thing. A divorce is always a good thing to have. You can never tell when you might want it. You ought to have attended to that before you even began with Peter Van Degen. Undine listened, irresistibly impressed. Did you? she asked. But Mrs. Rolliver, at this, grew suddenly veiled and sibylline. She wound her big bejeweled hands through her pearls—there were ropes and ropes of them—and leaned back, modestly sinking her lids. "'I'm here, anyhow,' she rejoined, with circumspice, in look and tone. Undine, obedient to the challenge, continued to gaze at the pearls. They were real, no doubt about that, and so was Indiana's marriage, if she kept out of certain states. "'Don't you see,' Mrs. Rolliver continued, "'that having to leave him when you did, and rush off to Dakota for six months, was—' was giving him too much time to think, and giving it at the wrong time, too. Oh, I see. But what could I do? I'm not an immoral woman. Of course not, dearest. You were merely thoughtless. That's what I meant by saying you ought to have had your divorce ready. A flicker of self-esteem caused Undine to protest. It wouldn't have made any difference. His wife would never have given him up. She's so crazy about him. No, she hates him so. And she hates me, too, because she's in love with my husband. Indiana bounced out of her lounging attitude and struck her hands together with a rattle of rings. In love with your husband? What's the matter, then? Why on earth didn't the four of you fix it up together? You don't understand. It was an undoubted relief to be able at last to say that to Indiana. Claire Van Degen thinks divorce wrong, or rather, awfully vulgar. Vulgar? Indiana flamed. If that isn't just too much, a woman who's in love with another woman's husband? What does she think refined, I'd like to know? Having a lover, I suppose, like the women in these nasty French plays? I've told Mr. Rolliver I won't go to the theatre with him again in Paris. It's just too utterly low. And the swell society's just as bad. It's simply rotten. Thank goodness I was brought up in a place where there's some sense of decency left." She looked compassionately at Undine. It was New York that demoralized you, and I don't blame you for it. Out at Apex you'd have acted different. You would never have given way to your feelings before you'd got your divorce. A slow blush rose to Undine's forehead. "'He seemed so unhappy,' she murmured. "'Oh, I know,' said Indiana, in a tone of cold competence. She gave Undine an impatient glance. "'What was the understanding between you when you left Europe last August to go out to Dakota?' "'Peter was to go to Reno in the autumn, so that it wouldn't look too much as if we were acting together. I was to come to Chicago to see him on his way out there.' And he never came? No. And he stopped writing? Oh, he never writes. Indiana heaved a deep sigh of intelligence. Ah, oh, there's one perfectly clear rule. Never let out of your sight a man who doesn't write. I know. That's why I stayed with him, those few weeks last summer. Indiana sat thinking, her fine shallow eyes fixed unblinkingly on her friend's embarrassed face. I suppose there isn't anybody else. Anybody? Well, now you've got your divorce. Anybody else that would come in handy for? This was harder to bear than anything that had gone before. Undine could not have borne it if she had not had a purpose. Mr. Van Degen owes it to me, she began with an air of wounded dignity. Yes, yes, I know, but that's just talk. If there is anybody else. I can't imagine what you think of me, Indiana. Indiana, without appearing to resent this challenge, again lost herself in meditation. "'Well, I'll tell him he's just got to see you,' she finally emerged from it to say. Undine gave a quick upward look. This was what she had been waiting for ever since she had read, a few days earlier, in the columns of her morning journal, that Mr. Peter Van Degen and Mr. and Mrs. James J. Rolliver had been fellow-passengers on board the Semantic. 
but she did not betray her expectations by as much as the tremor of an eyelash. She knew her friend well enough to pour out to her the expected tribute of surprise. "'Why, do you mean to say you know him, Indiana?' "'Mercy, yes. He's round here all the time. He crossed on the steamer with us, and Mr. Rolliver's taken a fancy to him,' Indiana explained, in the tone of the absorbed bride to whom her husband's preferences are the sole criterion. Undine turned a tear-suffused gaze on her. "'Oh, Indiana, if I could only see him again, I know it would be all right. He's awfully, awfully fond of me, but his family have influenced him against me.' "'I know what that is,' Mrs. Rolliver interjected. "'But perhaps,' Undine continued, "'it would be better if I could meet him first without his knowing beforehand, without your telling him. I love him too much to reproach him.' she added nobly. Indiana pondered. It was clear that, though the nobility of the sentiment impressed her, she was disinclined to renounce the idea of taking a more active part in her friend's rehabilitation. But Undine went on. "'Of course you've found out by this time that he's just a big spoiled baby. Afterward, when I've seen him, if you'd talk to him, or if you'd only just let him be with you, and see how perfectly happy you and Mr. Rolliver are.' Indiana seized on this at once. "'You mean that what he wants is the influence of a home like ours? Yes, yes, I understand. I tell you what I'll do. I'll just ask him round to dine, and let you know the day, without telling him beforehand that you're coming.' "'Oh, Indiana!' Undine held her in a close embrace, and then drew away to say, "'I'm so glad I've found you. You must go round with me everywhere. There are lots of people here I want you to know.' Mrs. Rolliver's expression changed from vague sympathy to concentrated interest. "'I suppose it's awfully gay here. Do you go around a great deal with the American set?' Undine hesitated for a fraction of a moment. "'There are a few of them who are rather jolly. But I particularly want you to meet my friend, the Marquis Roviano. He's from Rome. And a lovely Austrian woman, Baroness Adelschein.' Her friend's face was brushed by a shade of distrust. "'I don't know as I care much about meeting foreigners,' she said indifferently. Undine smiled. It was agreeable at last to be able to give Indiana a point as valuable as any of hers on divorce. "'Oh, some of them are awfully attractive, and they'll make you meet the Americans.' Indiana caught this on the bound. One began to see why she had got on in spite of everything. "'Of course, I'd love to know your friends,' she said, kissing Undine who answered, giving back the kiss. "'You know there's nothing on earth I wouldn't do for you.' Indiana drew back to look at her with a comic grimace under which a shade of anxiety was visible. "'Well, that's a pretty large order. But there's just one thing you can do, dearest. Please to let Mr. Rolliver alone.' "'Mr. Rolliver, my dear?' Undine's laugh showed that she took this for unmixed comedy. "'That's a nice way to remind me that you're heaps and heaps better looking than I am.' Indiana gave her an acute glance. "'Millard Binch didn't think so. Not even at the very end.' "'Oh, poor Millard!' The women's smiles mingled easily over the common reminiscence, and once again on the threshold Undine enfolded her friend. In the light of the autumn afternoon she paused a moment at the door of the Nouveau Luxe, and looked aimlessly forth at the brave spectacle in which she seemed no longer to have a stake. Many of her old friends had already returned to Paris, the Harvey Shallums, May Beringer, Dickie Bowles, and other westward-bound nomads lingering on for a glimpse of the autumn theatres and fashions, before hurrying back to inaugurate the New York season. A year ago Undine would have had no difficulty in introducing Indiana Rolliver to this group, a group above which her own aspirations already beat an impatient wing. Now her place in it had become too precarious for her to force an entrance for her protectress. Her New York friends were at no pains to conceal from her that in their opinion her divorce had been a blunder. Their logic was that of Apex reversed. Since she had not been sure of Van Degen, why in the world, they asked, had she thrown away a position she was sure of? Mrs. Harvey Shallum, in particular, had not scrupled to put the question squarely. "'Shell was awfully taken. He would have introduced you everywhere. I thought you were wild to know smart French people. I thought Harvey and I weren't good enough for you any longer. And now you've done your best to spoil everything. 
Of course I feel for you tremendously. That's the reason why I'm talking so frankly. You must be horribly depressed. Come and dine tonight. Or, no, if you don't mind, I'd rather you chose another evening. I'd forgotten that I'd asked the Jim Driscolls, and it might be uncomfortable. For you. In another world she was still welcome, at first perhaps even more so than before. The world, namely, to which she had proposed to present Indiana Rolliver. Roviano, Madame Adelschein, and a few of the freer spirits of her old St. Moritz band, reappearing in Paris with the close of the watering-place season, had quickly discovered her and shown a keen interest in her liberation. It appeared in some mysterious way to make her more available for their purpose, and she found that, in the character of the last American divorcee, she was even regarded as eligible to the small and intimate inner circle of their loosely knit association. At first she could not make out what had entitled her to this privilege, and increasing enlightenment produced a revolt of the apex Puritanism, which, despite some odd accommodations and compliances, still carried its head so high in her. Undine had been perfectly sincere in telling Indiana Rolliver that she was not an immoral woman. The pleasures for which her sex took such risks had never attracted her, and she did not even crave the excitement of having it thought that they did. She wanted, passionately and persistently, two things which she believed should subsist together in any well-ordered life, amusement and respectability. And despite her surface sophistication, her notion of amusement was hardly less innocent than when she had hung on the plumber's fence with Indiana Frusk. It gave her, therefore, no satisfaction to find herself included among Madame Adelschein's intimates. It embarrassed her to feel that she was expected to be queer and different, to respond to passwords and talk in innuendo, to associate with the equivocal and the subterranean, and affect to despise the ingenuous daylight joys which really satisfied her soul. But the business shrewdness which was never quite dormant in her suggested that this was not the moment for such scruples. She must make the best of what she could get, and wait her chance of getting something better. And meanwhile, the most practical use to which she could put her shady friends was to flash their authentic nobility in the dazzled eyes of Mrs. Rolliver. With this object in view she made haste, in a fashionable tea-room of the Rue de Rivoli, to group about Indiana the most titled members of the band, and the felicity of the occasion would have been unmarred had she not suddenly caught sight of Raymond de Chelles sitting on the other side of the room. She had not seen Chelles since her return to Paris. It had seemed preferable to leave their meeting to chance, and the present chance might have served as well as another, but for the fact that among his companions were two or three of the most eminent ladies of the proud quarter beyond the Seine. It was what Undine, in moments of discouragement, characterized as her luck, that one of these should be the hated Miss Wincher of Potash Springs, who had now become the Marquise de Trezac. Undine knew that Chelles and his compatriots, however scandalized at her European companions, would be completely indifferent to Mrs. Rolliver's appearance. But one gesture of Madame de Trezac's eyeglass would wave Indiana to her place, and thus brand the whole party as wrong. All of this passed through Undine's mind in the very moment of her noting the change of expression with which Chelles had signalled his recognition. If their encounter could have occurred in happier conditions, it might have had far-reaching results. As it was, the crowded state of the tea-room, and the distance between their tables, sufficiently excused his restricting his greeting to an eager bow, and Undine went home heavy-hearted from this first attempt to reconstruct her past. Her spirits were not lightened by the developments of the next few days. She kept herself well in the foreground of Indiana's life, and cultivated toward the rarely visible Rolliver a manner in which impersonal admiration for the statesman was tempered with the politest indifference to the man. Indiana seemed to do justice to her efforts, and to be reassured by the result, but there still came no hint of a reward. For a time Undine restrained the question on her lips. But one afternoon, when she had inducted Indiana into the deepest mysteries of Parisian complexion-making, the importance of the service, and the confidential mood it engendered, seemed to warrant a discreet allusion to their bargain. Indiana leaned back among her cushions, with an embarrassed laugh. "'Oh, my dear, I've been meaning to tell you. It's off, I'm afraid. The dinner is, I mean. You see, Mr. Van Degen has seen you round with me, and the very minute I asked him to come and dine, he guessed.' He guessed. And he wouldn't. Well, no, he wouldn't. I hate to tell you. Oh! 
Undine threw off a vague laugh. Since you're intimate enough for him to tell you that, he must have told you more, told you something to justify his behavior. He couldn't, even Peter Van Degen, couldn't just simply have said to you, I won't see her. Mrs. Rolliver hesitated, visibly troubled to the point of regretting her intervention. He did say more? Undine insisted. He gave you a reason? He said you'd know. Oh, how base! How base! Undine was trembling with one of her little girl rages, the storms of destructive fury before which Mr. and Mrs. Spragg had cowered when she was a charming golden-curled cherub. But life had administered some of the discipline which her parents had spared her, and she pulled herself together with a gasp of pain. Of course he's been turned against me. His wife has the whole of New York behind her, and I've no one. But I know it would be all right if I could only see him. Her friend made no answer, and Undine pursued with an irrepressible outbreak of her old vehemence. Indiana Rolliver, if you won't do it for me, I'll go straight off to his hotel this very minute. I'll wait there in the hall till he sees me. Indiana lifted a protesting hand. Don't, Undine, not that. Why not? Well, I wouldn't, that's all. You wouldn't? Why wouldn't you? You must have a reason. Undine faced her with levelled brows. Without a reason you can't have changed so utterly since our last talk. You were positive enough then that I had a right to make him see me. Somewhat to her surprise, Indiana made no effort to elude the challenge. Yes, I did think so then, but now I know it won't do you the least bit of good. Have they turned him so completely against me? I don't care if they have. I know him. I can get him back. That's the trouble. Indiana shed on her a gaze of cold compassion. It's not that anyone has turned him against you. It's worse than that. What can be? You'll hate me if I tell you. Then you'd better make him tell me himself. I can't. I tried to. The trouble is that it was you. Something you did, I mean. Something he found out about you. Undine, to restrain a spring of anger, had to clutch both arms of her chair. About me? How fearfully false! Why, I've never even looked at anybody. It's nothing of that kind. Indiana's mournful headshake seemed to deplore in Undine an unsuspected moral obtuseness. It's the way you acted to your own husband. I... my... to Ralph? He reproaches me for that? Peter Van Degen does? Well, for one particular thing. He says that the very day you went off with him last year you got a cable from New York telling you to come back at once to Mr. Marvell, who was desperately ill. How on earth did he know? The cry escaped Undine before she could repress it. It's true, then? Indiana exclaimed. Oh, Undine! Undine sat speechless and motionless, the anger frozen to terror on her lips. Mrs. Rolliver turned on her the reproachful gaze of the deceived benefactress. I didn't believe it when he told me. I'd never have thought it of you. Before you'd even applied for your divorce. Undine made no attempt to deny the charge, or to defend herself. For a moment she was lost in the pursuit of an unseizable clue, the explanation of this monstrous last perversity of fate. Suddenly she rose to her feet with a set face. The Marvells must have told him. The beasts! It relieved her to be able to cry it out. It was your husband's sister. What did you say her name was? When he didn't answer her cable, she cabled Mr. Van Degen to find out where you were and tell you to come straight back. Undine stared. He never did. No. Doesn't that show you the story's all trumped up? Indiana shook her head. He said nothing to you about it because he was with you and received the first cable, and you told him it was from your sister-in-law, just worrying you as usual to go home. And when he asked if there was anything else in it, you said there wasn't another thing. Undine, intently following her, caught at this with a spring. Then he knew it all along? He admits that? And it made no earthly difference to him at the time? She turned almost victoriously on her friend. Did he happen to explain that, I wonder? Yes. Indiana's longanimity grew almost solemn. It came over him gradually, he said. One day, when he wasn't feeling very well, he thought to himself, 
Would she act like that to me if I was dying? And after that he never felt the same to you. Indiana lowered her empurpled lids. Men have their feelings, too, even when they're carried away by passion. After a pause she added, I don't know as I can blame him, Undine. You see, you were his ideal. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of The Custom of the Country Undine Marvell, for the next few months, tasted all the accumulated bitterness of failure. After January the drifting hordes of her compatriots had scattered to the four quarters of the globe, leaving Paris to resume, under its low grey sky, its compacter winter personality. Noting, from her more and more deserted corner, each least sign of the social revival, Undine felt herself as stranded and baffled as after the ineffectual summers of her girlhood. She was not without possible alternatives, but the sense of what she had lost took the savour from all that was left. She might have attached herself to some migratory group winged for Italy or Egypt, but the prospect of travel did not in itself appeal to her, and she was doubtful of its social benefit. She lacked the adventurous curiosity which seeks its occasion in the unknown, and though she could work doggedly for a given object, the obstacles to be overcome had to be as distinct as the prize. Her one desire was to get back an equivalent of the precise value she had lost in ceasing to be Ralph Marvell's wife. Her new visiting card, bearing her Christian name in place of her husband's, was like the coin of a debased currency, testifying to her diminished trading capacity. Her restricted means, her vacant days, all the minor irritations of her life, were as nothing compared to this sense of a lost advantage. Even in the narrowed field of a Parisian winter, she might have made herself a place in some more or less extrasocial world, but her experiments in this line gave her no pleasure proportioned to the possible derogation. She feared to be associated with the wrong people, and scented a shade of disrespect in every amicable advance. The more pressing attentions of one or two men she had formerly known filled her with a glow of outraged pride, and for the first time in her life she felt that even solitude might be preferable to certain kinds of society. Since ill health was the most plausible pretext for seclusion, it was almost a relief to find that she was really growing nervous and sleeping badly. The doctor she summoned advised her trying a small, quiet place on the Riviera, not too near the sea, and thither in the early days of December she transported herself with her maid and an omnibus load of luggage. The place disconcerted her, by being really small and quiet, and for a few days she struggled against the desire for flight. She had never before known a world as colourless and negative as that of the large white hotel where everybody went to bed at nine, and donkey rides over stony hills were the only alternative to slow drives along dusty roads. Many of the dwellers in this temple of repose found even these exercises too stimulating, and preferred to sit for hours under the palms in the garden, playing patience, embroidering, or reading odd volumes of Tauschnitz. Undine, driven by despair to an inspection of the hotel bookshelves, discovered that scarcely any work they contained was complete. But this did not seem to trouble the readers, who continued to feed their leisure with mutilated fiction, from which they occasionally raised their eyes to glance mistrustfully at the new arrival sweeping the garden gravel with her frivolous draperies. The inmates of the hotel were of different nationalities, but their racial differences were levelled by the stamp of a common mediocrity. All differences of tongue, of custom, of physiognomy, disappeared in this deep community of insignificance, which was like some secret bond, with the manifold signs and passwords of its ignorances and its imperceptions. It was not the heterogeneous mediocrity of the American summer hotel, where the lack of any standard is the nearest approach to a tie, but an organized codified dullness, in conscious possession of its rights, and strong in the voluntary ignorance of any others. It took Undine a long time to accustom herself to such an atmosphere, and meanwhile she fretted, fumed, and flaunted, or abandoned herself to long periods of fruitless brooding. Sometimes a flame of anger shot up in her, dismally illuminating the path she had travelled and the blank wall to which it led. At other moments past and present were enveloped in a dull fog of rancour which distorted and faded even the image she presented to her morning mirror. There were days when every young face she saw left in her a taste of poison. 
But when she compared herself with the specimens of her sex who plied their languid industries under the palms, or looked away as she passed them in hall or staircase, her spirits rose, and she rang for her maid, and dressed herself in her newest and vividest. These were unprofitable triumphs, however. She never made one of her attacks on the organized disapproval of the community without feeling she had lost ground by it, and the next day she would lie in bed and send down capricious orders for food, which her maid would presently remove untouched, with instructions to transmit her complaints to the landlord. Sometimes the events of the past year, ceaselessly revolving through her brain, became no longer a subject for criticism or justification, but simply a series of pictures monotonously unrolled. Hour by hour, in such moods, she relived the incidents of her flight with Peter Van Degen, the part of her career that, since it had proved a failure, seemed least like herself and most difficult to justify. She had gone away with him, and had lived with him for two months. She, Undine Marvell, to whom respectability was the breath of life, to whom such follies had always been unintelligible, and therefore inexcusable. She had done this incredible thing, and she had done it from a motive that seemed at the time as clear, as logical, as free from the distorting mists of sentimentality as any of her father's financial enterprises. It had been a bold move. But it had been as carefully calculated as the happiest Wall Street stroke. She had gone away with Peter, because, after the decisive scene in which she had put her power to the test, to yield to him seemed the surest means of victory. Even to her practical intelligence, it was clear that an immediate dash to Dakota might look too calculated, and she had preserved her self-respect by telling herself that she was really his wife, and in no way to blame if the law delayed to ratify the bond. She was still persuaded of the justness of her reasoning, but she now saw that it had left certain risks out of account. Her life with Van Degen had taught her many things. The two had wandered from place to place, spending a great deal of money always more and more money. For the first time in her life she had been able to buy everything she wanted. For a while this had kept her amused and busy, but presently she began to perceive that her companion's view of their relation was not the same as hers. She saw that he had always meant it to be an unavowed tie, screened by Mrs. Shallum's companionship and Clare's careless tolerance, and that on those terms he would have been ready to shed on their adventure the brightest blaze of notoriety. But since Undine had insisted on being carried off like a sentimental schoolgirl, he meant to shroud the affair in mystery, and was as zealous in concealing their relation as she was bent on proclaiming it. In the powerful novels which Popple was fond of lending her, she had met with increasing frequency the type of heroine who scorns to love clandestinely, and proclaims the sanctity of passion and the moral duty of obeying its call. Undine had been struck by these arguments as justifying and even ennobling her course and had let Peter understand that she had been actuated by the highest motives in openly associating her life with his. But he had opposed a placid insensibility to these illusions, and had persisted in treating her as though their journey were the kind of escapade that a man of the world is bound to hide. She had expected him to take her to all the showy places where couples like themselves are relieved from a too sustained contemplation of nature by the distractions of the restaurant and the gaming-table. But he had carried her from one obscure corner of Europe to another, shunning fashionable hotels and crowded watering-places, and displaying an ingenuity in the discovery of the unvisited and the out-of-season that gave their journey an odd resemblance to her melancholy wedding-tour. She had never for a moment ceased to remember that the Dakota Divorce Court was the objective point of this later honeymoon, and her allusions to the fact were as frequent as prudence permitted. Peter seemed in no way disturbed by them. He responded with expressions of increasing tenderness, or the purchase of another piece of jewellery, and though Undine could not remember his ever voluntarily bringing the subject of their marriage, he did not shrink from her recurring mention of it. He seemed merely too steeped in present well-being to think of the future, and she ascribed this to the fact that his faculty of enjoyment could not project itself beyond the moment. Her business was to make each of their days so agreeable that when the last came, he should be conscious of a void to be bridged over as rapidly as possible, and when she thought this point had been reached, she packed her trunks and started for Dakota. The next picture to follow was that of the dull months in the western divorce town, where, to escape loneliness and avoid comment, she had cast in her lot with Mabel Lipscomb, 
who had lately arrived there on the same errand. Undine, at the outset, had been sorry for the friend whose new venture seemed likely to result so much less brilliantly than her own, but compassion had been replaced by irritation, as Mabel's unpruned vulgarities, her enormous encroaching satisfaction with herself and her surroundings, began to pervade every corner of their provisional household. Undine, during the first months of her exile, had been sustained by the fullest confidence in her future. When she had parted from Van Degen, she had felt sure he meant to marry her, and the fact that Mrs. Lipscomb was fortified by no similar hope made her easier to bear with. Undine was almost ashamed that the unwooed Mabel should be the witness of her own felicity, and planned to send her off on a trip to Denver when Peter should announce his arrival. But the weeks passed, and Peter did not come. Mabel, on the whole, behaved well in this contingency. Undine, in her first exultation, had confided all her hopes and plans to her friend, but Mabel took no undue advantage of the confidence. She was even tactful in her loud, fond, clumsy way, with a tact that insistently boomed and buzzed about its victim's head. But one day she mentioned that she had asked to dinner a gentleman from Little Rock who had come to Dakota with the same object as themselves, and whose acquaintance she had made through her lawyer. The gentleman from Little Rock came to dine, and within a week Undine understood that Mabel's future was assured. If Van Degen had been at hand, Undine would have smiled with him at poor Mabel's infatuation and her suitor's crudeness. But Van Degen was not there. He made no sign, he sent no excuse, he simply continued to absent himself, and it was Undine who, in due course, had to make way for Mrs. Lipscomb's caller, and sit upstairs with a novel, while the drawing-room below was given up to the enacting of an actual love-story. Even then, even to the end, Undine had to admit that Mabel had behaved beautifully. But it is comparatively easy to behave beautifully when one is getting what one wants, and when someone else, who has not always been altogether kind, is not. The net result of Mrs. Lipscomb's magnanimity was that when, on the day of parting, she drew Undine to her bosom with the hand on which her new engagement ring blazed, Undine hated her, as she hated everything else connected with her vain exile in the wilderness. End of chapter 25